O God, author of all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, we ask thy guidance in our consultations to the end that truth and justice may prevail in all of our judgments. Amen. You can be seated. Now, good morning, everyone. We've got an exciting ahead of us today. We've got secondary suites. We've got the return of Greenbrier. We've got furniture. We're going to have a lot of fun today. And that fun is going to start with Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, due to my um, exemplary time out in Chestmere, I would like to introduce 25 students in grade six, if they could stand up, from Prince of Peace Chestmere School with their teachers, Aaron Esau and volunteer Sheila Morrison. And wave to the camera so you can be on TV. Welcome, all of you. Hope you have a great day today at City Hall. Alderman Keating, you've still got the floor if you'd like it. Thank you. I do have a question for Mr. Stevens. Uh, I did send in an administrative inquiry earlier, and I realized at that time it was fairly lengthy and detailed, and I didn't expect you know, to have a uh, complete answer at some point within the near future. Um, I did get a response that said that they will be able to fulfill that request within a, a year, possibly a year and three months. Uh, with Sheila, or pardon me, Linda, uh, I'm just wondering if uh, that could not be shortened or we could, and I know uh, they're working on what they have. Uh, I, I am not surprised that I didn't get a complete response, but I'm rather surprised that it'll take a year to come up with this list. Uh, is there something that uh, could be done or, or are there other ways of looking at my request? And the request, of course, was just a complete list of all city properties, kind of who inhabits them, where they are, and what value they're at. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I, uh, I, I will follow up. I saw the uh, information. I didn't uh, look at the timeline. Yeah. We are preparing a report that will answer some of those questions mm -hmm. that will come this year. Uh, but it won't have the, for all members of council, this was an administrative inquiry that had information about every city building. And of course, the area, I only have some responsibility for some of the buildings. And so uh, we were able to answer some of the information, but not all of it. So I will get back to you, Alderman Keating, about a, an updated time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Keating. On question period, Alderman Hodges? On question period, Alderman Collier Cart? Presentation, Your Worship. Oh, why don't you do, um, let's see if there's any more question period. Anyone else? All right, Alderman Collier Cart. Thank you, Your Worship, and members of council. If I could ask uh, the uh, young folks in grade six uh, from the community of Woodlands to stand and be recognized by council. It's nice having you at City Hall today. I understand that you're here on a, uh, a tour of the Civic Complex and you've uh, been to the Glembo and you're just gonna hang out today. And, uh, do you, and you're welcome to stay here all day and watch council. We'll be here till 9.30 tonight. Is that a deal? We're, we're just hanging out today here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much, folks. And I hope you too have a great day at City Hall. Um, all right, um, anyone else on question period? On the agenda then, can I get a motion for the agenda, please? Thanks, Alderman uh, Putman. Seconded, Alderman Keating. Uh, changes to the agenda, Alderman Hodges. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Worship. First of all, under the consent agenda, there are two items uh, from land committee that were shouldn't have been on the consent agenda. Clerks have acknowledged this, and in the uh, separate cover report that came out Friday afternoon, it's uh, LAS 211, 2011-07 and 2011-08. They should be part of the regular agenda. These two items, not part of the consent agenda. Okay. Would you like them at the end of the consent agenda or would you like them under reports from committees? Reports from committees. Okay, so we'll add a 10.5 then. And that's reports from LAS. And, 07, 08. and it'll be LAS 2011-07. And LAS 2011-08, which I think are related to something similar to one another, right? They are. Okay. And the clerks have just reminded me that uh, <clears throat> I should have included uh, 21 in that. Uh, 21 as well? Yep. Okay. LAS 2011-21. All right. So we'll move those three on, into a new 10.5 on the agenda then. Do I have a seconder for that? Thanks, Alderman Keating. Oh, you can't because you moved the... Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Um, on that one, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And as you've mentioned, uh, you, were, you would like the furniture 
purchase audit moved uh, to the regular agenda. So that's 5.7 in the consent agenda. Yeah, we'll just do that one at the end of the consent agenda items, if that's all right. Yes. I just have a quick question. Okay. So we'll do that one. Do I have a seconder for that one? Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. On that one, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Okay, anything else? And yes, uh, in section number nine, Calgary Planning Commission reports uh, proposed street name change in Rocky Ridge, uh, 9.4 and 9.5. I have a letter that has come in from a, a property owner in the area who's uh, querying this. I don't, I, oh, I know it's not urgent, Your Worship. And uh, I'd like to uh, bring it forward and table it to May 16th to next Monday's council meeting. Sure, I'm sorry, I missed what number that was. 9.4. Nine point, just that one? And 9.5. And 9.5. They're related. They're at uh, yeah, they're part, the same. part of the same road. Okay, no problem. So you want to bring forward that to when? Table, May 16th, next Monday. Next Monday. Okay. Um, question for you, um, Madam Clerk and or uh, Mr. Tully. Because that's in the public um, hearing portion of the agenda, can we do it next week or do we have to wait for the next public hearing? Oh, it's not. Oh, okay. My, my apologies. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I see it now. Okay. And they're, not so part, I need, and they're not part of a land use item. And they're either. not part of a land use item. So I need a seconder on that one, please. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Um, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Alderman Lowe is opposed. Okay. Um, anything else? I feel like, oh. Um, I was just about to say that. And I see that Alderman Chabot is just walking in the door. But I will accept a motion to table 10.3.3, um, bring forward and table to May 16th. I understand we were offside on the advertising on that one. So I can take that motion now. Alderman Chabot, do you want to make it? It's just you're sitting. Worship. Thanks, Happy. Alderman Chabot. Um, do I have a seconder on that one? Second. Thanks, Alderman Collier Cart. Um, great. Are we agreed? Great. Any opposed? Carried. And I want to add, um, I'll take a motion now to add, this is the in-camera session? Yes. To add an item in the in-camera session is 12.3, which is a uh, verbal update on the Louise Station Comprehensive Review. Can I have a motion for that, please? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Alderman Marr. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Hodges. On that one, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Okay. And I think... Oh, um, just one one other small one. I just need a quick personnel item added to the in-camera agenda. Alderman Mario will do that one for me too, and Alderman Hodges. Thank you. Uh, on that one, are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, very well. Okay, I think, is that everything? So, oh, oh sorry, Alderman McLeod, yes. We have an item of urgent business with respect to the wholly owned subsidiaries, and this needs to go forward fairly quickly. It was a motion arising. Um, that didn't get on the agenda and it needs to be done in conjunction with some of the other activities that are happening around wholly owned subsidiaries. Great, thank you. And I will apologize, uh, there was a miscommunication from my office that resulted in that one not getting on the agenda. So um, a motion then to add 11.1 .1 under urgent business. Um, Alderman McLeod, you're moving. Alderman Putman's your seconding, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Okay, anyone else? Sorry? Oops. <laughs> um, we'll have Alderman Jones do that one. Thanks, Madam Clerk. Um, okay. Any others? Going once, going twice. All right, then are we agreed on the agenda as amended? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Okay. On to the minutes then. Um, minutes for the meeting of council on April 11th and on April 18th. Can I have a motion to accept them? Thanks for moving them both. Thanks, Alderman Collier Cart. Do I have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Um, any changes, additions, deletions to the minutes? Seeing none, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Consent agenda then. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Uh, oh. Worship, there's a few items that I'd like to have pulled from the consent agenda, if I could. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, what, what would you like? Uh, we pulled a few already. What would you like to pull? Well, sorry. Um, is that the LES ones? Yeah, we pulled 7, 8, and 21 off of the LES. Thank you. That's all I needed. Okay, no problem. Done already. Thank you. Um, all right, so I, uh, Alderman Collier card, I think, moved the consent agenda. Did I get that right? Um, did I have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Um, on the consent agenda, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. 
All right then, so I pulled the item on the furniture audit, um, 5.7. Flip, flip, flip. And I'll need, oh, Alderman Pincott stepped away. I'll need someone to move this one, please. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson, seconded Alderman McLeod. Now, I did have a couple of questions, and I wonder, is the city auditor with us today? And neither is the chair of the audit committee. <laughs> Well, maybe, uh, yeah, why don't we, oh, here he is, here he is, here he is. It's all right, you can do it for me, or, or the city manager might be able to answer these. Or Mr. Stevens, excellent. Um, I thought this was a very interesting audit, um, but I noticed that the scope of the audit, at least the way that I read it, seemed confined to questions of whether proper procedure had been followed, uh, whether things were sent to the right um, account and so on. And I was a bit surprised that the audit did not seem to address what I saw as the two big questions. Number one was, why was there such a large increase between 2006 and 2007? Um, I can understand that that may have been because we were outfitting new buildings, but I'm wondering why it stayed at that extremely high level um, ever since then, because I'm not aware of any new giant buildings being built. So that was question one. And question two was, did the auditor uh, in preparing this report look at all at, and they make the statement a couple of times that this is done with due concern for economy, but what I didn't see in the audit was whether we actually had compared the prices we're paying with market prices or benchmarked the amount that we're paying per employee on furniture with other organizations of similar size and scale. Um, thank you, Worship. A uh, couple of good questions. Um, I do see that the city auditor has joined us. Uh, just a little bit of, of a little bit of background on this audit. This was an audit that was uh, initiated several years ago and what had been on the uh, off and on the audit plan for a number of years. And Mr. Horbosenko, when he began, felt that there was something there to salvage at least some degree of the audit. Uh, with that introduction, I'll uh, ask Mr. Herbisenko. So, sorry, Mr. Herbisenko, I don't know if you heard my questions. Were you in here in time? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I wasn't. So if you wouldn't mind repeating, I'll do my no, best. No, no problem. I was just saying that the scope of this audit was interesting to me because it seemed to look a lot at important technical issues around compliance, but it didn't seem to address the two questions that I would have. Uh, the first is why there was such a large increase in what we spent between 06 and 07, and why that higher level of spending seems to have been sustained even though we haven't been building new large new facilities since then. And the second question was, the audit says in a couple of places that um, purchases were made with due regard for economy, um, but I didn't really see any back uh, corroborating evidence for that. For example, markets um, are comparison to market rates or prices, or whether the amount that we spend on average per employee makes sense for an organization of this size and scale. Uh, well, Mr. Mayor, uh, you may not be satisfied with <laughs> uh, having your questions answered, so I'll try and answer the, the second one first. Uh, around economy, what we did um, was assess the increases in prices over that duration of time under the period review and saw that the price increases were lesser than the uh, Canadian price index. So we thought due regard for economy. Do recognize, of course, that the benchmark, the starting point, whether that's the best price or not, I, uh, our audit work did not, cannot give you assurance that that was the best starting point and the best price. But we get confidence through a tendering process. As long as there's a competitive tendering process, mm -hmm. then from an audit point of view, that allows the free market to, uh, to compete and offer the city the best price. Price was a uh, factor, and actually uh, the current vendor uh, was the best price uh, offering for the city back in 2006 or before, somewhere there, yeah. yeah. As to the first one, as to the reasons why, uh, that was not part of the audit, but uh, may perhaps members of the administration can offer uh, an explanation as to what had happened during that time period. So uh, apologize for not addressing those in the report, but little additional context. Thanks, Mr. Torbisenko. I understand that you inherited this report and we're hoping to uh, clear it off the dockets, but I feel like we might not quite be done with the questions around furniture. Mr. Stevens? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The, uh, 
the uh, information on what happen was happening over the audit period from 2006 to 2009 was is that you're, you're right. There were, in fact, two new buildings, but there were also additional, an additional nine leases ah. that were taken up over that period, along with a fairly extensive renovation of the public building, which was paid for out of a partnership between the provincial and federal government and the city of Calgary to renovate the public building. So I won't list them all, but there was That's two new helpful. buildings plus nine leases plus an extensive renovation. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Collier Cart. Those are excellent questions, Your Worship, and uh, lingering questions I think that some of us have uh, because probably the audit could have gone much further than it did. Uh, we're in transition here, and, uh, and, and the questions were certainly excellent at committee. Mr. Stevens, my question is for you. One of the questions I asked at committee was, um, is it possible for us to look at best practice in the country and, and, and do some comparative analysis as far as where we're at with all this? The answer I got was, uh, and what they allude to in the report are the CSA standards, and I'm, that wasn't where I wanted to go with this. I mean, the CSA or, or the Canadian Standards Association is a different, is a whole different ball of wax, right? So the answer I got from your staff was, is that if that was the will of council, that you could go back over the next uh, six months or so and look at best practice and, and compare us to other jurisdictions in the country uh, to give us some idea of, of where we're at in, 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 in that comparison. Could I get your response to, uh, to that response and uh, to that area of concern, please? Please, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, we do. Uh, we are scheduled to go back for a new RFP in 2012. So as I understand the response, what we would do is we have traditionally relied upon the CSA standards. But what we will do in this event is, is that uh, we belong to a national association of um, not just uh, public sector organizations, but private sector organizations as well. And we will try and get information from them on their standards in preparation for that next RFP. So, uh, Your Worship, there is a window of opportunity for us to do that sort of benchmarking before 2012 comes. So what direction do you need from Council and could we see something coming back uh, which would be sort of an update on how you will approach this, like some sort of framework as far as how we will approach going into 2012 and beyond, especially in view of the, th of the three year budget cycle that we're looking at now. Is any direction required? Or uh, I, are you I, I don't believe direction is required. I think we're going to need that. And we're, I think we're going to need that comparable information in order to prepare ourselves for the next RFP. I think you recall from the report that there's already been one extension of the RFP. We won't be extending it again. And that will be part, that benchmarking process will be part of that. The reason I'm hesitating a bit is because I don't know what's out there. We, we have traditionally right. used CSA because it's there. Right. Uh, we will go out and try and find some more information, but I'm hesitant to know exactly what direction for Council to give us that would be helpful other than for us to undertake the work in preparation for the new Well, RFP. as long as you'll undertake the yes. work, because there was some commitment at committee, but we didn't give any direction. So oh, we'll, we, uh, but secondly, when will you report back to us then? Can we have an update on this, say, in the fall to let us know where you're at with it all? Some sort uh, of update on how you're going to approach this area? Yeah, we area? could. We, we, probably the fall would be okay. I just don't know the exact date of when we're going in 2012. I believe it's the fall of 2012. So we could, we could say the fall of 2011, and if we don't have that information, we would still have it back to you maybe by early 2012 in anticipation of the RFP. That would be helpful. And if it could just come back to council rather than going through the auditing process. We'll do that. Mean? Either that or we'll bring it through land and asset strategy where we bring perfect. a lot of our facilities. Thank you. And I know that I know that I myself am going to have some questions um, that may help guide that work as well, which I that will share with helpful. you. But I think Mr. Tobert wanted yes. to add something. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, if I might ask, what is it that you're looking for specifically with respect to best practices? Obviously, we're going out for best price through an RFP process, and so that's the best we can do in this local economy. But are you looking for best practices in other things? Uh, for example, the standards of furniture, uh, the standards of furniture relative to position within the organization. What parts of best practice were you looking for? Well, that's what I thought we needed to flesh out so that we're all on the same page. Um, so I think what, what drove this a lot was the price, right? And, 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 and what are we spending in comparison to other jurisdictions and what their requirements are as well? And how able are you to compare these things? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, and I have, 
I have some more to say. Do you mind, Alderman please, Hallier, if please. I add to that too? So for me, the challenge here, and, and perhaps it's a broader procurement issue that we really need to take offline, but since you asked, um, it has to do with one, our, are our RFPs when we go out to tender on these things structured in such a way that we actually get the maximum amount of participation <coughs> in the bidding process? Um, and that leads to this question of price on individual items, right? The actual price of a chair, for example. Yeah. But I think the other issue that I think all of us who are new have run into as we've been setting up our own offices is the culture within the organization in terms of what is appropriate to spend. You know, I know in my own office we spent a lot of time pulling back the folks who wanted to do much nicer, fancier things in our office that were within our requirements. And I, and I think that these are the kinds of things that we really need to address because, and, and, it's, and yes, this is about furniture, but I just, it leads to a lingering question in my own mind about how we do procurement overall on stuff like this. <clears throat> Your Worship, then I think what you're looking for, and I'd add Alderman Diane Colley Urquhart, is, is this is not just a procurement issue. This is almost like a policy and standard issue mm -hmm. that you need clarification on before you go out to an RFP. Because That's the RFP right. just yeah. gets a sharp price That's on what, what it is you're looking for. Exactly. Why, you want to make sure that we're actually asking the right questions for prices. Yes. So the right commodities. So is, is it more appropriate then, say, for uh, Alderman Pincott and I or someone else take this offline to work with you in a notice of motion to flesh this out a bit more so that we're all on the same page? I don't know if we need to get that formal about this. Okay. I mean, I'll just look at Mr. Stevens and say I'd like to get a report to LAS confirming the standards of furniture purchase that we have at the moment. And that then gets in, in front of uh, land and asset and then ultimately council to say, here's what we use for standards at the moment. So not standards as it relates to CSA, but standards of practice. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank and then you. we can make sure that once we get agreement on that, then when we do the RFP process, we're then we're getting the sharpest prices on the right standards of furniture. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Worship, for the latitude okay? on this. Okay. Thank Is you. Is everyone Worship. shaking their heads? Good. I'm nodding. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just have one quick question relating to the to the audit, and uh, one of the comments that I had I had made, or one of the questions that I'd made, is when we're purchasing the types of uh, ergonomic furniture that we that we are, and obviously we're paying a premium for that for the health of our of our workers. Are we seeing a decline, a corresponding decline in workers' compensation claims, uh, the massaging, and all of these types of things? Is there anyone that could address that? So the audit didn't address that sort it's of not the audit is not <laughs> is there is, are we tracking that at all because it's it, it would really be interesting to see if the investment in the ergonomic furniture is actually making a difference your worship i don't have the actual follow-through information with wcb because the claim can be advanced in a number of different ways but within hr who does the some of the ergonomic assessments over the audit period there was a 35 percent reduction in the number of assessments that were required that leads to the conclusion that much of the furniture is having a desired effect. I don't have, I don't have uh, raw numbers here with me, but that's the information that I was provided after the presentation to Audit Committee. Okay, well, that, that, that tells me a lot of things. It tells me that uh, this is the right, the right move for us to do and um, that our workers are, in fact, worth it. Thank you. Our Alderman Putmans. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, pretty much uh, asked by Alderman Mara, I'd just add a note that in amongst the criteria to look at, I would in, you know, perhaps such things as turnover, job satisfaction, all the rest. I think the qualitative elements of this exercise are tremendously important as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Uh, anyone else on this one? Okay. So on the motion then to receive this report, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? I am opposed. Okay. Thank you. Um, that takes us then to, ah, we get into the public hearing portion, so we'll play musical chairs a little bit here and get ourselves started. Thank you, gentlemen.
So we're going to start then with the tabled report. We're in the public hearing portion now for, and I see a few new faces in the gallery, so I'll say that the way this part works is that the administration will present the item. We'll have an opportunity for questions of clarification only, Alderman Marr, um, for administration. Uh, and then the public will be invited up to speak. First, those in favor of the item, then those opposed to the item. You'll have five minutes to speak, um, and then council may ask you questions. And we've got a number of public hearing items today, so I think this will take us a little while. And um, then we will move on from there. So we are going to start then um, with 6.1 in your agenda, which is CPC 2011-35, uh, land use redesignation in the community of Highland Park. Good morning, Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Members of Council, Ian Cope representing Calgary Planning Commission for the land use items today. Proposed land use that's before you uh, affects the lands outlined in red on the location map. It is located at the end of 41st Avenue Northwest. The surrounding land uses are primarily single detached dwellings as shown in yellow with the Centre Street Church and parking lot for Centre Street Church located to the south and southeast of the subject lot. Proposed redesignation is to take the land from the existing RC2 residential uh, land use and redesignate it to direct control to accommodate the additional use of office. The direct control will uh, use the RC2 as the base district, but an office is a standalone use which may occur on the site should this be adopted. The area is in, an, in uh, a portion of Centre Street which will be affected by a, the Centre Street Corridor Study, which is expected to occur within the next year or so. Uh, until that time, an ad hoc approach to land use is not encouraged. In that respect, the Administration and Calgary Planning Commission considered that the application to change this to commercial from residential was premature, and CPC is recommending that uh, Council refuse the proposed redesignation to direct control and that bylaw 26D 2011 be abandoned. The uh, site's uh, photos before you are showing the area affected. Should note that the site did have a single detached residence on it, but it has been removed and the site is currently vacant. That concludes my presentation. Thanks, Mr. Copa. I like the new look. I was gonna think we'd replaced uh, the secretary with someone younger and... <laughs> um, Quick question of clarification. You made reference in your statement to the Centre Street uh, corridor study. Correct. Is that on the docket for now, do you know? It's not on the docket for this year. I believe they are hoping to get it started next year. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of clarification for administration? Questions of clarification only. All right, anyone wish to speak in favor of this item? Anyone wish to speak in favor of the item? Your Worship, Mayor Nenshi, members of council, my name is Walter Kubitz. I'm the uh, principal of the number company that owns the lot in question. And I do have some uh, materials I'd like to hand out, if I may, please. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> I have the privilege of serving the people of Calgary as a lawyer and have done so for 20 some odd years. Um, the lot in question was purchased as it was big enough to hold a small law office building and there was sufficient sp space for on-site parking. It had good access to downtown, which is important to our practice. It's our submission that the lot is not suited for a residence as it is surrounded by the Center Street Church building and two large parking lots on two sides. It abuts the Highland Park industrial area, which is to the right, which is that gray area there. We met with the Highland Park Community Association on September 14, 2010, and they requested some concept plans, which we have provided to them. The Community Association then advised that they would prefer a direct control land use district instead of a commercial land use, and we accordingly amended the application to direct control. We understand that the people who attended the the Community Association meeting and the then Alderman Bob Hawksworth were in support of the application. 
We understand that there's no direct objection to a proposed use, but that both the community association and the administration do not want ad hoc land use amendments. And if I can refer to uh, the missile development plan wording, and it says, uh, urban corridor, Center Street North, in general, urban corridors are intended to support walkable pedestrian environments fronted by a mix of higher intensity residential and business uses. An urban corridor study area often includes all lands which front onto the urban corridor and, this is important, extend outward at least one block on either side, potentially extending along intersecting streets. Individual urban corridor land use frameworks, densities and appropriate job and population distributions will be established through local area plans. Now there are a, num a number of examples of ad hoc land use amendments along Center Street and a block west on 40th Avenue, 40th Street, I'm sorry. And uh, Mr. Chu has a number of uh, slides I can show that uh, land use that uh, includes in another office building, a strip mall, and uh, two centers of worship, as well as a Tim Hortons, which is very important. Now, we understand that the uh, community association wants to have the Center Street Corridor study completed first, and that this may be budgeted for 2012. I understand that this may not actually be completed until 2015 or 2016 at the earliest. It's our submission that we should not be delayed for four more years until the overall corridor study and plan can be completed. It's our submission that this property is best suited for an office use at present and in the future, and that this is ultimately what this property will likely end up being, either commercial or office use. So we respectfully request your approval of the land use redesignation to direct control for the purpose of the small law, law office, and I thank you for your consideration. And Mr. Chu is here and we'll be happy to answer any further questions you may have. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Kubitz. Um, Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you, Mr. Kubitz. Um, I will have some questions for Mr. Chu, but I just wanted to ask you about your practice. Um, is uh, what type of practice do you do in law? What, who do you deal with? We are, we serve people. We are a small boutique personal injury law firm and we tend to focus on catastrophic and wrongful death cases. So there's very few people that come to our office. They usually come in for the first meeting and then uh, a few times after that during the course of the file, there is often what's called a discovery, which is where we have another lawyer and the clients come in for a face-to-face -face meeting to discover the facts. Uh, there's couriers that come throughout the day, maybe once or twice a day, that's about it. It's very low traffic volume. It's not a high traffic practice at all. It's very but, focused But basically on, you're dealing with individuals rather than big oil companies or? No, I'd have to be downtown to work for Shell or. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my whole point is that you're uh, suited for the, uh, in a residential or close to a residential area because of the type of practice that you have. What, uh, how many employees would you expect that you would have there? Right now, there are two active lawyers and uh, four staff, three of whom are part-time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, uh, Alderman Stevenson. Any others for Mr. Kubitz? All right, is Mr. Chu gonna be making a presentation as well? I believe so. Oh, I sorry, Alderman Kara. Okay. I'll wait for Mr. Chu. Okay, thanks, Mr. Kubitz. We, after Mr. Chu's presentation, we may have another question or two for you, so stick around, please. Good morning, Your Worship, Mr. Uh, members of the Council. My name is Manu Chug. I'm the applicant for this. Following a little bit of presentation, I'll be here to answer any questions you may have. As Mr. Kubis has presented, the proposed land use amendment is for an additional use, office use, to an existing RC2 land use district, in that no other changes are proposed to the RC2 district, just exception of the office use. 
I presented some pictures that shows the neighborhood, and I'll be here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chu. Alderman Carra. Mr. Chu, I know this is a land use uh, redesignation, but I'm curious as to the built form that's uh, proposed as an end result. Can you describe to us sort of what it is you are proposing to build on the site? The, the built form will be pretty close to the contextual use of R-C2 land use district because we are not asking for any changes to the FAR, the height, etc. The built form will be pretty much in that scope. So it'll basically be a house that instead of people living in... The massing will be pretty close to a house, yes. Okay. And uh, is there any sort of uh, thought of sort of doing a mixed form so there could be sort of someone living on the site as well, like in a laneway house or anything like that? No, the, the lot size is reasonably small, so it's difficult to have an office and a mixed use of live-work environment there. So it's purely an office use. <clears throat> now, as a member of CPC, you did you participate in debate or did you just totally recuse yourself from any discussion? Totally. Okay. I left the room. Okay. Thank you very much. There we go. I've got a number of lights on um, here. I was just I was just looking up the site in question. So just my quick quick question is: so the purple blotch directly below is that the Center Street Church West Campus? Is that right? And this is just north of that. Yes, Your okay. Worship. So that was just a quick question for me, Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Chu, would you mind speaking a little bit to the elevation of the site, um, in particular how? Um, the hill goes up towards the back. I don't think that's been mentioned. You will see the land slopes from north to south. We have a lane on the west side of the property and a lane to the north. The, west side of the, the lane on the west side is absolutely not accessible at all. So we are not using both either the lane to the north or to the lane to the west. Lane to the north is about eight, nine feet drop from the north to the south. Um, thank you. Just to clarify that on that particular picture, you can see that there's a bit of a retaining wall. That's actually where that laneway, I think at one time, did come through or was supposed to come through, and it's parallel to the back. Um, I actually drove by there this morning, and those, um, whatever it is, poles, I guess it is, that's holding that up, and there's cars parked on top there. Um, are, is actually falling down. So yes. something does need to be done with that fairly soon, I think. But my point in bringing it up is that you can't really see the elevation from the pictures here, that there is quite a, an el uh, a change in elevation there. Um, can you explain to me on the, um, and perhaps this is a question of clarification that I should have asked before, but um, in the uh, planning documents that we got, it said the previous um, property owner parked behind the home that was there um, from the back alley. Do you know, you, you uh, saw the site before the house was demolished, um, where that parking came from? If you, sorry? I'll have Mr. Kubitz answer that question when he was familiar with the property at that time. The house at the time was actually a converted chicken coop. Um, I guess back in the depression days, it had to be um, you convert into a house, but the access was through the back alley. And in fact, if this photograph that you're looking at right now, right in front of you at this first block would have been the corner of the house and to the left would be a little uh, pull out off the alleyway. That's where the fellow parked his car. Okay, so the house was elevated then? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alderman McLeod, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, sure which of you would like to address this, but uh, the, uh, the lot immediately to the east of that, that's a surface parking lot for whom, do you know? The church, Your Worship. Was the overflow parking or something? Yes. And is that, is that a paved parking lot, gravel lot, do you know? It's paved. It is. Okay. And, um, and to, directly to the west is two, two single family, Residential homes? Yes, Your Worship. And then Center but Street. 
one of them has been condemned and abandoned. Interesting. Which one do you know? One right on the corner of Center Street and 40th Avenue. It's all boarded up now. Okay, thank you for that context. No further questions. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Stevenson. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chu. So then you're saying the, um, the alleyway on the west side, it's really not accessible because of the steep incline? Or Yes, Your Worship. So people that are living be, uh, north of the site or people that are living west of the uh, uh, site there, they come in from the north rather than coming up through that alley, right? Yes, Your Worship. So, so would you be have be able to have parking on site because of um, that steep incline? We are not using that part of the lane for this project at all. The, the part of the lane will stay city property lane. But yes, you have, Your Worship. You have uh, room on site though to put parking. That, yes, Your Worship. Yeah. Okay. So the other question I have is that there's a concern from the um, neighbors or com community about the property in question could become a health clinic or medical office. Um, uh, there might be some synergy if that happened. If the property would become a coffee shop or community convenience store, this would be definitely out of character. You're fine with restricting the, uh, the use uh, when you move to this DC, right? That is correct, Your Worship. That's the reason we're going DC. It allows an office use only. Okay. That's all needed. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. This is going to be part of the Center Street corridor, and I understand that the timing is very difficult for you because there will be a time lag. But um, I'm assuming that the Center Street corridor study will, um, will see greater opportunity for this site in the future. And not just this site, but the, uh, the area adjacent to Center Street. So do you see any um, difficulty in, um, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm kind of wondering why, why do you need to move now when there would likely be a lot of additional density in the next couple of years? Through the, Your Worship, at the moment, my client's need is to relocate his office, and that's what he's looking at. In future, if there are bigger opportunities, We'll take a look at that at that time, but currently, that's what he's looking for. Okay. How big is the lot? It's about 9,000 square feet. Okay. All right. And the condition of the uh, dwellings along center, it's my understanding they're fairly run down. Absolutely, Your Worship. What about on uh, the street, 42nd Avenue? What is the condition of those dwelling units? Are they... 42nd or 40th? 41st. 42nd. I think 42nd. Some of them are owned, but the majority of the houses in that district are rentals. So mm -hmm. a number of the ones that are on Center Street, most of those are rental. Most of them are not in very good shape at all. Some of the ones on 42nd are in good shape. And it seems to be the closer to Center Street, the worse they are, if I can just remember from my driving through the area. But uh, they seem to be decent shape. Okay. Thank you. So there could be significant potential to redevelop that entire block if, if there was a comprehensive zoning. I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around the temporary nature of what I would see as this, this development. I think there's a real opportunity for this whole block. But um, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Any other questions for the applicant? Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else who would like to speak in favor? Anyone who would like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Your Worship, uh, members of council, good morning. My name is Kevin Bentley. I'm the president of the Highland Park Community Association. More importantly, however, I'm a resident of Highland Park, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary of being part of this great city. My comments on this matter before council will be brief. City Planning Department and Calgary Planning Commission are in agreement that the introduction of a commercial um, site at this location 
116 41st Avenue Northeast is not consistent with the existing legislation and land use policy. This site is within a residential area and in addition uh, has seen uh, a new 92 unit apartment building being considered. Uh, this council approved the land use change and it has gone through the development um, uh, permit process immediately to the uh, east of uh, the site. Um, the review of uh, the City Planning Department and Calgary Planning Commission included a review of the Municipal Development Plan. And I would point out that some of the precedent that uh, the applicant uh, identified uh, was prior to the um, implementation of this uh, Municipal Development Plan, which was approved, I believe, by Council in September of 2009 with an effective date of April 2010. Furthermore, in consideration of the North uh, Bow design brief, the urban corridor attributes, which has um, been discussed previously, and looking at the standard industrial commercial area interface with a residential area. Um, what uh, we would add to, um, to these comments is that the area residents uh, immediately to the north of the uh, site have um, uh, provided their comments directly to uh, the planning department um, and are opposed to this project. With respect to the corridor study, as you have heard, city planning has indicated until a, a center street corridor study is conducted, one which provides a better understanding of future land use and redevelopment patterns, an ad hoc approach to land use redesignation is unwarranted. There's actually another reason why ad hoc land use uh, redesignation for Center Street, uh, the Center Street corridor um, is not appropriate. Highland Park is in the second year of a 10 year city council approved strong neighborhood initiative. In, in Highland Park, we like to call it the Neighborhood of Promise Initiative. With the assistance of city staff, this is a resident-led revitalization initiative working towards a complete community, which amongst other things includes a physical environment that encourages social engagement, cohesion, and support of a community identity. At present, the physical environment along Center Street, the, sorry, along the Center Street corridor is not very appealing. It is highlighted by the collection of vacant lots in summer overgrown with weeds and, and collection points for debris, boarded up homes, plus a number of scrap metal enterprises plying their trade. These do not represent positive influences for our community or for the city. This corridor needs a vision. It needs collaborative efforts that may include and encourage new ways for community residents, neighborhood businesses, and the city to work together. As we, the citizens of Calgary, ask City Council for a vision of the future, it is only fair and appropriate that you in turn ask our community what our vision for the future is. We believe that with all stakeholders' involvement, we can make this a better community. We would ask that you consider the request for us to have a corridor study completed prior to further ad hoc uh, approval of projects along this strip of uh, Center Street. Thank you. Great, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Bentley. I, I have one question, which is when's the centennial party? <laughs> uh, it's the whole year. Big event, invite me. <laughs> um, Alderman McLeod. Yes, I'd like to be invited to that party as well. <laughs> So we're looking forward to some details. Thank you very much for that uh, impassioned speech, Mr. Bentley. And, and uh, you touched on many of the points that I wanted to make as well. Um, it seems to me, if I'm understanding you correctly, and, and um, stop me if I'm not, that the, the social needs, the reason that Highland Park is a community of promise is in part because there are social needs in that community exasperated by the Center Street corridor because it is left in disrepair because there is no plan and it is getting worse. Um, and the to do the ad hoc planning does not do anything to bring the built environment together with the social needs. Have I got that correct? That's correct. 
Okay, is there anything else on that that you'd like to add? I No? Sorry, no. No, that's great. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Alderman Carra? Yeah, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Bentley. Um, as you may or may not know, I'm a huge supporter of community involvement and the visioning of their neighborhoods. Um, at the same time, um, I'm not entirely sure about the position that the community association here has taken or you, the group of residents. And I want to ask you some questions about how you arrived at your decision. Uh, I agree that Center Street needs a vision in a big way. And I guess my first question would be, what has the conversation been in the community regarding where and what kind of vision you see for, your, for that street? Um, to date, um, we have not had a community visioning session, if you will. Um, we're in the early uh, process of trying to determine uh, what that process might look like. So, but you guys do subscribe to ideas like complete community and... Uh, for sure, and uh, plan it, um, you know, general overriding principles that are in the municipal uh, uh, development plan, um, yes. Okay. So when you were approached by the proponent and you said, I would like to put in an office, which is part of a complete community, what was, what was the general response to him and what was, how did that roll out and how did we arrive here? Um, yeah, there's a little bit of a, a disjoint um, in respect to that matter. Uh, the board of the Highland Park Community Association has not um, rendered a decision for or against uh, this project. It has not been presented to the Community Association Board. Why is that? Um, um, the, um, uh, the board member responsible did not bring it forward to uh, the board okay, for consideration. So so the community representative representing the community made a de facto decision without engaging the community. My, my question is, am I, am I correct in that? Yes. So my question then is, like, what, I mean, I can, how is it that, um, you know, you have someone who wants to bring reinvestment to the community, someone who wants to sort of bring uh, an added mix of use, um, what, has there been any discussion about how that person can best fit in or has it just been a yes or no proposition or a wait until there's some shining sort of redevelopment scheme undertaken? Because, you know, urbanism doesn't occur in massive redevelopments. Urbanism occurs incrementally, ad hocly over time. And it's nice to have a big shining vision that you can latch onto. But most of the time, it happens in fits and starts as individual business people and community residents work together to sort of build out their community. So has there been any effort to coordinate with this individual and, and try and find a way to fit them into a larger vision and, and, and take steps in that regard on uh, behalf of the community? Uh, the applicant uh, uh, representative only met with me uh, on this matter less than a week ago, so my knowledge base on this particular file is uh, fairly limited. This is like two years in the making now. Okay. Thank you. Obviously we have some engagement yes. issues yes. internally within the community association and at the entire level of the, uh, you know, the entire process level of the city. Uh, but we have to figure out a way to you know, move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Carr, and of course, uh, he's not singling out your community, um, but instead referring to the need to do better engagement across the city. Um, Alderman Popmans. Yes, thank you, Worship, and thank you, sir, for your um, presentation this morning. Um, when do you expect, have you been given any indications of when the um, corridor study, the area study will be completed? Uh, no, I have not, uh, but I can tell you that uh, there's an energy within the community that um, we could harness in very short order, and um, we could uh, bring the, the, the horses to bear to make it a shorter process as opposed to a longer process, if that was the, the question. 
Thank you. If I could just come back to you in a moment, perhaps direct this through to administration, through the chair. Is there any sense in planning department when this um, study might be accommodated or started? Um, it's probably best to leave that one for when we get to questions for administration. Okay, fair enough. Uh, darn. Okay, thank you. Um, is, would, would you think that a use such as this would be radically incompatible with what the community would like going forward? I'm just wondering if it were to be approved today, uh, would this be perceived as a thorn in your side or perhaps a, a part of an augmented community, uh, a full community perhaps of a balance of uses that in some ways might be very attractive? Yeah, I think it's imprudent for me to make a comment on this particular project. Uh, I, I just don't know one way or another. Some of the comments of Alderman Kara, uh, what, what I resonate from, um, in terms of what I was thinking, and that we we would not want to have everything stopped while we waited for a plan. I think there is this living, living tree notion which, prefer, which pervades through a number of different professions and areas. In other words, why stop a, a kind of organic growth? Um, uh, perhaps a use such as this could be accommodated going forward into a fulsome plan. Well, I guess it, uh, you know, there's the two sides to the coin is uh, um, if you allow ad hoc planning, what's to prevent uh, three months from now or six months from now from another applicant uh, coming before council with the same argument and you get uh, de facto development without having a community resident or city visioning occurring at all. Yeah, uh, it, it, perhaps you're right, it is the two sides of the coin. Oh, have local residents um, been contacted or have they been part of the process? Do they Have they expressed to you any concerns or issues about this development? Of this particular development? Yeah. Um, I understand that uh, uh, a number have um, um, written to uh, the planning department and have verbally been in contact with the uh, planning file manager and um, um, I believe of the six, the six um, uh, residences, uh, I believe five have responded uh, opposing the, the, uh, the project. And you know, Perhaps unfair question, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, any particular issues common to them? I think generally um, the introduction of a commercial um, um, uh, footprint in a residential area is not to their, to their liking. Have there been other commercial developments proposed recently that have received a similar response, or is this one of the first lately <coughs> over the past, say, year or two? Um, yes. Um, um, we had uh, um, an introduction of um, uh, uh, a seniors complex in an industrial area that uh, borders uh, the, um, the, in the Greenview industrial area that borders a residential uh, community. And uh, there is, uh, was some concern by area residents on that uh, particular project. Um, um, that's the only one that comes immediately to mind. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Putman's Alderman Hodges. Sure, I'd like to introduce the this week's City Hall School class. Thank you. Uh, uh, there are 22 grade uh, three, four students from Santa Caker School, accompanied by their teacher, Sarah Thomason and Katrina Campbell. And they are here this week as part of their uh, year long focus on the topic, quote, we are explorers of the world. So I'd like to welcome them to City Hall. Stand up, please. Wave at the cameras. There you go. And you just had a moment on TV as well. And I look forward to seeing you all in my office later this week. Have a great week at City Hall. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Bentley. It's important that we get the feedback of the community, but I'm just trying to get a handle on this myself. If this was the lot immediately north of the subject property, would your response be exactly the same on this? Or? Um, excuse me, do you mean to the immediate west? No, to the immediate north. The one, the one immediately north on 42nd. Uh, right behind, yeah, north of it there, that lot that backs to this one. Would your response be the same for that as it would be for this one? 
Uh, likely yes, because it's even more buried in the, uh, the residential area. That's, that's really what my point is, is that uh, this lot to me uh, suits this type of a development where the lot north of it wouldn't. The reason I'm saying that is because it's on two sides. Um, certainly there's uh, uh, more compatible land use on two sides to this property, even to the west. We don't know what's going to take place on the west on Center Street. But really, it's only the north where um, where it's directly hitting uh, residential and likely will remain residential. Who who knows? But I I think this parcel here could be carved out and put into the um, the a uh, different land use uh, so easily. I think it's quite different from the lot uh, to the north. Would you comment on that? Or? Uh, with with due respect. Um, uh, there's no guarantee that what is presently the Center Street Church West Campus would remain um, uh, the Center Street uh, West Campus. In fact, uh, before the Wing Kai development was put into the Greenview Industrial Area, um, this was the site that they were uh, considering. So um, there could well be, with redevelopment in uh, Highland Park and intensification, densification, whichever way you call it, um, um, this corner could be, uh, in fact, a residential area, and then you would have an orphan site with uh, a commercial enterprise on it. So, yes, but to the east of it, it's always going to stay uh, likely industrial. We're not likely to see that happening down there, right? Um, can't can't it's, speak to the, can't yeah, speak to it's that hard to speak to it. The thing is that the, likely the, if the uh, Center Street Church is redeveloped, it's more likely it would go to a mixed use with a higher density of residential and some business. But this business to me is compatible with use in a in a residential area. It's not something that would be uh, difficult to work to to fit in in a residential area, would it? Um, you're you're asking me to to make a comment that yeah. may be construed as uh, a position of the community yeah, association. I understand, I'm sorry, yeah. I can't do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wor Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Alderman Moore. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you uh, for coming today and, and giving your voice for the community. I appreciate that very much. So are you familiar with the, the municipal development plan or Planet Calgary, as we're referring it? Uh, generally, I'm not... Uh, by any sense of imagination, an expert on those documents. No, but are you familiar with the, the general concept of it? Yes. Okay, so what the community, or what I, what I understand uh, the community in the planning department is saying is that we would like to wait for a study of the area, the, the Center Street corridor. Is that generally how you're feeling? That's correct. And you realize that because of the, 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 the move that we're making towards what we're calling a nodes and corridors strategy, what you could see very, very easily would be what we call a mixed use building in and around this edge. So, uh, and by mixed use, I would, I would submit to you that that would include some form of retail commercial with um, living space above. Does that sound like something that the community would be in support of in the future? Um, I think that's part of the, from the discussions I've had with area residents, uh, part of the vision that they would see. Um, uh, that would be part of the rejuvenation and of the community and part of it being a complete community. Um, complete community includes economic development, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, Highland Park is at the present time uh, lacking. We, we lack, um, other than the industrial areas, um, uh, employment opportunities or uh, amenities. Uh, there are no grocery stores. Um, or daycares, things of that nature. Of that right. nature in the community. So uh, likely, and once again, I, you know, I've got to be careful here to not lead you too far astray. Um, likely, however, um, we would be encouraging that type of development. Only the mayor tries to lead me astray. Um, so my question then is, in the event that you, you would wait three, four years for a, um, for a corridor study, uh, and that could really transform and reshape Highland community, which is something that you, you want to see. So this particular parcel, which I think you might agree with me, and I won't put words in your mouth, uh, so I'll ask you, is something 
on that site, on that lot, better than what's there now? Um, well, it's a vacant, <laughs> vacant lot, so, um, you know, from the, sorry? It's like a mud pit from what it's I can tell. It's a mud pit, uh, so uh, we have enough of uh, those already um, in the corridor. We don't need another one. Um, so, yes, yeah, something would be better than nothing. Okay. Now, would the community support, or do you believe the community would support, a multifamily residential building on that site? Um, Yeah, I, I can't. You know, you're. Uh, you don't I, know. I can't. I got. I got to be careful. I'm not here um, without uh, having asked uh, the community or the the board what their position is. Okay. So, yeah, okay. So what, what you what you're allowed to say right now is essentially that you're you're in opposition to this. You want to wait for uh, a corridor study, even though the corridor study will likely say that you're going to be looking at multifamily and, and commercial on that site. Uh, one last question, sir. Whereabouts are you in relationship to this to this project? Are you on the map at all, or not? Um, my residence. Your residence. Um, Just in a general area. Yeah, my residence is um, a block and a half uh, due south of the uh, of the site. Okay, so you're in in, in that Senator. general area yeah. where, where where the indicator is. Yeah. Thank I'm, you. Those are my questions, Your Worship. Thanks, Mr. Bentley. I don't see any other questions for you. I really want to thank you for taking your time out on a Monday and being with us today. It's really important that we hear the community voices when we make these decisions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? All right, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing then and move to questions for administration. And I know Alderman Footman's had one, but I had the same one and he's not here, so I will ask it and maybe Mr. Mahler is the right one to answer it, which is um, the applicant's letter suggests that a corridor study would take something like four years to complete. Um, is that actually the case? Uh, if we were to get this on the docket for 2012, when would we, look, when would we be looking at it? Uh, Your Worship, based on similar other processes, the way we've been working recently, we believe we could complete something in 12 to 18 months if once it started. 12 to 18 months. Now, Mr. Mahler, this could be a really complicated uh, corridor study because if I get my druthers, it will include a conversation around rapid transit on the Centre Street um, corridor and potentially a relocation of the North Central LRT alignment. Um, that said, could you still do it in 12 to 18 months? Through the, uh, your worship, I think the issue is once we would have to do a project scoping. I know Transit is doing some work already on potential alignments for the North Central LRT. So the timing would be based on the inputs that we have at the time. But similar to other processes, when we go through these uh, exercises with the community, even through the process, you start to get a sense of where the direction is, is headed. And we don't hold up applications for an ultimate conclusion of a study necessarily if the direction is clear as to where it's going. So I do think 18 months is, is a reasonable time frame and should be expected that we can complete okay. a vision. And I always get mad at my colleagues, uh, Alderman Marr, for asking hypothetical questions, but uh, I'll ask one to you, which is, if in fact this becomes a rapid transit corridor, is there any thought to whether this particular area, this particular neighborhood would become a transit node if there would be in fact station or something like that in this general area? Your Worship, I can't comment on that. I think Transit would have to speak to that at this time. At this point, I don't know. I think the answer is they don't know yet either, but okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, some more questions for administration. Stick around. There may be more for you. Alderman Marr. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mahler. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, or sorry, uh, Mr. Cope, uh, I, I, I hate to, to go down this road because it is very hypothetical. And my question now from a planning perspective is if we're going to move forward with a corridor study, where does that fit in, in in our overall time frame in the work plan? Can you respond? Uh, Your Worship, I think this would rank as a high priority for my group in terms of doing this because we have had a number of applications along the corridor and there is a lot of community interest. So it would be, in, in my preference, the request would likely to be in the early stages of our three-year work program. However, that does require some internal alignment with other departments to ensure that all the departments can 
respond in that process to give us answers in a short time frame. That's, that's the most critical part to get that in, internal alignment on timing. Thank you, um, Mr. Muller. Now, is there any initiative within planning and transportation to coordinate on what you were just speaking of at all right now? Yes. It, so it is, and it is going to be in the work plan in the very near future? Your Worship, it will be requested to be in the work, pro work program. As you know, land use planning and policy does bring our work program forward to council. So this, it does require some priority setting relative to other projects that might come forward. However, my, as I said, it's a high priority for land use planning and policy at this time going into the work program discussions. Okay, um, that's handy to know. So in the event that we were to move forward on a plan, a corridor study, uh, you think that it could be completed within 12 to 18 months, completed, and so land use would, framework would be established where if this development came back in that time frame, we would have a fairly definitive idea as to what this, this corridor would look like. Uh, Your Worship, I think the, the issue and timing of completeness, I'll give an example of the Southeast 17 corridor study, which was not a complete study in terms of an ARP amendment and application of land use redesignations. However, it was done in a 12 to 18 time frame. It had a lot of pre-consultation advance of that. However, it allows us to now make decisions on land use applications as they come forward. So mm -hmm. I think this application, for example, if the applicant uh, didn't proceed with it at this time, uh, it could continue more quickly through that process than waiting for city-initiated land use redesignations, for example. Okay, and because this is basically one lot off of the actual corridor, would, would, would it be out of the ordinary for it to be considered for a commercial site or not? Uh, Your Worship, I think the most critical point of this site is that it's strategically located with reference to how that area redevelops. The actual use um, of, of residential or commercial is certainly an opportunity, but it's, the, it's how that parcel gets used in an overall reconfiguration and redevelopment of that area that pr provides its real strategic value. Um, and that, I think you know, the uses probably uh, would depend on the consultation with the landowners immediately surrounding and what their intentions are as well and community input. Mm, okay. Um, that didn't really answer my question. My question was, uh, and I'll rephrase it, in the event that we were to move forward with the study for this area, commercial uses would be included in the, in, in the overall plan, yes? They would be considered, yes, absolutely. Okay, so if this, if this project was submitted or resubmitted to us with a commercial, with a multifamily component above it um, or attached to it in some fashion, would that be more in keeping with what you're envisioning the overall quarter strategy would look like? Well, I guess it's important to emphasize I'm not envisioning anything myself in the planning department. The, the idea behind the corridor study is... consistent is, with the MDP. Well, the MDP requires a local area plan prior to making decisions on the future of that vision, and that requires the local area planning process, including landowner and community consultation. So while the MDP would suggest that residential mixed use could be appropriate, whether this particular lot, how that fits in, fits in does depend on that consultative process before we want to re before we recommend a decision or a recommendation. No, I appreciate that. So what I'm hearing from you, and, and do correct me if I'm wrong, we're looking at a 12 to 18 month window, in which case we would be looking at how this is this this land is going to going to fit in or not. Uh, and my personal belief, based on my own experience in my ward with regards to planning and corridors and things of that nature is that we would likely see a commercial or multifamily development on this site. So Your Worship, at this time, I, I think that um, given the fact that this is a, a, a local law firm, which is a uh, considered a neighborhood use or could potentially be considered a neighborhood use, it's likely going to be a commercial property anyway. And it's, uh, it's, I don't think it's inconsistent with the MDP. So I think that uh, I would be supportive of, of this in spite of what the, the, um, the uh, planning department is saying. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Mar. Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm not sure who to direct this question to, but 
I'm wondering how many um, properties there are that are under demolition order along this corridor right now. I, I'm, I think there's five that I know of, but is that, I guess that comes from bylaw, does it? Or? Your Worship, I'm sorry, but I don't have that information. We could certainly get it to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do know the one on the corner there is boarded up, and I think if nothing else, what this has highlighted and what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues is the importance of getting this Centre Street Corridor study done because it, it, it if nothing else, it, is, it, it has um, pointed out the importance of planning in relation to the social um, dimensions of a community, how a community evolves, how it transitions. And I think that um, the ad hoc planning in this, in this instance is um, just adding to the problem. And there's been quite a bit of it in this area. I think we need to stop doing that. And so I am going to uh, make the motion, move it when that time is appropriate, that we aban um, refuse the application and abandon the bylaw. All right, let's finish up with our questions for administration and then I'll recognize you at that time. Thank you, Alderman Carra. Mr. Mahler, as you know, I'm a huge fan of master planning. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I, I like master planning as a tool to help sort of create the vibrant economic environment we want to see in our, in our city. I'm concerned about a local business wanting to improve a site and being told, yeah, just wait an indeterminate amount of time. Is there no sort of mechanism to sort of say, this site could intensify, we will work with you on a DP that will build something that works for you now but could be part of an intensification pro program into the future or is our only recourse to be, yeah, just wait? Uh, Your Worship, I mean, of course it's possible to work with an individual landowner on a site-by-site -site basis to come up with something. I guess the question is coming up with something relative to what? Right now we're talking about relative to the existing land uses. We're talking about relative to a future corridor, which we're not sure how it's going to look like. So I guess our, we could come up with something. Um, we do it on, on a regular basis, but I think, as, I think there is an opportunity for this parcel to be part of something larger, and we'd like the opportunity to pursue that in advance of making decisions. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> um, Mr. Cope, we received a letter here from the applicant, I believe, indicating that um, that they had met with the Highland Park Community Association, uh, including Mr. Bill Morrison. And in the report, it does make reference to Mr. Morrison's letter, although I don't see Mr. Morrison's letter in the package. Uh, that's correct. Uh, at the uh, Calgary Planning Commission meeting, we did receive a letter from Mr. Morrison. That letter indicated that uh, the community association had not considered uh, the application at that time. Calgary Com Planning Commission uh, received the letter as information, but did not attach it to the CPC report. It's, this letter suggests that Mr. Morrison was actually supportive of the project. Uh, the one we received is the one that's on the screen right now. That was received by Calgary Planning Commission for information. Sorry, bear with me for a minute while I just read through. This was August 20th, 2010. There's been nothing further since then other than the presentation. Nothing submitted to the uh, either the file manager or planning commission. Okay. Thank you. That's all I need to, to know, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't have any questions for administration. I'd like to enter into debate. I'd actually like to move that we accept the proposed redesignation, but we would have to you're going to accept the motion to uh, refuse, and if it's defeated, then I can enter into a new I think different... to be polite, Alderman McLeod did get there yeah. before you, so let's do that. So then I'll, I'd like to be left, my light left on no for problem. debate. Any other questions for administration? 
Alderman McLeod. Sorry, thank you. Um, just on the letter that Alderman Chabot was asking about, there is another letter on August 19th, I believe, that, um, that we was have nothing on file. Um, oh, okay, because I have a copy of it here, but it's not stamped, it's just, it was faxed in. So that was the one with the bylaw requirements, conversion of the building, and some of the other pieces that had been requested from the applicant. Yes, so our file has not been updated since Planning Commission. But this was dated August 19th, 2010. So, okay, sorry, I just, I had it, so I thought I should mention it. <laughs> I will make the motion as um, recommended by administration to refuse the uh, redesignation of this lot and to abandon the proposed bylaw. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that? Thanks, Alderman Farrell. All right, so the motion on the floor then is to accept the administration recommendation. On the motion on the floor, um, did you want to debate that, Alderman Stevenson, or do you want me to just leave your light on now? Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, I will not be um, supporting this because I I believe that Mr. Kubitz could come forward and build a house on there if he wanted to, and if he came then and applied for a home occupation, we'd give it to him very easily because uh, it's, the, it's perfect for... Um, a business, there's lots of uh, uh, access and parking and not interfering with any neighbors or anything. And, and I, as I said earlier, the lot is consistent with, uh, with the uses around there. And I think uh, because it is, and because it's a community friendly uh, business, it's something that uh, will draw from the community. In fact, people can walk there and when, when uh, we get the LRT up Center Street, they'll be able to walk from the LRT to this use, um, and I don't believe it's fair to hold this up for three or four years. I have difficulty believing that the um, the study would be done in 18 months because um, we're just entering into a community consultation on the on the new uh, new or different routes of the cent North Central LRT. We have um, the first meetings Transit is doing start in in a week and a half, so. Um, that's going to uh, go on for a while, and and I think that it uh, it's just not proper. It's not right that we hold a developer up when he is building, proposing to build a, com a consistent with the area uh, complex, and um, is ready to go, needs to go. It's not fair for us to hold him up for a few years until we decide what's going to happen in the other areas adjacent. So. If this is uh, defeated, I encourage you to vote against it, then I would like to make a motion to accept it. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, too, will not be supporting the motion to file um, or to abandon the bylaw. Um, I agree with Alderman Stevenson in regards to uh, pretty much everything he said. The uh, direct control designation that's being proposed is continuing to be in keeping with the existing residential uses, i.e. that it is going to be based on RC2 with a discretionary use, additional discretionary use for the uh, office component. So it really doesn't change what's actually going to be built on site. It just provides the opportunity for a business to locate on that site without having to have somebody reside within the structure. So I will be supporting uh, the uh, alternate motion that uh, Alderman Stevens puts forward if and when that comes forward. I will not be supporting uh, the abandoning of this bylaw. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm, I'm a little bit torn up about this because, as you know, I do love master planning and I do love... Um, I do love community involvement and redevelopment propositions. I also understand administration's perspective that this could be a linchpin property in a comprehensive redevelopment. At the same time, though, you know, we're sort of sucking and blowing here. Um, we're saying that commercial doesn't fit in a residential neighborhood. We're hearing that from the community. But at the same time, we're talking about the need for a comprehensive redevelopment process that's going to essentially upzone this property beyond what's currently being contemplated. And so, you know, they're not, they're not hitting what's currently there. They're not hitting what could be there. And another sort of, I think, big elephant in the room is we're talking about the fact that we want 
uh, something that's more intense eventually on the site. The question is, when's the market going to catch up to what's there? And what we have is we have a local businessman who wants to build something and run his business out of the community, part of a mixed-use, complete community. So I mean, the big challenge for me, and, the, and we can sort of say, well, we have no idea what's going to happen here. We're talking about an urban corridor. It's not, I mean, it's not that mysterious. We're talking about an intensification of uses. I do agree that this site could be sort of strategic and linchpin. So the big question that's before us is how do we do the kind of intensity that's being proposed on the site right now, but we build it in such a way that the potential for intensification if and when there's a redevelopment scheme that envisions massive intensification along the site. And that, unfortunately, is a DP-related concern. And I'd be, you know, I think it's important to get the DP on this right, but we're talking about multi-story, we're talking about residential, office, commercial. We have no idea when the market's going to support that. And we've got a Calgary businessman who wants to invest in a community right now. So I'm going to have to say, we have to move forward with this. I'm going did to. Did you convince yourself, Alderman Carr? Yeah, I did. Well, right. <laughs> just just for fun, because we've only spent 90 minutes on one lot yeah. um, in the city. Should I try to convince you the other way? Oh, um, geez, come on. <laughs> no, I never would. I'm not sure what. I'm, I'm just teasing you, Alderman Carr, because you walked us through your whole thought process. Well, no, I'm very I'm, helpful. <laughs> okay. So I will be uh, not supporting uh, the current motion on the floor. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Alderman Collier Kurt. Well, in the fullness of brevity, my colleagues have probably uh, outlined uh, why I'm not supporting the motion to file and abandon the bylaw either. Because uh, what it does is it places us in this either or situation where, uh, sorry, it's either a corridor study and, and it's not uh, what's before us. And I think we can do both. Uh, there are many areas in the city that I think could certainly benefit. We were having a discussion earlier from these corridor studies to improve the connectivity and, uh, and the community well-being. So um, the rules of the residential and contextual uh, 102 dwelling, the RC2 district, apply in this direct and control district. These folks are operating by the current rules of the game. And, uh, but what I do think it does, Alderman McLeod, is uh, if we can approve this today, it sends a real strong message to anyone else that wants to come forward. That really, um, you know, we're not going to make these folks pay the price, uh, but we're really looking at these sort of things much more seriously on a more holistic and comprehensive basis. And we need to improve this area. We saw, uh, I didn't drive by it this morning like Alderman McLeod did, but we absolutely need to improve this area, and, uh, and I really appreciate your intent. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Collier. Card Alderman Zemong? <laughs> Hold on. So the secret is if I don't let the mic come on, don't talk. <laughs> it's working now, Alderman DeMong, if you want to try. All right. <laughs> Alderman Putmans. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, dangerous precedent. The, um, the, to me, this debate over this um, proposal is important because I think there's a principle here that perhaps is in a continuum of to what extent do planning principles um, work in concert with ongoing market activity. And I think that as we see a market emerge, perhaps this is an opportunity for some of the planning to in processes to inform themselves of this activity now. And I would hate to think that in a neighborhood which admittedly and is in some distress at the moment would not accept a use that by all accounts seems to be fairly compatible with what we might imagine in the future. And so for those reasons, I will be supporting this application. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Before I call on Alderman McLeod to close, would you give me the permission to say a sentence or two myself? Although I was teasing uh, Alderman Carr, I think that he put his finger exactly on the issue that we're talking about here, which really is the question of, do we allow things to go forward when we think there may be a better use at some point in the future? And this is really a, a very big challenge for this particular piece, because if you look at what it's adjacent to, which is the largest house of worship in the city, um, and if you think about potential high 
uh, high-speed transit up Center Street, then I would imagine that this area would become a transit node um, in the fullness of time. And uh, one RC2 dwelling that has an office in it may not, in fact, be the right location, uh, the right designation for something that's right next to a, an LRT platform or an LRT station. All of that said, the question that we really have to figure out ourselves is precisely the one that's been raised is do we put a hold on development that would be okay, thinking that at some point in the future there might be something much, much better. And I think that's really what council needs to grapple with today. In this particular case, I think I would rather aim for the much, much better, but I certainly understand folks who are saying we can't hold all development in, uh, in stasis until we get our ducks in a row in terms of what we want to do. Thank, thanks for your indulgence, Alderman McLeod. And thank you for those comments because that captures a lot of what uh, I've been struggling with as well. And I have struggled with this one over and over again. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's fair enough to say this is a small um, office. It, the building is going to look a lot like a house in many respects. It's not necessarily impacting anything. It's only access is from 41st Avenue. It's a dead end. There's no laneway impact and all the rest of it and that's all well and fine until you look at the bigger context and you you um, realize that this is part of a much bigger problem and two years is not an awfully long time four years five years six years i mean you know i, I don't know whether you where you cut off the line but i think that um, the future use of that uh, center street property the, the one that's actually on Center Street as opposed to the church, which you can see in the purple down below. And that's quite a hill that goes down there. Um, we need, we, I think it's important, and, and I, I think it, we need to look at this in the greater context of um, it's much more than just this single property. The social issues, the social context, um, the Center Street corridor, the, the way these buildings are being run down or allowed to run down is causing considerable problems. And I think this is just a great example of how the relationship between the social dimensions and the built environment are so important. And we've got to get that Center Street corridor study. And so if we go ahead and approve this one along with the others that have been approved, I think we continue to set a bad precedent. So I would urge you not to support this. Closed. Thanks, Alderman Mc... Really? Okay. Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Um, I have a request for a roll call vote, please. On the CPC recommendations contained in Report 35, Alderman collier Cart. No. Alderman DeMong. No. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? No. Alderman Keating? No. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? No. Alderman Pincott? No. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Carra? No. Alderman Chabot? No. Mayor Nenshi? Yes. It's lost, Your Worship. Thank you. Alderman Stevenson? Yes, Your Worship. I'd like to uh, move the, uh, the uh, redesignation and the three readings of the bylaw. Thanks. And Alderman Colley Urquhart is seconding that one. Um, so basically, what we just did is we reject. <laughs> I love the double negatives because a couple of you look confused. We just rejected the rejection, and now Alderman Stevenson has moved the approval of this particular change, and that's what we have on the table now. Alderman Carr. I, I just want to speak to that. I thought we were going to hear some. I think, you know, the all the arguments that were made uh, still apply. And what's critical is that this DP is... Uh, we get this DP right, because I do think that this is an important site, and I do think that whatever gets built has to be able to fit in with a more intense use in the future. And so, I don't know what mo I don't know what options we have as a council. Can we do a motion arising on a second reading, or after second reading of the bylaw, requesting that that the DP, or like specifically saying that the DP should uh, 
should address uh, potential imminent intensification of the site so that whatever gets built now at a lower level of intensification can meld better? Or are we looking at building something and then looking at a knockdown in 20 years while the rest of the site has developed intensely around it? I just think that. OK. Uh, Your Worship, uh, certainly after the first reading, um, the, the direct control district could be uh, amended. Um, having said that, I think you'd want to amend it with some specificity. Um, it is a, a, a land use bylaw after all. Um, so the, the short answer is yes, you can. But I don't know what the contents of that would be. I guess my question is not so much an amendment to the land use uh, bylaw, but so much an admonishment from council that's very clear as it moves into the DP process. Or is that irrelevant? Uh, no, Your Worship, I don't think it's irrelevant. I think perhaps uh, what could be done is, is something could be added to the purpose section of the direct control district bylaw to give. Um, some d direction to um, the authority in exercising their discretion. So, and I, I see that uh, Mr. Cope is <laughs> standing. <laughs> Mr. Cope? Yes, through the chair. Uh, I think what you're talking about is probably a motion arising to provide direction that would be put onto a um, notice on posse, which would be picked up by the development planner should a development permit comes in. Uh, one perspective you may have to look at if you're wanting a specific site to relate to other sites at this point in time uh, the development planner would not know what those other sites hold so it would be very difficult for them to incorporate that direction into their review of a development permit and get that decision made in a, in a timely manner Okay, so we have two um, options. One is that we rewrite the purpose statement. The other is that we do a motion arising with, I don't know the terminology there. Um, if we were to table this after first or second reading, uh, and then could we, would it be possible to do that and bring it back to the next meeting of council in like two weeks' time with that worked out? One next week? week next yeah, week. next week, eh? Um, yeah, the public hearing is closed, so uh, we could do that uh, and bring it back next week, um, unless you think that you could jot down what you're thinking about in, the, in a motion arising, uh, in which case we could just do it after lunch and have okay. that motion arising. That's fair. Maybe we'll do it after lunch then. So, so if you want, yep. given that the public hearing is closed, you could table this item now and bring it back after lunch if you like. Or you can wait until we've um, you can wait until we've approved the recommendation, but before we've done the bylaws. That's what I'll do. I'll wait till we've approved the recommendation. Hmm? Okay. Apparently, uh, we might even be able to do the purpose statement after lunch. So what I'm going to suggest is just so the applicants don't have to stick around forever, let's have the vote on the recommendation. If that okay. passes, then I'll recognize you to uh, table until the table the actual bylaws until after lunch. And I'm hoping I can work with Mary over lunch to get this right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to support the recommendations, but I, I think it's important to clarify my position on this one because I've gone through a lot of. I've, a corridor study and several transit oriented development studies. It's really important when you're going through those types of substantive transformative changes in the community that you allow the community time to, to have a full understanding of those changes and be able to sort of come along with us in, in making those changes. So I think this is presupposing an outcome and I think it's underachieving, certainly. But it's a modest enough change that, that uh, I don't see it hampering redevelopment substantially in the future. But, but I, I hope we don't do this too much and rely on, on these kind of one-offs 
in order to change our city. We have to have an understanding of what the ultimate outcome will be. And that perhaps is a spur to the planning department that communities are desperate for these corridor studies. They want them, they see them as positive things, while as before maybe we would have been reluctant to, to pursue them. And somehow we need to figure out a way to learn from the ones that we've done and, and advance the new ones um, more quickly. Because I, I don't see them this one as being much different from some of the others that we've, we've undertaken. And maybe there's an opportunity as we look at these one-offs to, um, to use them as test cases for what we would want to see along the entire corridor. Um, but I, I, I think this one is really underachieving and this could be quite an exciting node for this neighborhood and redevelopment right now would probably hold it back for several years and, and so I, I think it's premature but I, I'll support it just because it's in front of us. Thank Thanks Alderman Farrell. Alderman Hodges? Karaz raised the issue of what about uh, redevelopment in the future, the one interesting thing about, uh, which hasn't been mentioned yet, believe it or not, in the last two hours, is the purpose statement, uh, Appendix 1, page 2. Uh, direct control district is intended to accommodate both this duplex semi-detached use and an office use within a newly constructed building. Well, the question is, do you want the office use to be, uh, occupy the entire new structure or not? So, Alderman Craw and uh, and uh, members of the planning department staff, uh, is it the contemplation this is entirely an office use, partly an office use, or the minor part, less than 50% of the floor space will be an office use? I don't think that's been sorted out here yet. I don't know if you want to sort it out at this point, but it would be a good idea if it was. Otherwise, it's simply going to be an office use within a building that looks like a duplex but doesn't function as one, or a semi-detached building. Yeah. Looks like a semi-detached building, but in fact is an office. And I think that is what I heard the applicants say, um, that this is really intended for an office use, not a residential one. All right, uh, anyone else on this before I call on Alderman Stevenson to close? All right, Alderman Stevenson to close. Closed. Thank you. So on the recommendations then to adopt the land use change and give three readings to the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. Uh, Alderman Hodges, Alderman McLeod are opposed. Um, Alderman Carr. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that we uh, table this till after lunch and uh, at which point I'll be bringing back a reworked approach to either the purpose statement or the uh, or a motion arising depending okay. on. And we'll, and we'll deal with the technical aspects of how to do that over the break as well. Okay. Alderman Farrell, you're seconding that. Very well then, on the motion to table this, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Chabot and uh, Jones are opposed. Uh, Alderman McLeod. And I also have a motion arising to um, direct administration to prioritize the Centre Street Corridor study and to ensure it is included in the 2012 work plan. Let's do that one after we do the bylaws, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that one after lunch as well. And only not quite two hours, Alderman Hodges. <laughs> One hour, 45 minutes in, we get to the second item on the agenda. Item 7.1, land use reason designation in Highfield. Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. The area in question is outlined in red, which faces on to 42nd Avenue Southeast at 9th Street Southeast. The area is in the Highfield Industrial Park, and the proposal is to take the lands from the existing IG Industrial General District and redesignate the lands to IC Industrial Commercial District. The lands surrounding it to the south and to the west have both been recently re redesignated to IC uh, to recognize the uses in those particular buildings. The site itself was originally I-2 under bylaw 2P80. During the transition to the new bylaw 1P2007, the area was transitioned to IG District, which recognized the majority of the uses within the building. We do have air photos that show the building with respect to others. The casino is located directly to the northeast. The actual building itself is a multi-bay development, which contains a number of commercial and industrial type activities with parking at the rear of the property. Uh, as there are a number of uses within the multi-use building, 
which are not compatible with the IG district. It is recommended that the IC district be used, which would accommodate all the existing uses and future redevelopment of the site. In that respect, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation to IC Industrial Commercial District and that three readings be given to bylaw 32D 2011. Thank you, Mr. Cope. Um, and just for clarification, so this is these are existing uses, so this is just another one of those where the land use bylaw may have been out of sync with what was actually on the site? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have anyone who, oh, any other questions of clarification for administration? Seeing none, do we have anyone who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone like to speak in favor? Thank you, Your Worship, members of the Council. My name is Ona Mako uh, on behalf of uh, Abu Ghraib Kaspar Architecture, and I'm here to answer any of the questions you may have. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. First name, Otto Mako. Great. Thank you for being here. Any questions? Uh, Alderman Kara. Just because I'm curious, can you tell us how this sort of came about, how you, I mean, are you, I'm sorry, I missed your introduction. Uh, are you the proponent here, or? No, I am here, applica uh, no, I'm not proponent. I'm here on behalf of uh, Frank Sissons. Of? Frank Sisson. Frank Sisson, okay. Okay, so, so the, Applicant. Of Kaspar Architecture. Okay. And how was, yeah, can you just give us a, a brief timeline? Like, it, it, was I, it was IG, and who determined that it wasn't appropriate as IG and IC, and how much time has sort of no. under, been undertaken? I'm not quite privy who determined that it was appropriate to change I2 to IG, but in that change, some users became incompatible. So, and actually, at the time of the introduction of the new bylaw, IC did not exist. And IC district has been created to perhaps correct these deficiencies. Okay, and so how, so were a lot of these uses predating the change of the bylaw? Exactly. Okay, thank you. I just will speak. To Thanks, uh, Alderman Kara. Uh, any other questions? All right, thank you, sir. Thanks for being here. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in favor? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? All right, um, any questions for administration? Alderman Kara. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll move it. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Uh, thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any further discussion on this one? Did you want to introduce it at all or talk about it? Or no, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, in close, I'll just say that um, I think this is a waste of everybody's time. And that <laughs> I think we, like, we t do tend to do a lot of these fixes of, the, of errors in the land use bylaw, don't we? I, I honestly, I do not understand why we've sliced the industrial up into like a million little subcategories and we spend time shuffling around. I don't think it's good for business. I don't think it's good for city time and resources. I don't think it's an appropriate use of council's time. Thanks, Alderman Kara, And uh, you certainly have a symp sympathetic ear in this chair on that. So on, okay, we still warm. on this particular one, um, on the recommendations then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them has a doctor's appointment, one of them has just had very painful dental surgery, which has resulted in an abscess, <laughs> if you were wondering. Um, on the bylaw then, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, that takes us to 7.2, land use redesignation in the community of Whitehorn. Mr. Cope.
Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation is in the community of Whitehorn, located on Whitefield Close, northeast. The proposal is to take the lands from the existing RC1 district and redesignate the lands to RC1S, which uh, has the exact same land uses with the additional opportunity for a secondary suite within the residential building itself. The site it's, uh, is located within 660 meters walking distance to the White Horn LRT station and there is a bus route which is located on Whitefield Drive to the north of the site. Uh, the uh, would indicate on the air photos here surrounding land uses which are all single detached dwellings. Uh, we do note that uh, there were letters of support signed by area residents indicating no objections to the proposed redesignation. In considering the application, CPC did have a number of discussions. Uh, these included those who were not in support of the application, that uh, there was um, consideration of this being spot zoning without a specific ARP uh, or community support indicated. Uh, there was no guarantee of owner occupation of this structure and there appeared to be a lack of on-site parking. We do note that there was no comment received from the community association with respect to this application. Um, the review included the opportunity to review the bylaw with respect to area requirements. We do note that the lot does conform to the area requirements to allow for a secondary suite and that although there is no on-site uh, parking at this time, there is sufficient area to provide for that. In that respect, uh, CPC is recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation to RC1S to allow for a secondary suite and that three readings be given to proposed bylaw 33D 2011. Thank you. Questions of clarification for administration, Alderman Jones? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Cope, there's one thing that in the back in the, uh, it says that there were six letters of support. How come none of the letters are in the document? Uh, we generally do not put individual letters of support in the, app, in the uh, actual document for FOIP purposes. Uh, we do talk about the, any letters we receive as part of the community and adjacent resident support or comments in the report itself. Is it possible in the future that maybe the ward alderman could see the letters of support before it comes to council? We'd have to check that with the FOIP department, but uh, generally speaking, if they're on the file, we would probably get them to you. It's just that I would like to see them, uh, if possible, in future. Thanks. Thank you, Alderman Jones. Questions, clarification for administration, Alderman Chabot? Uh, actually, Your Worship, if this, those red dots indicate the letters of support, that's correct. That is the clarification I was looking for, and, and there's no other letters from any of the other um, property owners? No letters of objection, no letters of support. Okay. Do you don't have a hard copy of this, do you? I I'm going to have to commit it to memory or, or write it down on my own notes here. Actually, just bear with me for a second. Yeah, but they're not indicated as such on my, your worship, so. That corner one, just bear with me for another moment or two. Skip one, two, three, one across the street. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. That's all I need to know for clarification. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in favor? Hi. Um, good morning, Mayor Minchi and City Council. Excuse me, I'm very nervous. So, my name's uh, Andrea. Don't be nervous. Very few of us bite. Yes, um, my name's Andrea McKinnon. I'm the owner and applicant of the land use designation for this property, um, and I'm just basically here to answer any of your questions that you may have for me. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to be here. I'll ask you the question that I ask of everyone who mm -hmm. is in your position, which is, how long have you been at this? When did you start this process? Um, my application went in in June of last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. And about how much do you think you're out of pocket so far getting to council today? Around $4,000. Okay. Um, and do you live there, by the way? I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that is it for me. Alderman Chabot. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. McKinnon. I couldn't help but notice on the... Um, on the site pictures that I saw, yeah. that it appears to be a fairly significant um, elevation uh, variance there. Um, 
um, from the street? At the front, yes, and then it levels off at the back. Okay. Well, it looks like the other side of your yard is higher than the, f the top of the fence. Um, it is at the far side, but I was going to level it out in the next year or so. Okay. It's kind of hilly a bit. So, but it's not. There isn't like a significant grade change. I wouldn't say. I don't know. It looks like more than 20% to me, which means you'd have to probably undergo a, um, a slope adaptive uh, development, overland drainage issues. No back alley? No back alley, no. Uh -huh. yeah. Not sure how you're going to be able to accommodate the on site parking requirements. You currently don't have any parking on site? No. Hmm. The part of the fence at the back. You can actually open it and you could park in there if you needed to, right at the very back corner there. It is a gate. And I, somebody might have parked there and who previously owned the property, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so, but okay, currently well, there isn't like any. Okay, I have no further questions for yourself. I will be asking administration some questions though. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. Any other questions for Ms. McKinnon? I feel like I know your street very well. I think I have a friend who lives on it. Um, anyway, uh, great. Thank you so much for being here today uh, and for taking your time to be with us. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in favor? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? Morning, Mr. Feck. Yes, Mayor Alderman. My name is Oscar Feck. I'm not per se going against this uh, secondary suite, but it seems to me the one on 41st Avenue Northeast, why you had so many problems getting that approved. It's always good to have a development going when things are falling apart in the area. Houses are condemned and everything else. But my point is this house sits in the ground, there's no windows in there as far as visually I can see. They have to spend, excava for, to excavate probably maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. There's no windows in. Uh, why this was even brought before council uh, is, is, it's beyond my understanding. Usually houses that have windows in the basement, and the law now is that you have to put in bigger windows, uh, for, for fire hazard, uh, uh, you know, this doesn't make any sense to me. Mayor, th these are my comments, and uh, why the planning commission even recommended this or whoever doesn't make any sense. And uh, spot zoning, the one up in the northeast was not spot zoning. Partly it was, but it no, tied it in with the industrial, and it was a good spot to have the small office building in there. And, brings in a new environment. What are we doing? Calgary is not doing as good as it used to anymore. We need activity. We are not doing it, Mayor. Right. Don't get off topic. We're talking about this one, but okay. I think well, that your um, I think that your point is an interesting one about the windows, and it's certainly something that would be addressed at the development and building permit level, but I imagine Alderman Chabot may have that question for administration. But those are the facts, Mayor. So, like I said, I'm not against it per se, but going by the bylaws and what the city, city should recommend, this goes against everything. If there's any questions. Thanks, uh, Mr. Feck. Alderman Jones, did you have a question for Mr. Feck? Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak against this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? All right, then, questions for administration. Alderman Jones. Mr. Cope, <clears throat> you had mentioned uh, that there is, uh, there is availability for a provision for on-site parking, and that I would take would be part of the development permit. That's correct. So it doesn't need to be done at second reading? Uh, no, uh, parking, uh, if a development permit is received, uh, there would be one stall required for the existing dwelling and one stall for the secondary suite. 
And just because Mr. Feck brought this up, windows that the building would have to be brought to code, would it not? That's correct. When, there would windows have to would be, be windows for exiting. That, and windows would be included in that? That's correct. Okay, Your Worship, are you ready for a motion? Are you ready for a motion? Um, I am, uh, I, 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 I'm ready, but I hear Alderman Chabot say he's not ready yet. Okay. So Alderman Chabot, will you, I'll get his question and I'll come back to you, Alderman Jones, if there's other, and, and Alderman Pincott's questions for admin. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Cope, uh, how old is this home? Do you know? I have no specific date, but knowing the area, this would have been built likely in about 1980, 1979. 1980, 1979. So oh, are R1 properties, RC1, R1, what's the, what, what's the parking requirements for an RC1 property? Uh, one stall per unit. Okay, so that house has been there since 1980 something, early 80s, with the requirement to have one parking stall there off-site, or on-site. On-site. On -site. And yet we have none today. That's correct. It's not uncommon. Okay. There's, now there's going to be a requirement for two parking stalls. And from what I can tell, really the only place that it can be provided is going to be on the side there, mm -hmm. alongside of Whitfield. There's actually quite a lot of room there, yeah. yeah. So, so then there will be a need for the people to back out of that site or drive forward out of that site from the side there onto onto that street, which is kind of like... It is a residential, uh, local residential standard. Yeah, see, it's the only entrance into that whole cul-de-sac area. And it's right close to the entrance. I, I don't know, it looks to me like a potential safety hazard in so far as people getting in and out of that property out onto that road. Yes, just to indicate that there are driveways uh, across from that uh, uh, across Whitfield Close that already back onto that road. Uh -huh. well, and there are actually there are actually two entryways into that little close, one at, one right where the adjacent parcel is and one below. Like I say, I know that street quite well and boy I'd be shocked if uh, the if there entrance? were major safety and traffic issues on that no, street. I'm sorry, Your Worship, uh, there's two entrances into that? Well, one right where the site is and one just below, like 10 houses further south, right? Huh? See what I'm saying? No into the area. You said there was only one way of getting into that cul-de-sac, but there are in fact two. Where? Because right, it's all a square? No, no, that entire area is serviced by that one oh, entry. I see, I see, I see, I see. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. You're, you are correct. Yeah. So, Access does come point field drive. Anyways, Your Worship, I, I, I can't see myself supporting this for a number of reasons, and I guess the primary one is from a safety perspective, and that being the main entry, entry point into the area. One of the things that was done in the new land use bylaw says that unless we have like 50% of the street that has front driveways, that you're not allowed to put a front driveway. So the argument here could be made that, that well, it's not a front, it's a side driveway. But in essence, it still amounts to the same thing. It's backing out onto a main street. So uh, for <laughs> that reason, amongst a, a several others, I, I'm not going to be supporting this application. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Pincott, did you have questions for administration? Uh, yes, thank you. I just, uh, something that Mr. Cope said tweaked me. Um, so as part of, at the DP stage, they would be required to add one parking stall for the residents and one for the secondary suite. The bylaw standard is one stall for the dwelling unit and one stall for the secondary suite. Okay. There is opportunity for the development authority to consider the situation in the area Right. and not have that on site. Okay, because as I look at the area, there are many properties in that site who do not, in that area, who do not have on site parking. The, the majority, I would say, do not have on site parking. Okay, so that is, there is the ability for relaxation at that That's point. Correct. Okay, good. Thank you. I just wanted to check on that, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alderman Pincott. Alderman Jones, I think we're ready. Okay, Your Worship, uh, I'm not. I'm still not in favor of a blanket policy for, for secondary suites. If this site was probably three or four houses down, I wouldn't be standing to agree with it. I'd probably be opposed to it because there wouldn't be a provision for on-site parking anywhere on the site. But I had a talk with the community president a couple of months ago about this application and seeing as how it, he had no objections to it uh, on behalf of the community. And there was six letters of, uh, 
of agreement to it from adjacent neighbors and there was no objections received, I'm going to move that we uh, move the recommendations and give three readings to the bylaw. Alderman Marr beat you to it, Alderman Farrell. Um, thank you. Seconded by Alderman Farrell. Further discussion, uh, uh, Alderman Marr, excuse me. Further discussion on this one? Very well then. We're going to the vote if there's anyone in the back who wants to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. The secondary side of the room. There we go. Well, if you missed the public hearing. Oh, no, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Folks who weren't there for the public hearing, you can't come back. Isn't this done? No. We're just voting. Sorry. 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 My mistake. My mistake. So on the recommendations, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot and Hodges are opposed. First reading the bylaw, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot and Hodges are opposed. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot and Hodges are opposed. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? All right, then we'll have to delay third reading of the bylaw. Alderman Chabot is opposed. All righty. Okay. So, Ms. McKinnon, we will do third reading of the bylaw uh, at our next meeting, I believe. Is that right? Okay. On the 16th, um, and then we'll be done. Thank you. Seven point three land use redesignation in the community of Huntington Hills, Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Similar application to the last one. Uh, this is in Huntington Hills, located on Third Street Northeast. Parcel outlined in red, which is one lot in from Huntborn uh, Hill Northeast. Proposal is to take the lands from the existing RC one district and redesignate the lands to RC one S district. Uh, containing the same requirements in terms of lot size and development with the additional discretionary use of a secondary suite uh, in the residential building. In considering the application, we do note that there is uh, no objections from the community association. Uh, we did have indications from area residents of support. There were seven on a single letter. However, that uh, letter did not contain actual addresses so we cannot ascertain exactly where they are located on the site. Uh, and considering this, uh, CPC did recommend approval of the redesignation. We note the site is fully developed and there is an existing three stall garage located at the rear of the property accessed from a lane, which would accommodate all the uh, potential parking requirements uh, should the secondary suite be allowed by a development permit. Uh, the Note that there is a public submission objecting to the proposal. Uh, that uh, individual is located approximately one block south of the uh, subject site. In considering the application, it was not a unanimous decision by Calgary Planning Commission. Uh, there was one objection uh, to the proposal, and that included reference to spot zoning and the lack of a comprehensive ARP amendment or community support uh, for an amendment. Uh, in the area. In that respect, Calgary Planning Commission did recommend that Council adopt a proposed redesignation from RC1 to RC1S and that three readings be given to bylaw 34D 2011. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cope. Um, question of clarification, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. Mr. Cope, the picture that you showed of the three car garage from the back lane there. Yes. It's right here beside it. What is that? The, uh, to the left is the adjacent lot. It is the adjacent lot? That's right correct. There? Okay, and on the other side of the garage? Uh, the fence would demarcate the uh, property line and there'd be another residence beyond that and another garage. But it looks like there's room between the garage and that fence, is uh, there? Very little, just a walkway. On the other side there? On the other side, yes, that's correct. Okay, no overhead view of that? Yeah, the open space would be on the adjacent lot, I believe. It looks like more than a walkway there, Mr. Cope, but it would be nice to have uh, further clarification on that. Anyways, thank you for that. Thank you uh, very much, Alderman Chabot. Any further questions of clarification? All right, anyone wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in favor?
Hi, Hello. I'm really, really nervous. So Again, um, very few of us bike. Don't be nervous. <laughs> okay, um, I'm the Maxine Lallier, so I'm the owner of the property. Um, we've been in the community for approximately, well, my parents owned the house. We purchased it, and I do have my children living there now. I do have my daughter who is pregnant, and that's the basic reason for the suite. She couldn't find... Well, before that, it was my sister, and I don't want to get into it publicly and stuff. But, you, you don't have to. But, but now she couldn't find a job because she was pregnant, so this is the perfect place for her, and she has her privacy and stuff. So it's basically, you know, used for family or for close friends. And regarding the, the parking where the garages are, right beside that, you can fit a car there. You can. Like he was into, yes, you can. Yeah, we did have a vehicle in there before so there's three car garage plus a spot for parking so you've well. got room for four off-site right and, and do you live there miss lalia yes okay um alderman chabot questions for the applicant yes thank you for being here today yes so and thanks for addressing that question um because i was going to try and get that from you now there was um um an indication that you had letters of support or seven signatures right uh, any idea on which properties those were um, I have one that's right beside the one that you showed the the property beside with the vacant that's a parking stall as well no the other side the corner yes and then the people across next to me yes 20, 25 or yes whatever and then the ones behind me uh, they su supported but I never was able to get a signature because they're always working and then the ones in the front the lady just passed away so it's basically a lot of them all around me so I didn't get specific addresses on there. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have no further questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alderman McLeod. Uh, my questions were asked by Alderman Chabot, but I did want to add thank you very much for coming. Oh, it's much appreciated. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you the two questions that I ask everyone, which is, so how long have you been at this? Oh, for approximately as, as long as that other just about Lady. the same? And, yes, and how much money have you spent on this so far? I've spent $4,000 plus at least a couple of days of salary missing work today. Today included. To be one of them, plus the running around to go to City Hall and, and stuff. And, and I just wanted to mention as well, when we started the, the initial process, and the first time we had the little thing on our yard, first of all, they thought we were under arrest, but anyway, <laughs> that drug house or whatever, but somebody left a note in our mailbox and it was from a gentleman who just purchased a house and he just moved in a week before. And what he stated was he got flagged and that uh, now he just bought the house because he has older teenagers as well and you know they have little get-togethers or whatever and they, it has a suite in the house mm -hmm. and now he he was charged with the bylaw guy came and now he was either forced to pay the four thousand dollars which he didn't have or he has to rip it apart so now he did not have the four thousand dollars to go ahead with the process so now he had to go ahead and you know tear that all apart and that was existing in the house when he purchased it as in Huntington Hills, there, oh, well, I shouldn't say it because maybe they'll all get flagged now, but there are a lot of secondary suites. But at the time, they were more like in-law suites or, or, you know, just a place where people would go in the summer. It was too hot, so they cook in the basement type mm -hmm. thing. So, but I, th I think it's kind of, you need to do something because even for us, the $4,000, that was like a big chunk. And for you know, all the time and all the effort and all the stress, my God, the stress <laughs> and is, is, is a lot. And your intent is not to, as you said, you, you, you're you using it for family members. So your intent right. is not to make money off of this. This is not an investment for you. No, you but initially, you know, the people that we did help, I did have a letter, you know, saying why, you know, we started to do that again. It's because for, say, my sister, they did help to contribute a bit because utilities right. and all I'll that you, stuff you, is, you. you know. So to say I didn't take a dime, it's it's not. That's not true. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, Sir Alderman Collier, did you have a question? Okay. Um, wonderful. Again, thank you for taking the time out of your day thank to be you. here. And thank you for your submissions, not only on your own place, but to help us understand where the process is and is not working. That's ex extraordinarily helpful for us. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Worship. Uh, I would like the Council to uh, welcome 
21 students that are in grade five and six from the Woodland School, along with their teacher, Carolyn Swan. Would you please stand and be recognized by council and be on TV? Thank you. And welcome to City Hall. Thanks, hope you have a great day here at City Hall. And uh, as Alderman Farrell always reminds me to remind people, you were just on TV. Um, Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in favor? Anyone will wish to speak against this proposal? Anyone wish to speak against? All right, questions for administration then. Uh, Your Worship, if I might uh, provide some clarification on uh, a response I gave to Alderman Chabot. Mm -hmm. We did check the real property report for the site, and yes, you are correct. Uh, my view of the property line was that it goes beyond that fence and there is a larger pad area with a shed located on it on the north side of the building. That's very helpful, thank you. Um, I did have a question, but it was sort of cheeky, so maybe I will put it away uh, for now. Alderman McLeod. It is, thank you. So you'd like to move the recommendations and three readings of the proposed bylaw. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Pincott. Did you want to say anything about it, Alderman Cloud? Just, just that um, the support of the surrounding community is important and the fact that the uh, community association has indicated that they do not object has um, informed, as well as Mrs. Lallier's um, presentation today has informed my decision on this. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Alderman Chabot? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Well, contrary to the previous application, this um, street that this house resides on is uh, does not appear to be a main connector uh, um, or exclusive entry point into the surrounding area. There's a fairly elaborate grid system. In this area, there's potential for four parking stalls on site. Um, it meets all of the uh, the needs that I would envision as could that could eventually become problematic. Um, for having a secondary suite. So although it still is somewhat spot zoning in essence, um, it is a provision that we do have in the land use bylaw now to allow for this type of development to occur where it makes sense to do so. I think in this particular case, it makes sense to do so. So I will be supporting it. Thanks, Alderman Shabor. So, so noted. So you're in favor of blanket zoning if there's parking stalls, which is the proposal that came before us about a couple months ago. So I will note that, Alderman Shabo. Thanks. I'm, I'm really thrilled you've come to the light on this one. Fabulous. All right. So <laughs> we'll just uh, make sure all the media pay attention to that one. Thanks. Um, any further discussion on this item? All right, then. Did you want to close, Alderman McLeod? Closed. Wonderful. Um, on the recommendations, then, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Opposed. Alderman Hodges is opposed. Alderman Hodges and Stevenson are opposed. All right, first reading the bylaw, then, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Opposed. Alderman Hodges, Alderman Stevenson? Alderman Hodges and Stevenson are opposed. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges and Stevenson. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges and Stevenson are opposed. Thank you. Um, and just for the interest of uh, the folks who are watching this in the gallery and at home, the difference between this one and the last one is, since we did all three readings of the bylaw, we're done. <laughs> Um, on the last one, because we didn't have unanimous authorization for the third reading of the bylaw, it means that we have to bring the third reading back on a future date, and the third reading is required for us to um, complete the land use redesignation. So we'll be doing that at the next meeting of council. Well, we'll be voting on that at the next meeting of council. All right, thank you. So that takes us then to item 7.4, uh, land use redesignation in the community of Rosedale. Mr. Cook. Thank you, Your Worship. The area affected by this proposed redesignation is outlined in red. Borders 10th Street, Crescent Road Northwest, and 13th Avenue Northwest. The subject site is an isolated area containing an existing single detached dwelling. Proposed redesignation will take the lands from RC1 and redesignate the lands to direct control to accommodate a limited range of commercial uses. As indicated, this site is uh, an isolated site from the rest of the residential area, and there is no other commercial located in the immediate area. However, the state campus is located directly across 10th Street Northwest. And considering the potential uses for the site, which does contain at least two parking stalls if 
not three, uh, if my uh, memory serves me correctly. Uh, the proposal is to actually use the existing building as a counseling office. The direct control limits the commercial uses uh, to that contained within the existing dwelling uh, by area. Area site photos, this is a site looking to the uh, southwest from Crescent Road uh, with the park area located directly north of the site. This is looking uh, northwest uh, from Crescent Road and 13th Avenue, uh, showing the SAIT campus in behind and the existing parking stalls uh, on the south end of the parcel. And this is a location uh, site looking directly north on 10th Street, showing the interface with 10th Street and 13th Avenue. Given the isolated nature of the site, it's less than ideal situation in terms of residential and generally no impact on the surrounding residential area. Uh, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt a proposed redesignation direct to direct control and that three readings be given to bylaw 35D 2011. The property immediately to the north, it's just a little bit unclear from the map and now on here. Is that a home that's fronting on to 10th Street? Uh, the house that you see here and the garage are the subject site. Oh, those are the subject that site. That is the subject I'm site. sorry, I get it now. Yes. Okay. And there's a park on the other side. There's a park on the north. Okay, I get it now. So this is just kind of one remaining funny that's correct. Um, thing along this stretch. Okay, that's what I was confused about. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Carroll for clarification. I'm sorry, I got, I did too, obviously, as I'm looking at maps, but uh, I'm trying to compare that with my Google Earth picture here. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Cope. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this application? Anyone wish to speak in favor? Your Worship, members of the council, my name is Charles Coleman. I'm the applicant, the resident at the current site, and I'm here if you have any questions for me. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. So if I'm understanding correctly, um, you are looking at um, putting um, a counseling service and commercial uses into this, into this site? Yes. Okay. Um, any questions then for Mr. Coleman? All right, thank you very much for being here, sir. Oh, Alderman Carra has regained his train of thought. Yeah, and I mean, I probably will ask you and Cope this because if it's an unfair question for you, why a DC and why not like a CN1, a, community, a commercial neighborhood one? I originally went, a plan to go with a CN1, but in meeting with the community association, we came to the agreement that a DC would limit the uses okay. and prevent future potential problems. I understand. Thank you. So, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Mr. Coleman. Thank you. Anyone else who wish to speak in favor of this application? Anyone else wish to speak in favor? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this application? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? All right. Questions for administration, Alderman Farrell. I'm having problems with my microphone. Um, I'm prepared to move the item and three readings. And okay. just for your information, Alderman Carra just mentioned that this was one of Calgary's first dream homes for the Calgary Stampede. Is that right? Just to show how, uh, how much more modest we used to live. The new dream homes. Did you know much that, bigger. Mr. Coleman? <laughs> no, but I used to Ah. Did it really? Well, all that's a fascinating thing. Ah, that is very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, do I have a seconder for that? Second. Thanks, Alderman Pincott. Any further discussion or questions on this one? Very well, then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. 
Uh, 7.5 then, uh, Mr. Cope, uh, land use redesignation in, again in the community of Highland Park. Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation uh, affects a property uh, facing on 4th Street Northwest, outlined in red on this location map. It backs on to the Highland Park uh, golf course uh, and is accessed in terms of parking from a rear lane between the golf course and the site itself. Proposal will take the land from the existing multi-residential contextual low-profile MC1D124 district uh, to a multi-residential contextual low-profile MC1 district. The purpose of the redesignation is to recognize the opportunity to provide an additional two dwelling units within the existing building. We do note that the subject site was originally designated in 1969 to allow for 14 dwelling units uh, and was subsequently uh, redesignated in with the new land use bylaw to allow for those 14 units, uh, therefore the uh, density of 124 units per hectare. Uh, subsequent to that, it was discovered that uh, this is actually an air fo or a site photo taken from 4th Street, uh, and as you'll see on the next site photo from the rear, uh, there's a substantial uh, drop, uh, recognizing that the majority of the units would face on to the golf course, and you can also see the available parking there. Uh, subsequent to the redesignation, it was discovered that there was an additional two units that had been incorporated into the building in a what was a originally a common area. Uh, the old residents have been removed from the site uh, pending the outcome of this development or this land use and subsequent development permit. Uh, so as I indicated, this proposed uh, land use will allow for an additional two units to occur within the site. Uh, subject to a development permit and building permit requirement. And in that respect, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending uh, approval of the proposed redesignation and three readings to propose bylaw 36D 2011. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Uh, questions of clarification for administration, Alderman Chabot? Um, for clarification, so this is essentially just to bring this unit into compliance with the, with the existing built form. Uh, this process will allow for the building to be brought into compliance in terms of building code and development permits. Would they, will they require a uh, development permit? They will they require a development permit and a building permit. To ensure that the units are actually built to code? That's correct. Okay. And so um, on 4th Street, which is, I guess, the back of the building? Uh, no, that's actually the front. Uh, however, because there is a significant grade difference, it's only a one-story height uh, facing on 4th Street, uh, you end up with about a three, a three and a half story uh, face uh, facing onto the golf course. Okay, so I see a vehicle parked here in front. So vehicles can park on 4th Street here? That's correct. Okay, thanks. That's all I need to know. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. Alderman McLeod, question of clarification? Um, thank you for for the presentation. Uh, when were these two units added? Uncertain as to when they were actually added into the building. Uh, I believe there was enforcement action taken that when they were discovered. Which was recently then? That's correct, within the last year, I believe. Hmm. Um, it just seems odd to me, you know, for a building that size and nature that um, the owner wouldn't be a little bit more um, sophisticated. It, it strikes me as either intentional or odd. I'm not sure which. Um, I, there, I, there's I, a good possibility that they have been there for a long time and just undiscovered, but we don't know. And so, yeah, so it, in fact, it could have been built that way or done at the time? Uh, probably not built that way because there would have been inspections at the time. Okay. All right, thank you. I'll, I'm prepared to move this when the time comes. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> of course, sorry. Um, Okay, and, and the building's been around for a good long time, right? Since so the designation came yes. after the building? Okay, yes. great. Um, question of clarification for Administration, Alderman Hodges? To the Chair, uh, Mr. Cope, uh, is there sufficient on-site parking given the proposal is for an, an additional two units? It's my understanding there will be sufficient on-site parking. How much on-site parking is there, do you know? I would presume 16 stalls. Uh, they're not really marked, but you can see the area uh, as accessed off the lane. 
uh, isn't there usually a requirement for visitor parking? Uh, there may be a visitor parking requirement, uh, but my understanding, preliminary review, that will be subject to a development permit, is that there is sufficient parking available. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Um, I see that we're at 12 o'clock. I would really like to uh, open and close the public hearing on this so people don't have to wait around if that's all right. Thanks, Alderman Kara. Um, so Alderman Kara has just moved to suspend the procedural bylaw so that we can uh, keep our recess until the end of this item. Do I have a seconder, Alderman Stevenson? Are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Agreed. Alderman Jones and Farrell are opposed. All right. Um, for, did you have a question of clarification for me as well, Alderman Kara? Just a quick question. I don't understand. What's the DP that's coming? I mean, I, uh, am I totally misreading this, that this is just bringing a current existing use into com a conformance with the, the bylaw? The, the existing structure has a development permit for 14 dwelling units. In order to increase that intensity, they would have to get a new development right, permit. I for the totally extra. got it now. My apologies. They had 16. We enforced it. They closed down the other two. If we make this change today, then they can bring forth the DP to bring back the two Got it. other units, which they probably had for a million years. Okay. All right. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in favor? Your Worship, members of council, good morning. My name is April Kojima, and I'm here representing Rick Balby Architect. We are the applicant for this application. Uh, I think I just want to address uh, some of the comments from Alderman McLeod. Um, in my experience, this isn't really an atypical situation. Um, it seems to throw back to buildings built 60s, 70s. Um, they were required to have uh, amenity areas, common amenity areas, and they usually ended up in the basement. Um, in a lot of cases, we've seen where, where suites have been developed over time, indeterminate time, they kind of show up at some point. Um, Different people have different approaches to resolving that. I'm sure not everybody comes forward with the applications. Um, I may not have been aware. Uh, I wasn't aware this was a result of enforcement action, actually. Uh, we brought it forward as an uh, a land use application. And uh, since then, uh, the owners have been extremely cooperative and forthcoming. Um, as a little aside, an update, the property, uh, just to confirm Mr. Cope's um, words there. The, pro the two units in question are not occupied. The tenants have been relocated. Um, I believe they were put into a hotel and then found another suite for them. Um, and the, the main issues there uh, in terms of building code, which I think are very, very important, um, the windows are undersized or were undersized. Uh, that has since been corrected as well with, with uh, code compliant sliding windows installed in anticipation of an approval. So uh, I'm here to answer any questions, if there are any. Thank you. And, and this is rental housing, is it? Yes, it is. OK. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in favor? Anyone else wish, anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? All right, then. Um, we'll close the public hearing. Questions for administration? Seeing none, anyone would like to move this? Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Do I have a seconder? Th thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Any further discussion on this one? Very well, then. On the recommendations and three readings of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. Carried. Thank you. Uh, we will reconvene at 1.20 p.m. Um, with item E-2011-03. Oh, and I have a, um, I have a distribution uh, from... Chief Hansen regarding a future item which we'll have distributed right now as well.
And we're back. So we're going to go back to the item that we tabled before lunch. Um, uh, what was the number on that, folks? 26D. 26D 2011, is that it? So what we're going to do, I understand there are some amendments to the bylaw, so I'll accept first reading the bylaw, and then prior to second reading, I will recognize um, Alderman Carra, who has uh, bylaw amendments proposed before second reading. Uh, we're back to 26D 2001, 6.1 in your agenda. If you recall, we passed the recommendations, but not the bylaw. So then, first reading of the bylaw, then. First reading of the by. Oh, thank you. We have to do that. You're moving to lift it off the table, sir? Thank you. All second by Alderman Stevenson. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. First reading of the bylaw, then. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? All right, Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm just getting this hot off the presses right now. Can we get it up on the screen? I'm asking that we do two things. Number one is that we change the actual DC to allow for a little bit more flexibility in how the, the building at development permit stage is positioned on the lot. So the opportunity to position it in such a way that there will be more space on the lot to do a higher density redevelopment. Um, and that comes in at section seven, and an added section seven. And it says, in reviewing the development permit applications for this parcel, the development authority may consider relaxing the rules concerning building placement, building setback, parking and access in anticipation of the future redevelopment of the parcel or the surrounding area. And so one of the, so one of the things that I'm thinking is in New York City, in the East Village, for example, you have like an eight-story building wall, and you go into this building, and there's a small backyard, and tucked up against what used to be the lane, you'll have a house that people are living in that's like three or four, two, two or three stories high. And so the understanding is if we position it on the lot in a particular way, that allows us to develop the rest of the lot if and when it comes time for a TOD redevelopment. Okay. Um, so that's what I'm recommending there. And then I'm going to ask for a motion arising after we pass third that explicitly states that as council's intention. And we can get to that later. But I'm asking for support of this amendment to the bylaw right now. Thank you. So we have an amendment on the floor, seconded by Alderman Moore. Any discussion on the amendment? Yes, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to ask a Mr. Cope a question on that. If we have a DC bylaw, Mr. Cope, and we put in this kind of an amendment, is there an opportunity for the community or anybody to appeal it if you decide to provide relaxations? So these are guidelines. Uh, any relaxation, uh, I mean, any development there would be a discretionary use anyway, so the use could be. Uh, appealed regardless uh, but certainly uh, this will give some guidance to the development authority um, certainly at SDAB if it were to go that route uh, SDAB is relatively um, well significantly concerned with council direction and without specific elements that they can say yes it conforms or does not conform uh, there could be some question as how the development authority exercise their discretion. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Cope. Thank you for that. Hence the reason for my concern with this proposed amendment, Your Worship. If there is an appeal that's put forward at SDAB, how is SDAB going to interpret what this means? What is relaxed? What isn't relaxed? What is within the discretion of the authority? Um, can the community appeal any of the relaxations. SDAB might overturn any appeals on that basis. So <clears throat> I won't be supporting this proposal. Ms. Axworthy actually has a, Ms. Axworthy actually can address part of your question, I think. As, actually, Your Worship, mm -hmm. I, I, if someone wants to ask Ms. Axworthy that question, I'd be more than happy to listen to her response. Okay. Having sat on SDAB, I can tell you from firsthand experience what I have experienced at SDAB and some of the interpretations that have occurred there. Now, if you would like that clarification, Your Worship, 
I'd be happy to listen to it, but not on my bequest. Thank you, Your Worship. I would like that clarification, Ms. Axworthy. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. I, I appreciate Alderman uh, Chabot's uh, experience on SDAB and, and certainly understand where he's coming from. I think the intent here was um, to add a, a clause to the bylaw which would anticipate the potential for relaxations and provide some support to relaxations. If, um, if there is a desire to consider alternate layouts for this particular site given the unique circumstances, um, then without this clause, I would suggest that it would be very difficult because it's in a direct control bylaw for SDAB or the development authority to support any relaxation. So that was the thinking behind the wording. Thank you very much, Ms. Axworthy. Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Your Worship. I, this seems to be a lot that really I struggle with because I am very much in support of doing some new and different things and thinking about things differently. So in spirit, I support this. But I also heard in the debate um, of the in the debate that um, that part of part of the strength of this application and part of the feedback from the community on the initial proposal and the initial consultation was that the building was going to look a lot like a house. And so I I feel like without the community here to speak to it, it's a little bit difficult for me um, to know what what um, what they would be thinking or how much that part of the application was, um, how important that piece was to them. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Alderman Collier Cart. Thank you, Your Worship. In light of Alderman McLeod's comments, uh, would it be possible for us to bring this back in a week or two after she's had a chance to consult with her communities and get their input on it? Uh, Ms. Axworthy? Yeah, yes, of course. And that was the original suggestion. That's we were what just I thought. trying to be helpful, but um, we could certainly bring it back in a week. Yeah, so we do it in a week? if Alderman McLeod wants to refer it and bring it back in a week, then I would second that if it's her wish. Okay. So. I'll second that you wish. No, no, I'm just, I, was, I was just about to ask that question. Would that trigger a new public hearing? Mm. Why don't we do this then? Um, one thing I can suggest, I don't have my calendar in front of me. When's the next combined hearing? It's three weeks from now, isn't it? Um, the combined meeting? June. Oh, we'd have to re-advertise though, so it doesn't matter. Well, why don't I suggest, why don't I suggest that we'll take Alderman McLeod's referral motions, bring it back next week, and should significant changes be required, then we're unfortunately back to the drawing board. But if this is, as I suspect it may be, a relatively minor tweak, um, this will allow us the time to get it right. So the motion then is to, what is this motion to? Refer to whom though? Refer to administration for further neighborhood consultation to come back on, um, is it, what's the 16th of May? 16th. 16th of May, 2011. Okay, and second. you're seconding that, Alderman Collier Card? Oh, it was second. Okay. No. Okay, um, so we've got the referral motion in front of us. Any discussion on the referral motion? Alderman Carr? Yeah, I mean, I'm totally supportive of going to the community and making sure that this is cool with them. This is an attempt to sort of be all things to all people. We do have a, I did have a motion arising put forward that would also give more council direction. So my, I guess my question is, before we refer this, um, do we make that motion arising or do we make it after? Because I think it's important that this motion arising be part of your consultation with the community that sort of talks about. Yes, because we've taken the recommendation, sorry, there's just a small procedural bylaw issue, but yes, no, that would be fine. Because we've already accepted the, uh, Alderman Chabot's shaking his head, but he's wrong. Because we've already accepted the, because we've already accepted the recommendation, it means that it is appropriate to have a motion arising even though we haven't dealt with the bylaws. So yes, once we, once we finish this, you can get up, make your motion arising, and then immediately move to refer that for a week as well. Okay. Okay. Good. Understood. Alderman Chabot? Yeah. I'm glad you qualified the process to accomplish that. Thank you. I, I'm okay with that. Um, You're welcome. I'm, uh, 
I, into referral. Referring it back so the community can consult on this issue. Your Worship, I, I would say more so the applicant because the community already came out and said they weren't supportive of this application. So I would venture to guess it's probably going to be less supportive of it if we give the authority more opportunity for relaxation. So I'm not going to support the referral either. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. All right, on the motion to refer then, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Chabot. Oh, call the roll, please. On the referral, Alderman Keating. No. Alderman McLeod. Yes. Alderman Marr. Yes. Alderman Pincott. Yes. Alderman Putmans. Yes. Alderman Stevenson. No. Alderman Carra. Yes. Alderman Chabot. No. Alderman Collier Cart. Yes. Alderman Demong. Yes. Alderman Farrell. Yes. Alderman Hodges. Yes. Alderman Jones. No. Mayor Nenshi. Yes. It's carried. Thank you. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, can we get the motion arising on the screen? Please. And so I think this was the two part to the process. So we, I didn't want to presuppose the solution, the design solution. I wanted to give enough flexibility, but we wanted to be clear. And the motion arising says that the development authority consider how development on the subject parcel will relate to the following future scenarios. A, comprehensive redevelopment in the area that includes the subject parcel and surrounding lands. B, redevelopment surrounding but not including the subject parcel. Particular consideration to, should be given to building placement on the parcel, future vehicular access configurations, and building interface conditions relative to future uses and developments. Now, and that just basically says, is it Sorry, your, your Worship, uh, point of procedure, uh, as we didn't actually pass the previous ah, item, so I don't believe this just, is a motion arising. You weren't listening to what I just said before. No. It's actually a motion arising from the previous thing that we passed before lunch. From the recommendations? Yes. Not from the bylaw. Okay. So, so he's okay. Okay. And I think he's about to refer it anyway. So, okay. Yeah, and I, I want to put that now, have, making that motion arising, I can't refer it. Yes, so can. I can? I ask but first, I need a seconder. Okay, do we have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Alderman Collier. Cut. Okay, it's on the floor now, Alderman Curra. I ask that it be referred to come back at the same time that we bring back the proposed amendment to the bylaw and the bylaw itself. And Alderman Collier, cut. You're seconding that. Okay, so we have a referral motion then on this motion arising. On the referral motion, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Chabot and Stevenson are opposed, and now the whole thing is coming back next week. Thank you. Next item. Oh, yeah, Alderman Lowe, you can come back now, wherever you are. There we are. Do you want to do that one now, or do you want to do that next week? All right. Another motion arising on this one, then. Um, this one's actually pretty straightforward. It's to direct administration to prioritize the Centre Street Corridor study and prioritize the Centre Street Corridor study and to ensure it is included in the 2012 work plan. I believe we've heard that it is included in the 2012 work plan, but one of the things about this particular one is that we are spending an incredible amount of time and staff resources with the Community Neighbourhood Initiative and with a strong community or community of promise. And what's happening on Centre Street is in direct conflict with that. We need to get to sync the two and the Centre Street study is part of that. The transit um, study, the transit route is going forward very quickly. I think we can speed that up a little bit as well and um, get all, all departments working in the same direction. Um, it's particularly noticeable in this community as well as uh, Tuxedo to a lesser extent. But there's an awful lot of derelict houses. Um, we, we had uh, three more, I think it was a month ago, on 30-day notice. Um, I think there's a total of five or six right now that I know of. And there's lots of empty lots and there's a lot of um, 
bad behavior bylaws indicated they're going to start targeting the area and city police when I was out um, on Friday they were talking about targeting the area this is really important this is really important to the vibrancy of this community so I would like um, I would ask for support on this I have um, I have a technical issue um, Alderman McLeod because the 2012 work plan needs to be approved by council I think the strongest language we can use here is to consider its inclusion in the 2012 work plan that would be fine with me right with I you. think my message is is I that we you. have to get this going in the same direction we cannot have this kind of thing happening again yeah I think that the message has been well heard we just have to be a little careful on the tech technique but I'm sure that when the 2012 work plan comes to us you will ensure that this is on there Oh, I'll at that time yes. all right do I have a seconder for this one please thanks Alderman Farrell any discussion on this one Alderman Farrell Thank you. I'm very much in support of this. I, I just, it, if we're going to embark in the study, and certainly the communities in my ward who uh, flank Centre Street are really eager to get started in this work, it's important that we know what route the LRT is going to. And so if, if that work isn't going to be done in time for this, then um, I imagine we'll have to delay this to 2013. Fair enough. Alderman Chabot? Uh, thank you, Worship. No, I'm just uh, kind of curious about this because uh, I know some of our 2011 stuff has been pushed into 2012. What's this going to do for the 2012 work plan? Your Worship, we're, we're just beginning to think about the 2012 work program, so I, it's difficult to answer. We, uh, we don't have much that's been pushed into 2011 in terms of uh, sorry 2012 in, in terms of start date but certainly some will will linger into 2012 but uh, I couldn't answer that at the moment mm -hmm. we yeah. would give a full report to council at the time we do the work program of course okay I won't debate it in thanks Alderman Chabot um, all right then on this motion arising are we agreed okay. any opposed That's it. Yeah. It'll come back to council as part of the 2012 work plan. I can help. Council can't direct council to do anything. Um, it would be so much easier if we could. Um, <laughs> the mayor can direct council to do anything. Um, but um, what this is suggesting is it's saying to administration when you bring back the draft work plan please consider this in inclusion of this and at that point council will make a decision of what's in and what's out let's do that again so on this one then are we agreed any opposed alderman chabot is opposed carried any more motions arising before alderman Lowe comes back okay all right, next item then, the return of our favorite topic from previous public hearings. It's like a greatest hits, kids. Um, E-2011-03, uh, amendment to the bonus area redevelopment plan and land use redesignation in Greenwood and Greenbrier. Now, there's been a little bit of confusion uh, about this one, but my best understanding of what is happening here is that because there was an error um, brought forth the first time we discussed this, um, on bylaw 25P2011, this one is actually new. So we do need to hold a public hearing on 25P2011. Um, and I imagine that if folks from the public have submissions to make on that, it's going to be difficult to only talk about 25P2011 in the absence of the others. So we'll be, uh, we'll be flexible on that. But please do try to restrict yourself as best we can, understanding that. Council uh, has already held a public hearing on uh, many of the issues that I think will come up today. So, given where we are, this is a strange one because it's a report, um, it's an executive report, but it does require a public hearing. So I will ask Mr. Cope if he's got anything more to say on this one, or we'll open the public hearing directly. Mr. Lockwood. Your Worship, there is just one um, small mapping error with the um, first bylaw, which was uh, 13D um, 2011, which came to you on the April the 
um, April the 11th public hearing. Bylaw 25P um, changes that, and it, it's a minor change in the actual number of units on sites cell three, from a maximum of 800 to, to a maximum of 873 units. And these were recommended for approval by Planning Commission. Otherwise, the, the, the actual bylaw is the exact same as the previous one, um, thir um, 12P 2011. Thank you very much, Mr. Lockwood. So that is the nature of the change that we're holding a public hearing on today, correct? Just that one number? Yes. Okay, great. So any questions of clarification for administration on this? Questions of clarification? All right, anyone wish to speak in favor of this change? Anyone wish to speak in favor? Your Worship and members of Council, Kathy Oberg with Brown and Associates Planning Group. I'm going to quickly try to um, present to the, the ARP amendment. We're in support of this ARP amendment before you today, and as requested by Council at the April public hearing, Melcor and its team of consultants met, met with administration and the Bones Community Association. These two evening sessions presented a great opportunity for dialogue and a chance to understand each group's perspectives on the amendments. Melcorn and its consultants strongly believe a complete community is being proposed within Greenbrier. The original policies in the 2008 um, ARP provided guidance for a blend of residential, commercial, and public open space. The ARP amendments before you today reinforce this original vision while also offering an additional level of completeness, employment uses. While the size of the local commercial has been questioned, it should be expressed that the proposed commercial high density area is reflective of a very vibrant and very successful redevelopment area within Calgary. Garrison Woods was redeveloped in the early 2000s and contained commercial, mixed use, medium density residential, public open spaces, and lower density resident residential. When comparing its high density residential and commercial area with Greenbrier, not only is the area of land close in size, but also the areas of commercial and multifamily residential are exceptionally similar. The building footprints within the commercial and mixed use area equates to 19,252 square meters, which is within 250 square meters of the Greenbrier amendments. The Garrison Woods grocery store is slightly larger in square footage than what is actually proposed in Greenbrier, and park space is also of a smaller footprint within Garrison Woods, and quite confidently we can express the success that Garrison Woods has had today. Um, additionally, Garrison Woods is not seen as a regional commercial area. It provides local commercial amenities to not only the neighborhood but also into Altidore. To reinforce the local nature of the amendments before you today, the Greenbrier parcels have been divided into small sizes and the typical big box retail use would never fit on any of the sizes or be allowed within the restricted uses as part of the amendments. Recognizing this is only the second phase of development for the Greenbrier area, it should be mentioned that other landowners within Greenbrier, within the Greenbrier area, have equal opportunity within their lands. Transportation thresholds um, were given in 2008 by the city for each parcel, and each parcel has the potential to provide whatever land use mix they propose that meets their thresholds. Those applications, too, would be required to revise the, revise the ARP once their studies are completed and accepted by administration should they wish to develop outside of residential use. Capacity is constrained by the physical layout of the interchange site, including steep topography, get you with the other one. steep topography and the adjacent business community. Melcor has worked within the capacity allocation of the Bones ARP, and approving this will not compromise any other landowner's ability to do the same. I'd like to summarize with the following. Firstly, complete communities. The proposed amendments to this ARP we feel make great strides to comply with the MDP regarding complete, complete communities, which include residential, commercial, and employment, while achieving a compact urban built form. We believe that it's Council's vision to ensure that amendments to existing ARPs such as this adhere to the MDP policies regarding one of the key elements, which is designing and building complete communities. Secondly, the transportation thresholds. When the city completed the functional plan for this interchange, Melcor was given a transportation threshold, which we believe we've met and not exceeded. This has been demonstrated by the approval of our TIA by the city, uh, city Transportation Department. And finally, the timing of the interchange. Under the TIPS program, this interchange is, is slated to commence in 2012. With this in mind, we started, our, we started this process back in 2009 with the anticipation that we'd have you know, the public hearing um, late 2010, early 2011, so that we can ensure that, that there's a compatible timing between the constructions of the interchange and of what needs to be done at Beaufort. 
So in closing, I'd like to ask your worship and members of council to embrace and support the amendments of this ARP, which we truly believe speaks to the vision and direction that the city count that city council is heading and um, that creates a complete community. I'd also like the opportunity to invite Dennis uh, Ingalls from Melcor and Cristalini to answer questions in order to do it efficiently. Thanks, Ms. Oberg. I see a number I see a number of lights and I know I have a couple of questions as well, but we'll start with Alderman Carra. Thanks, Ms. Oberg. Um, you put up Garrison Woods. Can uh, you guys have a, a copy of the sort of the massing study that you've been working off for the area? For which, for ourselves? For Greenbrier, yeah. For Greenbrier? Um, I do. Of the one that illustrated what the bylaw would require? Is that yeah. the one that you're yeah. in reference to? I don't know if I have it here. I have the big one. Oh, I do. Yeah. Sorry, Dennis. Right, so obviously that's not Garrison Woods. That's like suburban that. Calgary, right. the opposite of the complete community that we're trying to build. And I understand that you guys are working within the system that we provide for you. And so yeah. you want to talk about the divergence between the, the, the flowery vision we're talking about and what's up before us? Yeah. And this actually was done as an exercise in order to work with administration to sort through sizes of, of um, the commercial, the grocer, the office, um, recognizing that we do have the motion um, that came forward with, at CPC to look at a, you know, a, a design at the first development permit stage. This essentially illustrates, um, which was important with our TIA and with administration, to show how much parking actually is required for that amount of, of commercial. And so with that, we used um, these numbers and then discussed it with administration to build the numbers into the ARP amendments as to you know, if there was underground parking, what is the maximum that we could work with the transportation and work with the, the, the sizing, um, the sizes of the, of the parcels. So this was kind of an, a very good example as to what the bylaw does require, recognizing that it's not Garrison Woods, but we have another detailed stage coming that we, we hope to massage all the components. In addition to the, the policies that we have um, for the site, this site itself um, also has to front on to the Trans-Canada Highway, so there are some policy um, policy work that we'll need to do once we lay out the sites. Yeah, I need to get into that, right? Because so one of the things that you guys talked about when we sat in my office and sort of went over the plan was um, how you're massing up against Beaufort Road, which is adjacent to the Trans-Canada Highway, and of course everything is going to be accessed from the parking lots as opposed to creating a human-scale walkable environment. And I said, well, why don't you actually front everything along the internal street. What's the internal street there? Uh, Greenbrier Drive, Northwest. And you told me that planning actually requested that it be up against Beaufort Road. Well, there are policies actually in the amendments as well that, that have us look at that. There's entry guidelines um, that we need to follow as well. So I believe this site is, is challenged with that and I think we can probably work with administration and with, with CPC when we come back with a, a more master plan of that that c can you know be a better you know, a, a better design than what you see right there, which was, again, more of a, a bylaw exercise for numbers and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, so let me, I'm not entirely sure I understood you correctly there. You said that this is a bylaw, this, this was an exercise in just massing and parking to figure out what goes in the bylaw. This obviously could have been designed differently with the same amount of massing and the same amount of parking, so it actually was a human scale environment. Um, but you didn't do that. And part of the restrictions, I don't understand completely, are that you have to put the buildings up against Beaufort Road? Up against, facing, yeah, as close to the Trans Canada Highway. We actually have, as part of our direct, direct control guidelines, for example, the office site, um, there's a, we have to have a maximum of three meters setback from Beaufort Road. And is that what's before us today? No, what's before you today are the ARP amendments. The ARP amendments. Yep. So that's, that ship has already sailed, and you guys are going to be working around that constraint. Yes. Well, that, that item still has to be heard. It didn't go, it, it's been, when the item was referred back, okay. that item, the public hearing had closed on it, but there hasn't been a decision made on that. Okay, so that ship hasn't sailed. Okay, because that's, that's an important okay. ship. 
beat the analogy or the metaphor to death. Thank you. As long as you don't start talking about pirates, Alderman Carra. Alderman Collier card. Thank you. Thanks for being here again. I just have some questions of clarification. Um, uh, how long have you uh, been at this process, and uh, what are some of the thresholds that you thought that you think you've met to this point in time? And do we have any others that need, need to be met in your view? Your Worship, Alderman uh, Collier Cart. <clears throat> there are three thresholds that I still think are contained by Melcor was. Um, the first thing was we, we come along in, in 2009 um, having regard for the MDP and looked at density, uh, looked at a complete community, what we think is a complete community or the, or the right step in going in a complete community. Um, and in our, our minds, we've met that. Second thing was the transportation threshold. Um, if you think of the Beaufort Interchange as a piece of pie, we've kept within the piece of pie that the Transportation Department allocated to us. Uh, and finally was the timing. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started this process in 2009, we envisioned, uh, as we normally do, a three-year business model to, uh, to bring something to market. So in 2009, we started the land use so that in 2012, as Kathy alluded to, we could start construction and time it such that the interchange in our site would be constructed at the same time. Okay. Uh, now, it's my understanding that the ARP already supports a certain density. Uh, Your Worship, yes. Um, the current plan uh, identifies for some 6,000 households within the current ARP. With, uh, with the change that we see here, we're, uh, we're only increasing by 300 households. So in your view... 6,000 people, sorry. 6,000, yeah. So in your view, like there seems to be a difference of understanding with those that came forward last time uh, that uh, this seems sort of like a surprise, that this is sort of already there. Do you find that people are just, uh, that live there are are sort of recognizing the reality of the situation, learning more about it as they go along? Or what, what is your view of the community's understanding of, of what can be done here? Your Worship, um, through the Alderman Urquhart, we, um, through the two sessions that we sat with the community, uh, the one thing that I think resonated um, out of the first session uh, when it was kind of a fact-finding mission with them was the fact that the current ARP allowed um, this number of people in the community. Um, I think that a lot of it was to deal with our application. They, um, the understanding was that we were only allowed 250 units. And the actual number is we, in our first phase, we were approved for 500. Uh, the 250 cap came in place when the interchange was to stay as it is. That's the cap that we have. So in, in our first phase, we were approved for roughly 493, 500 units. Um, which I think was um, a shock to the community association. So uh, I, I just want to, I'm just curious uh, as far as who the community is and the number of people that are represented. So in the open houses, how many people have attended those? We've seen numbers of 35 to 40, 40 okay. at the open houses. And would that have included folks from the, uh, the mobile park? Uh, for the most part, the 50% uh, the lied from the, uh, the actual mobile home park to the north. Um, they were concerned with uh, how long it was going to be before the mobile home park redeveloped. That was probably the most underlying current we had at, uh, at the open house. Uh, and to that end, we couldn't answer that as uh, we're not the landowner. So do you, do you, I don't know if the community will be here today, but do you get the sense that they're worried that there will be um, uh, there, there will be an influx of activity uh, of people starting to come into this community and they, they sort of want to maintain the status quo or is that is that not an issue? Uh, Your Worship, I think the, um, the status quo, no, I, I believe they're, they're, uh, they will share with you that uh, there is, in their mind, um, an influx of people going to be coming into this community as a result of what we're proposing. And in fact, we've argued the opposite. We think the people of Bonas um, will utilize the majority of our commercial land that uh, we're proposing today. Um, the other question I had is, uh, you know, we're trying to bring, we're trying to find opportunities to, to enact the vision that we have for Calgary uh, through Planet Calgary, and I wondered if we could just hear once again about how the integration between, uh, you know, the, the commercial component of this and the multifamily mixed use and and your vision of how that will actually unfold. 
Sure. The, uh, when Melcor looked at this back in 2009, well, pre pre previous to 2009, early 2008, um, when we were looking at land use, we, um, we envisioned this area with, uh, with an office component to start with. Um, we think without the, uh, the office component, you're struggling with complete communities in, in Melcor's mind. Uh, we then looked at it and said, what, what is it that also makes a complete community in our mind? Higher density housing. Um, the original plan for these lands were single family homes. Uh, we know that, and when we bought it in 2000, that's what it had. So here we've come some 11 years later and looked at it and said, complete communities in our mind is commercial, employment, and higher density residential. So we, we've exhausted in terms of, you know, how much we can put on here based on thresholds that were set by administration. So there certainly are natural constraints to this area. I'm wondering if you've had any conversations about uh, with the school system there and the current capacity uh, that, uh, that the school boards may have in that area and if it could handle the, the capacity. Uh, Your Worship, we've, uh, we went to the uh, public school board and uh, just to envision uh, the school settings. What we found out from them is the three schools that were within the Bonas community, um, two of which run at around 45 to 55 percent. And uh, we feel that an increase in density like this to bring younger children, with two of them being elementary, would only be a positive thing for, uh, for the community to keep the schools open. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, uh, ma maybe Mayor Nancy would comment on this letter that you sent to your worship to the minister regarding the interchange at the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, if we delay this anymore, is there any relationship between them losing interest in putting in this important piece of infrastructure? I know I chatted with Alderman Hodges at noon, but uh, maybe you'd comment on that later then. I don't know, uh, Your Worship. Yeah, it's not really part of this application because I think the letter you're referring to, well, I know the letter you're referring to, refers to an interchange to the west of this area, which I believe is also the applicant's lens, if I'm not mistaken. But it's a whole different, it's a whole different ball of wax. Right, and I'm one of the things that the community association had suggested was we need to look at all of this. The whole corridor. Together. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that uh, once we're done with the public hearing is certainly something council may wish to grapple that's with. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Alderman Collier Cart. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. So the density cap that you have for your site, how was that achieved? What, what created the density cap? Because we have a density floor, but no cap. Uh, Your Worship, when you say the cap under the ARP, are you referring to the residential or are you referring to traffic? I'm talking about density. Okay, so through the chair, we'll, um, in terms of density, where we receive the cap is based on thresholds at that interchange so and allocating it towards each individual cell within that ARP. So transportation created the need for a cap? Your Worship, correct. So, Your Worship, I remember specifically asking administration during the planet discussion and the, when we discussed the sustainability principles, 11, 11 sustainability principles, that we would no longer be determining density based on transportation, that that was an outdated um, methodology. And one needed a certain amount of density to, to uh, allow for primary transit network. So I, I think we're kind of stuck in this Mobius loop here. I think that would be an excellent question to raise for administration with the transportation folks when we get to that point. Right. I, I do think there may be an answer for that question on this particular piece of land given the complexity of the Trans-Canada Highway nearby, but I'd be interested in hearing that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have uh, two, actually. One of them is, if we could look at that massing page again, please. I just want, I'm a little confused about this and we've been trying to work our way through the, the bylaw up here as we've been talking about it, but there's no access to any of that from Beaufort Road, is, a, is there? The access is all from the internal road, right? Your Worship, you're correct. Okay. Because the way that I, I'll ask this to administration too, but the way that I'm reading this, uh, the setback and the orientation to the road on 16 of 33 here, 
it sounds like the setback is actually to the in the maximum setback is to the interior road not to Beaufort Road so it's just it's a little confusing and I don't expect you to answer it unless you can but I will have that question for administration as well now my I think I asked oh sorry Ms. Ober did you want to address that it was our sorry um, your worship um, it was my understanding it was to Beaufort Road and that would be a good question for administration that okay. that's where I was given the impression because of we needed to make sure that Parking, loading, storage, and, and whatnot wasn't facing the Trans Canada highway. highway as part of the entryway guidelines. I hear you. I, you know, I, I absolutely understand the logic behind that, but when I read the actual bylaw, it sounds like it's saying exactly the opposite that there should be a maximum setback to the interior road to make more of a walkable neighborhood and no parking in between the interior road and the building. So we just need some clarification before we pass the bylaws all. Um, so my other question for you, and I, I feel like I asked this last time, but I don't recall the answer, so I'll ask you and I'm going to ask it to the transportation folks as well. But the transportation study that was done on this was presupposing a certain set of assumptions on what was gonna happen across the road, I think, um, across the highway. And do you know if the study that has been done incorporates the changes that are being proposed over at Winsport or is this the old set of Winsport that, that went in here? And if that's not a fair question for you, don't answer it and I'll ask the transportation. Uh, through your worship, the, the study is basically building on the prior transportation pl planning study for the highway as a whole, and it does presuppose the, uh, the existing ASP at Canada Olympic Park. And so by working within, as, as uh, Mr. Ingalls mentioned, within Melcor's piece of the pie, they haven't affected anyone else's piece of the pie. And we gotcha. do understand that other landowners will be sort of changing the nature of their pieces as well, but uh, that they're able to do so still. That's extraordinarily helpful, actually. So you took what, what you thought was the allocation to you under the old study, and you made your life work within that allocation. That is correct, yes. Okay, that's actually very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else, while well, well, they're tidying up, anyone else wish to speak in favor of this application? Anyone else wish to speak in favor? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Nikki Smythe. I'm a member of the Bonas Community Association and, of course, a resident of Bonas. We apologize for not having uh, physical copies of, of uh, what we want to say to you as we weren't able to access the report to Council until late Friday afternoon and we've been trying to gather as much voice from the community as we can. Our first concern is that approval of 25P 2011 will create an ARP for Bonest that contains inconsistencies within Section 7A, which is the Greenbrier Special Study Area, um, in addition, it is completely inconsistent with Section 8, which is the commercial section of the ARP that hasn't even been addressed in these amendments. We feel that this should be reviewed and made consistent with Council's decisions. Um, in terms of general comments regarding the, um, the report, um, The BCA welcomed the opportunity opened up by the April 11th Council meeting to bring the City Planning Department, the developer, and the Community Association to a dialogue. Um, as, as a result, I think we had a, 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 um, a sense that we had met, that there was a missed opportunity for conversation between the developer and the community, the developers and the community that that um, had been somewhat blocked by the process. Writ written comments and requests for clarification were submitted to the planning department on April 26, 2011, and other than an email acknowledging receipt of our input, no responses were provided by the administration to the BCA. The content of the report presented to Council today was posted at the end of the day last Friday and direct communication was, was and no direct communication was provided about the nature of today's discussion. Um, we would like to recommend a change in process. 
None of the issues raised by the BCA regarding the absence of an overarching municipal area plan or map for the west entrance to the city have been addressed. The area includes Greenbrier, Parkside, Windsport, Crestmont, and Valley Ridge, for some of which the BCA has seen development proposals already circulated. Regarding the rationale for the commercial land uses, specifically administration states in this report that, quote, the bonus ARP does not preclude local retail uses being developed on other sites within Greenbrier, end quote. While it is true that the current bonus ARP does not preclude local retail uses being developed in other sites within Greenbrier, the wording in the new proposed bonus ARP explicitly allocates a total of 19,500 square meters of retail space to the developer of cell 3, Melcor, and limits the entire Greenbrier study area, which also includes um, cell, cell 3. Uh, oh, sorry. And limits the entire Greenbrier study area to exactly the same 19,500 square meters of retail space. We refer you to 25P 2011 Commercial Core Items 15 through 33. And the critical for, um, item is, is number 33, in which it uh, caps um, that retail development at 19,500 square meters for the entire Greenbrier area study. Um, Administration also states, quote, the land use amendment application also proposes office uses in line with the MDP policy to promote a positive jobs and housing balance. It appears to us that the municipal development plan is being incorrectly used and interpreted to justify current actions. The total proposed office space of 39,500 square meters in conjunction with the retail core space of 19,500 square meters concentrated in the same cell are substantial and will create regional traffic that is in direct contradiction to item 12 in the commercial section of the current ARP and to item 11 in the proposed ARP, which specifically state, quote, commercial uses shall be community oriented. Commercial uses that are oriented to a regional population shall not be allowed. We, um, this policy was introduced because of the restriction of a single point of access to the Greenbrier area, restriction that will not be removed by a future Beaufort Road interchange. This area is landlocked now and will remain equally landlocked in the future. Um, there are other members of the community who would like to come up and speak. We'll keep it as briefly as we can. Would you like to hear all of them and then ask questions? Or Let's do that if that's all right, Ms. Smythe. Your Worship, members of council. My name is Marilyn Mora, also of the Bonus Community Association. Sorry we're doing this again. Well, I really should tell you to restrict yourself to uh, bylaw 25, but go. <laughs> we'll, never, we'll never ask for that again. Regarding pathways and open space, the Bonus Community Association invoked the Municipal Development Plan in requesting that the Planning Department integrates pedestrian systems and outlines transit service within walking distances of 400 meters for the Greenbrier area. The administration did not respond to this concern. The BCA invoked the Municipal Development Plan Section 7A of the ARP <clears throat> to state the importance of green and open spaces and expressed concern about the complete elimination of linear open spaces for the proposed Greenbrier development in favor of large commercial and office space surrounded by continuous parking lots. The administration did not respond to this concern. The concentration of all retail space into one area, as proposed for Greenbrier, makes the development car-centric, pedestrian unfriendly, and leaves no space to implement, implement linear open spaces. The BCA requested that the planning department provide a rationale for accepting the conversion of a percentage of municipal reserve into cash in lieu within Greenbrier when the basic spirit of the Municipal Development Plan and the ARP are not being met in the first place in the proposed development. The administ administration responds, the required 10% municipal reserve 
for the residential area has been provided and will include three park sites totaling approximately 1.1 hectares in size. The 10% required municipal reserve for the commercial area is being provided as cash in lieu as per the protocol established by the Joint Use Coordinating Committee. The Greenbrier study area is currently defined as predominantly residential. The administration has reduced the residential footprint in cell three to one quarter of the total area and expanded the retail commercial office footprint as a large core in the remaining three quarters of the cell. The administration has then redefined municipal reserve as 10% of the much reduced residential area as opposed to the con conventional definition of 10% of the entire developable area. And the administration then declares the municipal reserve requirement met. The conversion of municipal reserve to cash in lieu has been applied previously to commercial and industrial areas that are not connected to residential areas. It seems ludicrous to apply the same concept to an area like Greenbrier, depriving it of municipal reserve while at the same time attaching to it the objectives listed below, quoted from the existing and proposed ARPs. Prime objective, create a complete community, a walkable community known for its distinct sense of place, housing choice, and mixed uses intended to meet the basic day-to-day -day needs of the community. Create an interconnected open space system of parks, environmentally significant areas, pathways, and linear open spaces. In conclusion, the BCA does not support the conversion of MR lands into cash in lieu and requests that Council recommend the application of the standard definition of municipal reserve as 10% of total developable area and that in the case of Greenbrier, no municipal reserve is converted to cash in lieu. Thank Regarding you. transportation, um, it's fine, I can... You, you paused, I was about to say thank you, keep going. <laughs> transportation. Regarding transportation concerns expressed by the BCA that include the absence of a regional plan, access to the area restricted to a single point, the ability of emergency services to access the area, and inadequacy of the model used in the TIA that totally ignored traffic through the core of Boness. The BCA's comment that the Greenbrier Development Project and other projects in the area are being represented to the community in an ad hoc fashion and in the absence of a municipal area plan as mandated by the MDP is diminished in the report to council as a request from the Bonus Community Association to conduct just a regional transportation analysis, which the administration then responds to by saying, only a maximum of 250 residential units and no other commercial development is permitted on the subject site until after construction of the Trans-Canada Highway Beaufort Road interchange planned for 1213. The response completely misses the point made by the BCA regarding the need for a municipal area plan. It paints the Trans-Canada Highway Beaufort interchange as the solution to all transportation issues in the area based on an analysis done in isolation from other major upcoming projects and based on a traffic engineering model that ignored the impact on the internal core of Bowness. Regarding comments made by the BCA about access to the area by emergency services, the administration's report states the land use application was reviewed by the corporate planning applications group, including representatives from fire, police, and EMS who did not identify any concerns with the transportation network. Some of the representatives that the administration's response claims were included in the review of the land use application were actually declared by the administration as no reply in the summary of circulated replies, notably EMS, police, community and social development. So rather than um, the fact that they had no concerns, it should have said no reply. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else? No. No, just the two of you? All right. Um, questions for these folks? Uh, Alderman Carra. Thank you for your presentation, for coming out today. You guys submitted a piece of paper that came to my office last week, I, and it sort of had a request for a different proposal, uh, a different process. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could expand on sort of the different the current process and, and its issues and the proposed process that you guys are recommending. Um, it was actually, 
Joe is the one who pulled, all the, pulled that together and he had to go back to work this afternoon. Um, and I'm afraid I don't have a copy of it in front of me. Okay, I don't have a copy of it in front of me either. Oh, I do have a copy of it in front of me Not now. Mine. I have Diane Collier cards. <laughs> um, okay, I just, I guess I wanted to ask you some questions about that, but it's, it seems to be a very similar process that the Bonas community is recommending to the one that we're potentially exploring along Mission Road. It involves a more collaborative and less of a conflict-based approach. Um, Joe drew that up after, after discussions that, that we had had as a committee group and also coming out of the meetings that we had had. One of the things that we identified from those two meetings that we had with planning and developers was that there was a strong sense for me anyway that, um, that the community and the developers were prevented from coming together in a vision for the area. Um, by by the particular process, so it ended up being confrontational rather than collaborative, and that that ended in this discussion. That discussion ended in this recommendation. Well, I'm not sure we're going to be able to solve that right now, <laughs> but I really appreciate that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for the community? Thank you very much for taking the time to be here today. It's important that. We hear your voice as we grapple with this stuff. So thank you for coming again um, to spend some time with us. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? Very well then, uh, questions for administration, Alderman Lowe? He moved up. We can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to say, I forgot to turn my mic on, that uh, I was prepared to move the recommendations of administration uh, when appropriate. I know Alderman Hodges has some uh, uh, amendments. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do have, so it's on, the, it's on the floor now, I do have a couple of questions for administration that I'd like to ask before we get to the amendments. Um, and I think Alderman Corral would like to as well. So Alderman Hodges, if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. We'll get through those, um, and then we'll go from there. Why don't you start, Alderman Corral? Um, I guess my first question is, can we get into the sort of front setback area and sort of come to terms with what the intent of this is? Because um, I'm not sure we're clear on that. Sure. I'm just going to look for a... The only place I can find it is page 16 of 33 um, in the report, but it might be somewhere else too. What the intent is from, from planning, which isn't um, so much captured here, is that we basically have three sites, each about five acres in, in, in size. Uh, the one the one in kind of the northeast corner um, is going to have a kind of a um, community scale um, grocery store. The goal is to have that building fronting on towards the internal road. And again, across the street, the other standalone sites for the retail is to have all those buildings pulled up towards the internal street. Um, the goal is not to have um, parking being, being placed along there, uh, it's to have it to be of a, of, of a scale of retail which, which is catered to the folks in, in the area and that you're able to walk to it. The third site is the office component and the concern there is that we want to ensure that we have, you know, this is a very kind of um, key access point into Calgary so that, it, so that office buildings, they are, um, when you're driving into the city or leaving that you're seeing buildings and not um, surface parking. So what we're talking about isn't fully captured on here, but at this level of, of planning, we aren't able to kind of delve into that actual um, site planning. But those are the um, goals, and that is actually spoken to in, in the, the bylaws, which is why for those sites, um, the one with, with the grocery and the one with the retail, is that we've placed in there a, a maximum setback from the street of three meters, so we don't have kind of large, vast areas set back from the street. and, and, and uh, take away those chances for more of a pedestrian um, feel to the area. 
Okay, so if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, is that in the absence of any sort of tangible plan and hopefully speaking to some plan that might emerge at some point, uh, we're looking at on the west side, or so the east side of the site, the first two parcels being adjacent to Greenbrier Drive, and then the office component being backed onto Beaufort Road with a sea of parking in front of it, and that's sort of the spoken to but not illustrated intent of the planning process? I think that right now on that office site, we don't fully know um, how many buildings we're going to actually have on there. The goal is, is, is to, would be to carry through what we're seeing on the two sites for the retail and having those buildings also fronting onto that street because we are going to be having not on that site a mixture of office above grade, retail at grade, and or also the, um, um, options for residential. The other key thing, though, is ensuring that we, that we don't have a, what we're trying to avoid is a, a sea of parking when, when you're driving into Calgary or, or leaving Calgary and seeing that as your main first impression along that Trans-Canada corridor. Okay, so we're trying to have it both ways. We are, and then at this stage in the planning process, without getting into an actual d detailed um, DP, we can't really guess in, until we start looking at that overall concept plan for the area. Okay, so we want to achieve an intent that we can't get into until we... Okay. Yeah, this is... Okay. Um, can I ask you about the employee area? Just, I mean, I can start pulling out lots of things here that I've got quick, but the employee area, which is point twenty-five, uh, seventeen 17 of 33, says every building must have an outdoor area for the use of employees. It's located in the setback area between the front facade of a building and the street. There's a minimum of 20 square meters. What what is that? Are we basically saying that we want patios or something like that? What? It, whether it's an outdoor sitting area, whether it's an urban plaza, whether it's a patio, whether it's benches, giving opportunity for people to actually spend time outside on there and have that interaction between the building and the actual street front and and the the the, the overall sidewalks. Okay, um, and then I guess my other question is the transportation planning for this sort of seems to be incredibly automobile focused, right? I mean, and it's, you know, we've got two options. We either create a transit oriented development or we create sort of a pedestrian petting zoo and by where, where people come out of their cars and are pedestrians in the space, but the only way to access it or not is by car. Is there any long-term planning for servicing this in any meaningful way by any other mode than the car? And is that spoken to in any way through this? I'll defer that question in terms of future BRT and whatnot to my colleague from Transportation. Uh, Your Worship, uh, in administration's review of this application, um, we were definitely cognizant of uh, the needs to balance the uh, mobility for all users. Um, there definitely will remain a need for people to use their automobile for a portion of their trips. Uh, by the mixed use nature of the site, you're definitely gonna capture a much higher uh, internal trip capture, which can be used by walking and cycling. Petting zoo. We can also, um, you know, we, we've looked very significantly about how to connect this site uh, down into uh, the remainder of the Bonas Community Association through, uh, through pathways and, and uh, connectivity of sidewalks. Uh, you do have natural barriers such as the escarpment to, to work around, uh, but as part of that uh, plan for alternate modes, we definitely have connections down the escarpment uh, along the west side of the Greenbrier study area, as well as down 83rd Street. As for transit, uh, the, the, the vision at this time that you know is still fluid as this area builds out is primary transit running along Bonas Road uh, with a uh, connectivity by uh, other transit routes uh, that would connect down to that primary transit route on Bonas Road. Um, you know, that is the, the whole network of uh, community transit routes uh, is, is going to be reviewed by Calgary Transit as, as this area of the city uh, builds out and redevelops. Okay. Oh. I won't take any more of Council's time. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Kara. And in fact, you know that your your first question was actually the question I was going to ask. And I have to say I'm a little bit um, confused because I heard what you said, 
about the setbacks and it actually makes sense to me but it doesn't seem to be that that's what's in the proposed bylaw and so I'm just a little confused about where that interpretation comes from because the only part and I just might have missed it there's a lot of pages here but the only part I see about front setback area is sections 22 23 of the bylaw and 16 of 33 um, and they don't make a distinction between the, the public street and Beaufort Road and all of that. So while I heard it, I'm just wondering if the bylaw actually reflects what you're saying or if I'm just reading it incorrectly. Your Worship, we do have some um, guidance on this and direction from bylaw 25P 2011 on page 10 of 15, item, um, item, item I, speaks to the goals for, for, for um, commercial and that the um, it speaks to a few points that we you know that we wish to have that these buildings oriented towards the face of the street um, that we're looking for a mixture of um, facades materials um, that we want to have any sort of things for for um, um, access for for cars and on-site parking from the rear lanes so so we're using that in conjunction uh, with with that setback uh, they pointed out to in bylaw 13d 2011 um, section number 24 matter of managed to put these things together okay I appreciate that thank you uh, Aldrin Putmans um, thank you your worship um, I'm interested in the overpass particularly as it relates to the capacity it has to support development on both sides of the Trans-Canada North and South. Um, maybe I could just ask a couple of general questions. How, how is the, the capacity determined for design purposes? Do you take an assessment of density proposals on both sides or what sort of, what sort of what guidance do you take in terms of deciding the capacity or determining the capacity for the overpass? Uh, Your Worship, uh, through, through the process of, of looking at the Beaufort Trans Canada interchange, there's been uh, a functional planning study uh, that's been undertaken uh, that has looked at the, the traffic volumes projected that would be, need to be accommodated by that interchange. Uh, the the uh, traffic volumes at the time were based on the council approved uh, land uses for the area. Uh, which would be, which would include the current uh, Canada Olympic Park area structure plan on the south side, uh, as well as the uh, Bonus ARP on the north, and uh, further development to the west. Uh, as as design for that interchange has progressed into uh, some more of the preliminary design, uh, the uh, traffic volumes have been updated based on the uh, previous amendment to the Greenbrier Special Study Area a couple years ago. And, and those volumes incorporated into that design. Uh, ba it's based on um, you know, acceptable, acceptable performance of the, of the, the intersections um, along uh, Beaufort Road, as well as the, the signals that would be in place on the interchange to in, ensure that the delays and queuing uh, were not uh, posing any safety or operational concerns. Thank you. How old is, when you say the current ASP for Windsport or <coughs> Canada Olympic Park, how old, do you know offhand what the, so, so within recent few oh, years? Yeah, four years. How are the, um, how to put it, the capacities assigned? Um, is, it a, is it done based on north-south or what, how do you, how do you, I suppose there's east-west tra east, west traffic using it as well. How do you determine which, um, side of the Trans-Canada gets allocated a certain amount of, of capacity on the, on the overpass? Uh, Your Worship, I, I guess maybe just to, to clarify in response to that question, uh, the, the assignment of density uh, in this area was not um, solely the assignment of density based on transportation limitations. Um, you know, through, through the uh, MDP, through the uh, through the previous ASP and ARPs, um, you know, the, the use of sound planning uh, principles and assignment of uh, population is also critical in that and, and integration with the adjacent communities. So uh, it's not necessarily um, X number of trips uh, get applied to, to certain areas. Is, I'm concerned about the future growth capacity of Canada Olympic Park and, and wind sports um, potential uh, to consider some proposals that are 
coming in. And I, I'm wondering at what point does, does there, is there an entitlement or a capacity assigned to one development over another? I'm just curious about the process. How do you determine if, if this proposal, does it take more than its share of capacity from this overpass, perhaps jeopardizing opportunities on the south side of the highway? Your Worship. On a point of order. Uh, I don't think I've risen on a point of order for a couple of years. Thank you. Well, here it goes. Here it goes. I think I know what I did, actually. I know what you did, too. And Ms. And I was just wondering if I should cut you off. On it because I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I know what uh, fettering of discretion means. Sorry, what if you're, you're, you're fettering your discretion, Alderman Putmans, to bring onto the floor now a land use application issue that has yet to be heard. So we haven't heard COP. Uh, we will probably later this year, or summertime or sometime. sometime but to bring summer. the issues forward now, you get into the problem of fettering your discretion. I was hoping we would have this debate through the chair. Oh, no, boy. Uh, perhaps to the chair. There must, be pre there must be precedent for this. I can't imagine this hasn't happened many times before when there's a significant piece of infrastructure. What I'm concerned about is the equity of the situation for all parties concerned. And how can we make a decision about a significant development like this without having the opportunity to understand the whole picture? I actually do agree with you, Alderman Potemans, but I think the area that we have to be very careful in is not presupposing a land use application that has not yet been heard by the Planning Commission. However, asking general questions to transportation about what happens if... Hypotheticals. Thank you, Your Worship. What happens if, you know, because the question that I think you're getting at, which is a question I want the answer to, is I have heard around that the design for the 16th Avenue Beaufort COP interchange is one that will handle the traffic volumes today, but is not really designed for much greater volumes. And I think that that is, in fact, a pertinent question uh, for this discussion we're having today. Thank you for... Um bringing this to my attention, Alderman Hodges. Thank you, Your Worship, for your guidance. And now that I've asked the question. Well, hypothetically, <laughs> rather than just waste time, an answer to that question, um, it, how, hypothetically, will this impair future development opportunities in the vicinity? Uh, Your Worship, I guess to be, to be clear, the, the design of the interchange at Beaufort Trans Canada uh, is, is constrained for a number of reasons. Uh, one is the, the geometry, one is the, uh, the impact on the adjacent um, the adjacent lands being the, the, the commercial along Bow Ridge uh, at Beaufort. Um, as part of the transportation planning study that was done, the, the traffic volumes assumed for Greenbrier um, are at the same range as, as is being proposed today by Greenbrier Stage 2. So there is no, no significant change in what was studied uh, at the time for allocation of volumes to, for what you're seeing for Greenbrier. If a different landowner in the area were to uh, request uh, a land use that had a significantly higher intensity use uh, than what was currently assumed, um, then there, there potentially could be capacity issues with that interchange. Uh, I would suggest, Your Worship, that it, the, the design is, is intended to serve um, the land uses that are envisioned in the area as currently approved by Council. If there were a significant change in those land uses to be considered, we may have to go back and revisit uh, what that interchange is intended to be. So, Mr. Vanderputten, if there are folks in the neighborhood who have been saying that that particular interchange will fail when it's open, even given what we're talking about right now, is that an overstatement of the case, would you say? Your Worship, yeah, that, that would not be fair to say. Thank you. Sorry, Alderman Putman. No, thank you, Worship. That's the, 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 the next logical question, and I'm done. Thank you very much, Mr. Van der Putten. Alderman Hodges. Just, just a quick one, I think. The term failure is something that a lot of cities are no longer using because it sounds fatal. What is failure, and what are other cities doing in order to... Uh, get beyond the concept of transportation failure or intersection failure? 
Uh, Your Worship, I, I think there's a, a lot of avenues to go down here. I, I think there, you know, sa public safety is still fairly paramount here. Um, we need to ensure that the operation of our roadways is safe uh, and does not jeopardize the life of any of the users of that roadway, whether they be uh, in an automobile, in a commercial vehicle, large truck, uh, or walking or cycling or riding transit. So um, there still needs to be a consideration for how the actual traffic operation uh, is. Um, if you know the, the the line in the sand that constitutes failure, uh, I, I would agree. In in the transportation engineering industry, has has uh, become a lot grayer over the past many years. Um, even the way that the, the City of Calgary is looking at evaluating uh, the operation of our system is more on a quality of service level than, than a quantity or level of service. Uh, and, and we're currently un undertaking you know, an effort to, to review the whole guidelines on how we uh, assess the operation, the, the mobility assessment is, and plan guidelines that you've probably heard that terminology over the past year or so, is an intent to, to really assess our transportation network uh, based on a number of factors, not just performance of the automobile. So, you know, while we need to balance kind of the all, all modes across this network, uh, we, we still need to ensure that public safety does exist for the users. And where that was coming from, I guess, specific to the Beaufort TransCan interchange, that if the operation of the, the signals at the top of the ramp uh, are such that don't have enough physical capacity to let all the demand through, there is that potential for the ramps to back up onto the mainline Trans-Canada Highway. And when that becomes a, a free flow corridor, that poses a fairly significant safety concern to the city. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Any other questions for administration? Alderman Hodges, I think you uh, have some amendments for us, though I noticed there's quite the scrum going on over there about well, some I, language. I've noticed that too, but there's no microphone there, and, uh, so I'm curious. <laughs> I, I can tell you, Alderman Hodges, and it has to do with um, a little bit of language in the bylaw that may be internally contradictory. Uh, so we may need to take the next item before we finish this one so that they can fix any, um, any problems. But first, uh, let's do your amendments. <laughs> You're sure not. Okay. Are, the, are these amendments to the bylaw, Alderman Hodges, or to the recommendations? Yes, it's They're amendment. amendments to bylaw 25P 2011. Oh, they're bylaw amendments. So we'll have yes. to do them at second reading then. Yes, that is correct. But I wanted to introduce them, but you're correct. It does come in at second reading. Okay. Give me a moment, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Hodges, could I, since you've got the floor, could I ask you to uh, table this item until after consideration of the next item on our agenda and they'll be able to fix the issues here? I'll move that as long as the issues are rendered in writing and we can be able to examine will do. what the scrum has resulted in. So will do. I, will, I will move tabling till later in today's agenda. Thanks, uh, Alderman Farrell, you're seconding that. So we'll, uh, we'll table it to, uh, I imagine item 9.1 will take us a few minutes. So we'll table to after item 9.1 then if that's all right. Uh, on that one, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. No problem. Alderman 9.1. Oh, what did I just say? Alderman 9.1. It's a brand new alderman. That's that's like the, the new version of Alderman Carr. <laughs> He's been upgraded over the weekend. It's not just the haircut. <laughs> Item 9.1. Your Worship, two amendment options were presented to the Calgary Planning Commission and for clarity, the Calgary Planning Commission selected the amendment option contained in Appendix 6 of attachment to the report to the Calgary Planning Commissions. The amendments clarify the intent of the current special function tent rules and respond to 311 complaint findings. As background, there are two types of special function tents, recreational and commercial. Recreational tents are permitted uses in most districts and must occur in conjunction with a, 
an approved use for assembly, educational, recreational, or social events for a total of 10 days. These tents include street festivals, weddings, customer appreciation, and stampede breakfast events. Currently, commercial tents are discretionary uses in most districts and may only operate in association with certain uses as an ancillary use or as a temporary expansion of the principal approved use. These currently include um, auction markets, um, drinking establishments, uh, nightclub, retail, and consumer service, restaurants licensed, and their list is up there. Both recreational and commercial tents are rather unique as they are currently exempt from development permits if they meet the rules of the bylaw and the exemption requirements in section 24 and 25. For commercial tents, a development permit is not required provided they uh, again meet the rules of the bylaw the gross floor area is equal to or less than 120 square meters. If it's over 120 square meters, it must be not located on a parcel that abuts a residential district. Um, and that includes low and multi districts. And it can't be in the AVPA area or in the flood area or subject to the subdivision development regulations. A DP is the only tool available for the development authority to evaluate the appropriateness of a discretionary use and apply conditions to the development. The development authority evaluation examines the context of the use, previous complaints, size, scale, layout, queuing, and may also look at the hours of operation. This evaluation coordinates and balances life safety issues, predominantly people management, and use value and enjoyment issues. The Development Authority has improved its process and is currently coordinating permit review with police, fire, building regulations, and other agencies. During the study period, 236 recreational tents and 37 commercial tents were approved. Of the commercial tents, only 16 required development permits. Most of the development permits were related to sales events. Of the commercial tents again, most at 54% are for sales in market or auction events. 17 of the applications were related to food and drink events. Most of the food or drink events occurred during the stampede period. During the summer of 2010, 311 received complaints related to noise and poor behavior in proximity to tents. This information was collected and compared with BPs and DPs for the analysis period. It is important to understand that the land use bylaw cannot regulate noise. Noise is regulated through the Community Standards Bylaw. There is a specific provision related to the duration of the Calgary Stampede that extends speaker times from 10 p.m. to midnight. When we looked at the 311 complaints, the majority at 28 of 44 calls were related to a commercial tent on four of 17 tent sites for food and drink events. A complaint call does not necessarily indicate a violation of the Community Standards Bylaw. Of the four food and drink event sites that received complaints, excuse me just for a second. Oh, okay. Of the four food and drink sites that received complaints, tent sizes varied. The size of the tent did not seem to relate to the number of the complaints. When we looked further into the relationship between the sizes of the tents, distance to dwelling, and the complaints, there is no consistent evidence indicating that the size of the location is related to tent complaints. The majority of the issues seem to relate to how the tent is operated and the behavior of the patrons. 
As we continue to promote mixed-use development, the Calgary Planning Commission considered the potential impacts on dwelling units located in select commercial districts as a trigger for development permit. The proposed amendments provide a proactive opportunity for residents in commercial districts to participate in the process, as a DP may not currently be required. Only six additional development permits are anticipated based on the analysis period. Three food and drink event tents were over 300 meters squared. The Calgary Planning Commission felt that a development permit is the most appropriate means to do an analysis and the, on the impact of tents this size. They could potentially accommodate up to 400 people or so. Only two additional development permits are anticipated based on the analysis period. The proposed amendments clarify the existing rules. All tents cumulatively contribute to the maximum tent size. The use inside the tent must be an expansion of the approved use on the parcel and cannot contain a different use. Tents cannot exceed one story. Special function tents may be temporarily located on required parking and landscaped areas other than temporary surface parking lots. Tents may temporarily be located on a parcel without being subject to the rules of the district. Some additional sales uses, such as large vehicle and equipment, vehicle sales and market, have been added. The allowable area for entertainment for tents associated with drinking establishment, licensed restaurants and nightclubs is defined. And two new scenarios for when a development permit is required are proposed. For all commercial food and drink tents over 300 meters squared, and in select mixed use areas if the tent extends a food and drink event. Your Worship, there is a late submission. I'm not sure if it was distributed in the materials, but I have a copy here. Um, it's from the Hayes Bureau Community Association. Sorry, Ms. Hartley, I believe that one was in the package, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And Council should have also received um, three submissions this morning. Uh, the Haysboro, uh, no, sorry, we have Acadia, we don't have Haysboro. So if you want to distribute that one now, that's fine. I believe the clerks Great. have a copy of that. And I believe we've also ahead. distributed additional um, submissions from the Hillhurst Sunnyside Community Association, from the Chief of Police, and from Mr. Terry Rock. And council should have those already. They were distributed just before lunch. So, sorry, Ms. Hartley, are you finished your formal presentation? Just yes, a sir. question of clarification then. Um, I have two of them. One of them is a fact-based one and the other one is a bit mean, but I'll ask both. Um, so the first one is, sorry, just to be very, very clear. What we're being asked to vote on today is really requiring a development permit in those two cases that you just mentioned, where the tent is greater than 300 square meters and where it is in certain mixed use districts providing its food and drink? Correct. So that's as, really that's really what we're talking about today. As well as the clarifying right. amendments included. Okay. But, the, but, but in effect, the change we're looking for out there in the world is that. I just found this report a little confusing as to what it was actually... Um, recommending and so then the, the slightly mean question is what problem are we trying to solve here um, when you put up your chart a few slides ago and you showed the four tents that have had complaints and one of them is smaller than 300 square meters it just occurs to me that this may be one of those cases where it's a sledgehammer to swat a fly and I wonder if I'm just reading this incorrectly and it looks like we had two tents that got a lot of complaints and one of them would not be captured by the changes we're talking about. The development permit is an opportunity to review the impact where the impact is not always consistent. We have situations where tents are located a significant distance away from residential, where they're in mixed-use commercial areas and our current provisions only consider low-density residential and multi-residential districts for 
the need for a development permit. So this is an opportunity to open up the spectrum. It also gives the development authority the ability to comment on the appropriate appropriateness of the use in the context, whether or not there have been complaints, um, if there's a history and uh, benefit from the circulation to the community associations, any relevant business revitalization zones, and of course other departments that may be involved. Questions of clarification, Alderman Farrell? Just, just for clarification, uh, Ms. Hartley, you showed me a map of, of the areas in the city that would um, then be included in this amendment. So this isn't just an inner city uh, issue. Uh, no, it's not. Excuse me for a second. I think that the map was included in, in our, um, I'll see if I can find it, in our, oh, there it is. You found it? This, okay. this oh, map, um, it's difficult to see. This map identifies all of the parcels that have the mixed-use commercial designations that we're looking at. Um, they're scattered throughout the city. Um, the map contained in the report shows the locations of the development permits over the um, just under two-year period that we looked at the tents. Do have an overlay if you'd like to see them together. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Ms. Hartley, some people are considering this a ban on tents, and there seems to be quite a bit of confusion. I've even heard some people concerned that we would be um, banning the use of teepees during Stampede, which um, I, I was surprised by that. But I, what is this exactly? It's not a ban on tents, is it? No, it's actually an expedited process to review and examine the issues related to tents. Okay. because they're so diverse as a problem solving mechanism before they correct cause any thank you uh, questions of clarification alderman chabot thank you uh your worship on page um page three of uh this report 2011 ham 2011-03 um, under background, it says special function tents. Uh, there's a number of bullets there, and under the second bullet, it says uh, are not in the Calgary International Airport vicinity protection area, floodway, fringe, overland, and near landfill sites, etc. And the reason I pointed that out is because it makes reference throughout this document about you know in proximity to landfill sites and residential areas. And, uh, and then we talk about cumulative impact of all of these different tents. And of course, first thing that comes to mind for me is Global Fest. Global Fest happens to fall within close proximity to a landfill site and it's adjacent to residential. Adjacent, i.e. across the road adjacent, which I guess constitutes adjacent. How would that impact them? Well, um, I'm not sure if they've applied for a development permit before or not. They would be a recreational tent, not a commercial tent. So the primary focus of these amendments focus on the commercial food and drink events. Festivals, the rules pretty much stay the same for, for those. They're only exempt from the requirements of the development permit if they're not within those areas. Okay, but they are within those areas. <clears throat> and they do accumulate in excess of 300, yeah. significantly more. Uh, it's the tent size, so if, if there's more than 300 meters squared, they'd probably be subject to a development permit. There are options for that. We have a group working on festival tents um, and processing them in an expeditious manner. Okay, that's not covered in here though, is it? How to process those expeditiously? No, we're, we're, uh, we're doing that on our own and we're examining how we look at those applications. Okay, well, apparently there is an amendment that may be able to address that. So um, at this point, I'll just sit back and listen to some more discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Zamong? Um, can you give me a history of how this came about? Like, why exactly is this being proposed? Where did this come from? Who initiated it? Or what, what actually transpired to get this ball rolling? 
Well, we had some inquiries related to the 311 calls that we received on tents over the stampede season. So, and so we special function tents weren't included in the uh, development of bylaw 1P 2007. So we took this opportunity to look at them. So due to the 311 calls is why CPC decided to initiate this? Uh, CPC has recommended the particular option in the report. Okay, let me, so. let me rephrase that. Like what got us going into, th this seems to be a rather extensive report. It seems to put taken a lot of work to put into it. What got the ball rolling that we should be proceeding down this course of action? Well, the land use bylaw sustainment team takes- I'm sorry? The land use bylaw sustainment team takes its own initiative and the trigger I would say would be the 311 calls that we received last year. So due to 28 311 calls, we decided to go down this road. We saw a bit of a pattern and thought we'd investigate. Okay, I, can, I mean, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I'm just trying to find out where the genesis of this is. Um, so do you think that you could give me a rough idea as to what kind of dollars we've put into this since we started don't going down this path? Um, and I'm not looking for exactly. With this <laughs> There's not going to be a, a quiz at the end. Well, perhaps no more than we would typically spend on any other investigation. We've had one uh, meeting with uh, public meeting. We invited representatives from the tent industry, community associations, and BRZs. Uh, we've prepared some minor posters. We've mainly communicated through email. And- um, Yeah, but certainly quite a number of administrative hours. We spend, we like to spend administrative the, the reason, hours- The reason I mention that is, is, is I'm not suggesting that the 311 calls are, are, are a bad indicator, yeah. but I mean, I've gotten an email from one of the, from someone this, this uh, over the weekend here commenting on their concerns for these and, and their request for this. And uh, she had claimed in herself that she herself called 311 a half a dozen times over the stampede because of the load, mu uh, because of the loud music. So I take a look at that. Are these are these three one one calls? Do we look back and see if they're unique calls, or could they could they be repeat calls? We look at the generics of the call. Mm -hmm. um, if you'd like more details on the nature of the call, we'd well, have no, to refer I, to. I, I'm not really looking for the generic the, the details on it, but I'm just kind of looking at that, going, okay. So if that's the case, it really isn't 28 calls. It's 22 complaints on four tenths, which is like five call five five complaints on each tent, it seems to me a great deal of work and effort to, to deal with 20 complaints citywide over a city of a million people. Just wondering what your thoughts on that might be. Well, this is a decision for council. The <laughs> Calgary Planning Commission has recommended Appendix 6. And we I appreciate that. clarification, Alderman Wong. Well, this is clarification. How did Sound this begin? Sounds like debate, Alderman Zwong. Oh, no, debate's later. Okay. <laughs> um, I noticed on page seven that uh, administration itself is not recommending this option. Uh, administration is here today to represent the Calgary Planning Commission and present the option that they have. I understand um, that, originally... but in the report, I'm just wondering for clarification, it says administration is not recommending this option as only four out of 17 for these types of events generated complaints. Is that? Administration recommended Appendix 5 contained in that report. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks, Alderman Devong. Questions of clarification, Alderman Kara? Yeah, how did the uh, meeting with industry go, with the tent industry? Well, there's a summary of the meeting in the appendices. I think it was fairly reasonable. We had a good discussion on process, on timelines. Um, we discussed the differences between the pros and cons of recreational and commercial tents. Uh, we had a balance of BRZ representatives there, which are themselves subject to the process, and uh, they secure something similar to a development permit if they're putting on a street festival. Um, I think some felt the development permit process would be reasonable to address the issues they were probably concerned with not being able to adequately address the issues themselves because they merely put up the tent. 
um, they don't operate the tent. So I, I think that would be just a brief summary of, of what I believe their thoughts to be. Well, the word I've been getting from industry is that we've got way too much bureaucratic red tape and that they're against Questions adding. Questions clarification. Red tape. Okay, <laughs> well, I, I, I just, I guess I'm, I'm surprised to hear you characterize it that way because I've been getting exactly the opposite characterization of maybe how that meeting went or what, what the feeling was. But thank you. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Uh, questions of clarification, Alderman Lowe. Your Worship, on the, just to summarize some things here, so they're very, very plain. If we go this route, there will be a requirement for development permit for commercial tents where a food and drink service is extended. Is that correct? Correct. So how long does it take to, how, what, how long is the normal process to process an application for development permit for this kind of activity? Eight weeks at maximum. Eight weeks at maximum. And the, either way, the decision is appealable, is it not? Correct. Okay. Ms. Jacqueline, you can leap in here any, at any point you feel, for, any, you feel necessary. Actually, this is actually helpful because I was about to ask an honest to goodness question of clarification to walk us through the process as it is today. Yeah. So, and you're getting there, so. So, at Planning Commission, Alderman Farrell, I believe, brought forward a motion asking that we could have an expedited process. Correct. And we have been expediting uh, applications at the front counter if we receive them. There's okay. a. So, what. what what in your view, what, what do we do? I'm, gonna, I'm going back years now to my days in DAB when the biggest complaint we heard from the community was we didn't know. We didn't have time. You know, we were appealing this just because. And uh, so I'm wondering in an expedited process, uh, What, what we're going to compress that could give rise to the matter going to DAB. And I don't think you know, Alderman Hodges is sitting in DAB these days. Um, you know, their, their agenda is long and you, you end up in the bottom of that heap. So what, what are we looking at to expedite these? I guess my concern is for the stampede period, of course. Well, currently we sent out a letter of notification to the tent industry advising that we would, because of the stampede season fast approaching, that we would consider any development permits for the proposed amendments as soon as possible and that we would work with them. In the future, we'd be able to probably, in working with the development authority and the internal circulation, speed up the process. Um, and that would be doing our business better with more efficiencies in terms of timing and when we circ applications to the development or to the community associations and the business revitalization zones. Those are our longest uh, time frame for comments. They receive three weeks. So we're hoping to shorten our process down to make sure it, uh, it reflects that. And are you able to achieve all these steps between now and first week in July? Well, notification was sent out to all of the community associations, BRZs, and the tent industry, as well as anybody who came and left their email address at the uh, February meeting. I personally phoned people who had made building permit applications last year or within the two, two stampede season events, um, made sure that they were aware that there was a potential change in uh, the process and that they may not be able to just come in and get a building permit, that they might be subject to a development permit as well. So we have attempted to reach the people who applied within the last two stampede periods. So my last question, and uh, Ms. Jackler, for yourself, Ms. Hartley, when an appeal is filed, it stays any action on the development permit, does it not? I'm sorry, when it's... The tent doesn't go up until the appeal is resolved. But I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> that I'm the community appealing against. Uh, well, you would need a decision. If the application required a development permit, 
Yes, they would need the decision of the Subdivision Development Appeal Board. We're hoping that the Development Authority, depending on what Council does today, is in a position to make decisions shortly after Council makes a decision itself. Your Worship, um, I would have to double check in the land use bylaw, but I'm pretty sure they won't release a development permit until the appeal has been heard by SDAB, which would effectively stay the application. And that was that was my my conclusion. Also, uh, Ms. Jackal, thank you very much. Um, I have some other questions, Your Worship, but it more has to do with the response to the complaints and our ability to terminate the activity that's bothering people at the time. And I'll ask you if we're going beyond the scope of this hearing. But it seems to me part of the problem we have, if you allow me to continue, is that um, we're missing the hammer here. I, um, I don't think you're going beyond the scope of the hearing. However, I would like to actually have the hearing because we're still on the clarification part. I, so maybe I you can ask that. those questions after we've heard from the public. Okay, and I see we have some uh, uniform members of mm -hmm. administration here who I think can uh, just if we can exercise some authority not let them escape. Don't escape. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> Alderman Marr, questions of clarification? Thank you, Your Worship. Just so I understand more clearly what we're talking about here. This is not necessarily that onerous of a step because a couple of years ago, as I understand it, we used to require development permits for this very thing. Is this not the case? We did. We required development permits for the tar tents larger than 300 meters squared. Why did we stop doing it? Um, well, when we, when 1P07 came into effect, we also realized that there were a lot of auction house and auction market development permits that were of that size that weren't causing a problem. We tried so to that, that were or were not? Were not causing, not a, causing problem. a problem. Yes. Um, we try to continually monitor the situation and mm. make sure we're responsive. Um, and at that time, we didn't have the experience that we've had in the last, since the 2007-2008 bylaw was effective. Right. So we experimented. We tinkered around. We and did. we realize now again that the one size fits all mentality doesn't necessarily work. Would you agree with that characterization? I would. Thank you. That's my question of clarification. You were. Okay, Ms. Hartley, I'm sorry you're getting so many of these questions of clarification, but it is a little confusing. So I, I need it explained to me a bit like a six year old. So today, if we don't make any of these changes today, I'm the ranchman's, for example, and I want to put up a thousand square uh, square meter tent for Stampede. What process do I go through? A building permit. So all I need is a building permit. That's so correct. we have the authority as the city to put restrictions on the building permit and so on. But at the end of the day, if it's really loud, that has nothing to do with the building permit. Yeah. So we'd have to deal with that through the community standards bylaw. That's correct. Okay. And so what we're suggesting now is that if I'm the ranchman's and I want such a big tent, I go through a development permit stage before the building permit. And what that means that we have to tell the adjacent community is if they're not expecting the ranchman to put up a tent for stampede. Um, but what other powers does that grant the city, the approving authority, if you like, that we don't have at the building permit stage? Well, the development authority can consider the appropriateness of the use the history on the site, the operation, um, any community input comments, uh, any BRZ comments if they exist, any relevant changes to the site layout and design um, through our partners and other departments, for example, if there's a queuing issue, if we need to modify the location of crowd control, if the police have any comments related to septet or crime prevention through environmental design. Um, all of those other factors that would result in the evaluation of the tent. Okay, just to be clear, all of those factors are not things we can look at through the building permit process, only through the development permit process. So if, for example, there were an enormous amount of complaints last year for a given tent, 
if I was only looking at it at the building permit process, I would not have the ability to turn it down based on the fact that there would be a lot of complaints last year. That's correct. You'd be reviewing the structure of the tent. That is extremely helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, well, what the heck, let's start the public hearing, shall we? <laughs> um, anyone who would like to speak in favor of this proposal then? Anyone who would like to speak in favor? Your Worship and Council, I'm Constable Mark Kane from the Calgary Police Service. I'm, uh, <laughs> if you get words confused up there, I apologise. I know it will try and interpret its best for me. Um, I am the officer that's tasked with where uh, the city's called the Public Safety Task Force. In my um, team, there's various city agencies as well as provincial agencies. We are, as a uh, Alderman Lowput, we are the hammer. We are the people that are out there monitoring the tents once the tents are up. We are the people that are enforcing the um, issues that, that come around. Um, for us to be able to be at the forefront of this uh, process, um, to have our points put across and also be able to look at a tent from a multi-agency approach, um, we can get past those legislation pieces that we may not necessarily know ourselves as a city, but may come up later from um, another agency. Um, that, to me, is a very fair way of helping the industry by spending all the money out to get a tent up to be told, sorry, you can't have it from another agency's policy. So um, for me and from the chief, the chief is in, uh, uh, in favour of this and he's, he looks at it that we're there at the forefront, we're there speaking with the industry at the beginning, trying to assist them rather than being at the, at the far end when they only see us when we're actually having to deal with them after the tent is up. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Lowe? Well, thank you, and thank you for being here, Constable. And I, uh, you, you mentioned the Public Safety Task Force, which, if I understand it correctly, is uh, Calgary Police Service, bylaw, ALGC. Am I missing somebody? Uh, yeah, we have immigration on board as well. We have health. Um, we also have the year of Revenue Canada, just in case we, we need them. <laughs> I like that last little bunch. <laughs> the, uh, my question to you, and I'm, I'm going back to the process, and these are the questions uh, I asked of Ms. Hartley and, and, and uh, Ms. Jackal. My concern isn't so much around the, the development permit aspect. My concern is around short-circuiting or compressing that to the point where we enable an appeal which effectively eliminates the tent, just given the, the process of getting through the appeal process in the city here. So my, what the, the I wonder I have is what assurance can you give counsel that if council, as a result of this, was to suggest a zero tolerance for any uh, provincial statute, the LGC regulation, city bylaw, uh, criminal code, immigration, income tax, uh, any of those things that, that, as a result of a complaint, you observe the permit is, you know, the operation is shut down dead. Um, what, what's your ability to walk in on uh, a Friday night at 12.05 uh, a.m. and the operator know on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. that he's finished? At this moment in time, we, we don't regularly do that anyway. What we'll tend to do is we'll speak with the owner at the time. We'll try and come back and see them the following day and rectify it. I'd rather... My view is I'd rather work with the industry and get the problem solved than coming down heavy on them all the time. Um, I think it's a, a fair and just approach that education, education, enforcement is probably the way forward. However, at those times that we deem that it's an absolute necessity, then we would shut it down based on whatever legislation that we have. Um, I personally feel that this way of moving forward is a fair and just way that you have all the agencies, and that includes the provincial agencies at the table, 
um, and that we don't suddenly start going out to tents and asking them to move things around when uh, members of the public are there. I, I wouldn't suggest while the members of the public were there. I would say when they were finished at 3 a.m. You know, I'm not, I don't want you to put yourself at risk. The, uh, my former gentleman used to sit in this seat a couple of councils ago. I had a favourite saying there was nothing like the sight of a head rolling across the deck to get the crew's attention. So it's, uh, that, that's sort of my thought in that regard. The, I, uh, I guess I'm going to advance my question a bit further on down. I take it as part of this process that your group, the uh, Public Safety Task Force, will be asked to either comment on or review applications as they come through and make recommendations. Are, are you able to make recommendations of which would include refusal? Yes, we can, because we have all the legislations from all the different agencies. So at the very beginning, we are providing um, the applicants um, the chance to see why we would be refusing it, rather than spending all the money out to get tent, staff, supplies in. And also it lets the, the community have a chance that we're there, they know who we are, we're having a look at it, and it's we're looking at it fairly. Um, I think one of the things that I've got to be very cautious of is complaints that are driven through um, other means that somebody's just phoning because they just don't like a person. And that's this is why I'm saying that we have to be careful when we go there. I agree that if we see it in person, there's a difference to a generated complaint. So do we have to look at those previous complaints from the previous year um, in a fair and just way? Absolutely. Do we have to do we have to make sure that the industry is aware of that? Absolutely. The next question, Your Worship, is to Ms. Jackal. And it would be if during the review process for development permit for a tent involving food and drink, the uh, Public Safety Task Force recommended refusal. Is that grounds for an appeal on the basis of the applicant? Uh, through the chair, um, yes, certainly. So then that puts an interesting question to Subdivision Development Appeal Board. Because if, in fact, we're enabling these under the land use bylaw, and the basis for the refusal is um, ALGC regulation, um, immigration, anything except that, I would suspect the chair of the board may well say, we don't have jurisdiction. Um, Your Worship, uh, that's, that's entirely possible. Um, it's the only other thing I would point out is that if it was a discretionary use, the approving authority can um, refuse something even if it complies completely with the bylaw if for whatever reason they think it is inappropriate. Um, but but I, I do take the member's point that um, if we were refusing because of a liquor license issue or immigration issues or whatever, there, there certainly are those processes that would apply and I, I do believe, although I can't guarantee, I think SDAB would be um, uh, loath to take that on. So that would be virtually everything that applies to these tents, with the exception of land use bylaw issues. In other words, health, liquor, immigration, um, public safety is always a tough one. Um, Your Worship, through the chair, I there is um, a provision in the subdivision and development regulation that does allow for. Uh, septed related conditions to be applied to development permits so that does gray the issue a little bit because certainly then safety and, and so on could be taken into account but from a land use bylaw perspective as you say okay thank you very much your worship great thank you uh, given the number of lights that are on to speak with you sir I'm gonna suggest that I bang the gavel we take our afternoon break, and if you could stick with us, we'll uh, reconvene with lots of questions for you in half an hour. Yes, Thank you very much. So we will be back at 3.50 uh, p.m.
We're back. And Constable Kane, you still with us? Sir, uh, I believe we have some more questions for you, Alderman Marr. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Constable Kane, so in your role as the Calgary Police Service, and how, how are you characterizing, or how would you characterize these large-scale tents, event tents, um, when there is significant amounts of alcohol and, and, uh, and people? How does that impact the, the surrounding area? I think we've got to consider that once people start having festivity and they're starting to enjoy themselves and alcohol's flowing freely, that the normal uh, layperson suddenly becomes a different uh, beast. And it's not necessarily what happens in the tent sometimes, it's the overspill. It's the people going back from them as well. We've just got to be considerate that people are there to enjoy themselves. And I'm, I'm all for people enjoying and having, having great festivity and fun. Um, but I've also got to be considerate to those citizens that are actually trying to just live their normal life. And these, these places have a, an added effect to their quality of life. Um, however, alcohol, large amounts of people, um, from a, from certainly from a policing point of view, is always a dangerous environment because you have to provide more officers. You have to ensure that when you're going into these places that people aren't trying to you know, grab hold of you, or just even just for fun, it's, it can be potentially a dangerous place to be. So it does have it does potentially have a negative impact on the surrounding area, as well as sounds like to me a drain on resources for the Calgary Police Service. It can, but obviously that's only in certain occasions. I mean, as as a general rule, um, most of the tents just operate and we, we attend and we maybe have one set of words and, and that's it. Unfortunately, you can't control the people that do attend sometimes, so we have to be mindful of that as well, that sometimes people will attend and there's no control in that type of person if they get out of hand. It's the, the time comes is when we do get the potential problem and it's how it's actually dealt with by the people running the actual event. I, I understand. And what this is essentially saying to us is that we're going to ask applicants provide in their development permit a series of ask or answer a series of questions. How are you going to mitigate some of these potential challenges that may arise in the event that there is lineups and there is overflow, uh, there is noise? How would you address that? That's essentially what this, this uh, bylaw amendment is asking. Would you agree with that? Yes, and I think it's it's, it's very valuable because obviously um, the difference between I, I believe you call it residential sidewalk and commercial sidewalk is one of the another key factor that we have to consider the foot traffic alongside pedestrian traffic because once you start seeing movement of of people, then add alcohol to that mix. It can sometimes be a recipe for an accident to happen. Right, and. In the city of Calgary, we want people to have fun, but we also want to make sure that it's done in a safe way that's respectful for the surrounding area, because Calgary is uh, is really uh, for everyone. So, in my hand, are, have you seen this note uh, from uh, Chief Hansen? Yes, I have. You are aware of it, and can you characterize what the tone of the letter is from the chief for the people that uh, that don't have one in their hands? Yep, I can put it up on the. Would you mind, Terribly? Kind of like that. There we go. Adam Clerk, there we go. So essentially what this is saying is that the, the, the Calgary Police Service, and it's signed by our chief uh, and also cockpit to uh, the Calgary Police Commission, is that the service is in support of providing a development permit, which would allow us to be able to mitigate some of the potential challenges that could be coming from tents of uh, event tents. Is that is that what you understand that to be? Absolutely, and I think it's more along the lines of that we're actually getting involved with the stakeholders and the industry at the, at the front end, along with the community, so that we can come up with a solution rather than trying to deal with a problem at the end. Thank you, and from a policing standpoint, 
do you, do you believe that this is overkill? Is this, is this doing too much or is this the right amount or how would you characterize it from a law enforcement perspective? From a law enforcement point of view, I, I'm always a firm believer that um, being proactive rather than reactive is always a way forward because if you can put less, if you can put the resources in at the beginning, it means you provide less resources at the end if it's done properly. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Alderman Keating. Just have one question. Uh, were you called or did you have to attend any of the complaints last year? Yes, I was working them. Um, unfortunately, I was oh, like the industry from 8 in the morning till 4 in the morning last year every day. And I probably should have put uh, CPS rather than you specifically, but that's, that's perfectly, I didn't mean but that. But, um, what were the actions taken or could you take actions at that time? There were several uh, incidents <coughs> where we came across things that obviously were in uh, violation of certain legislations. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and I think it would be unfair to, to um, actually name any premise or, yeah. or what the thing was. But yeah, we certainly came across things that we thought if we'd have just got to the beginning and we're sitting here dis discussing this together, we could have avoided this. Simple things like fire code being addressed later on or gaming and liquor regulations being or Tobacco Reduction Act, all these kind of things that we sometimes forget that could have a major impact on the actual business at the time. And we saw some very um, strange things when we were out, so. <laughs> Thank you. I sort of feel like I'd rather have a conversation about those things. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe not in the public hearing. Alderman Chabot. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Constable Kane, is it? Kane, yes. Thanks for being here today. Um, a couple of things. Um, we just received a letter from Haysboro Community Association indicating that they had a, a good relationship with, uh, with the ranchmans, and, but they did have some issues with some noise, and at one point <clears throat> this person actually called 311 only to be told that there were a number of complaints that were currently before uh, that had been called into 311, and so it would probably be some time before uh, anybody would be able to respond to their complaint. Is there a more proactive way that citizens can contact the Public Safety Task Force, in, as an example, to address some of these issues? Um, as of last year, I introduced a, we have a specific mailbox um, that comes directly to myself, and obviously I, I can then relay that to all the other agencies, but if you were asking about process, then certainly if the 311 complaint comes in, a quick email to my email box or the Public Safety Task Force email box would address that. It means that when we're out at night, we could potentially look at all those complaints that come in from the previous night, address them. If, if my colleagues in other city departments were unable to go themselves, we could certainly have a look at that. So we're talking, this would be 24 hours later, though? If we're out, we certainly will be able to go there. And then when Stampede comes in, we certainly increase our hours of working and, um, and how we're out and about. So the email situation, I can certainly pick it up there and then, or we can give a, a number to the 311 and they can contact either myself or maybe one of the other team direct. Okay. So is there another mechanism that people can use to register a complaint and expect to get some action that night? There is the uh, PSC, so the Public Service Centre. So if it goes to 311, they'll sometimes direct it to them, and then it goes obviously to a district unit. Um, the only downside with that is that sometimes a district unit might not see the, the whole picture. So, But if somebody was breaking a law, whatever that law is, then the process would be to call 911, right? I yes, think. absolutely. Okay, so if it was a, a, a legal issue, there's certainly a mechanism through 911. I know we keep talking about 311. 311 is good, um, but there are some instances where 911 is a process that people should be following. Um, so in, in your dealings through the Public Safety Task Force in the past, has there been a problem with uh, enforcement in some of these facilities? Sometimes I think it gets frustrating from our point of view that we can write tickets, we can give advice, but sometimes, as um, Alderman Loeb was saying, you know, there is, a, there is a hammer, but I believe in education, rather. 
the, the potential there is that do we try and shut a place down that's, as we call it, full swing, when you could potentially cause a problem just by closing it mm. there and then. If there's an intimate um, safety issue to the public, yes, we will, because we just, we have to. Um, we do that on a regular basis when we're out doing normal visits throughout the year to uh, establishments. Um, tents, I just see, are just an extension to those establishments, and I think they should fall under the same uh, criteria. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and um, how, what, how good of records would you guys keep on a, on a facility, such as you had to do some enforcement, um, and then the next night it was less enforcement, subsequent night, maybe more detail, uh, seating capacity issue, loud noise issue, like all those kind of um, specifics. Do, would that all be recorded on each site? Each, each separate agency keeps track of their own, but I also try and keep track of each of the agencies and what it is they're actually doing. So um, it's something that hadn't been done by, obviously, some of my previous colleagues, but it's something that I'm working towards to ensure that we have that monitoring situation so that when we come to these type of discussions, we can actually actively show. Yeah, and <clears throat> my, my struggle with this bylaw right now, and which is the reason I was asking you some of these questions, is just wondering about setting a precedence, knowing that we've got rules that are coming forward, and, and the ability for um, organizations to respond without having to go down the whole regulatory process, or at least having an understanding that this is something that they will it will have to be dealt with in the future <clears throat> and and then adjusting their behavior accordingly or making sure that the behavior is being properly adhered to in light of the fact that they know that regulations will be forthcoming do you think that that itself might actually create some greater um, I guess compliance it always helps, but I always, I'm always, i always a firm believer that dealing with it at the front end is always better than dealing with it at the back end. So, And I think we've also got to be very careful what we're clarifying on here is, um, are we talking about just stampede tents or are we talking about tents in general? I think that's, that's the two issues that I see that's here, that we do have special events tents throughout the year, but we also have stampede events. So... We have to look at, when you look at stampede tents and we start looking at that, yes, we have more people. So the fact is we have more people means that you're now putting more drain on the resources that you've already got for the city. So if you then look at that and then move that forward to special event tents per se, we wouldn't normally have the same amount of people we're dealing with normal business. We're just adding an extra couple of things to it. So I think it's from my, from my view looking at this that stampede events is something that we have to look at especially, but special event tents are something that we have to look at as a, as a whole as well. Yeah, listen, I, I'm not going to uh, dispute that um, assertion from your perspective. From the police department's perspective, I, I certainly understand your perspective. I, I have to try and weigh all of those kind of issues together in how many resources are we going to have to allocate into our own internal departments to make sure that these processes are carried forward in, in a timely fashion so that if somebody is applying for a tent today that they can all be resolved prior to stampede time. Personally, I'd much rather see us introducing something like this and let people know that in six months time, calendar year is gonna come into effect as opposed to once we've given it three readings. That's, that's where I'm challenged a little bit right now is whether or not we'll be able to implement this and assess all of these things prior to stampede. Anyways, I, I have no further questions, but thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Jones. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my questions are similar to Alderman uh, Chabot's. Outside of the 311 calls, how many 911 calls did we receive in the last year? I don't have them with me today. Um, I believe that it was sent in earlier. Okay. And how many arrests do you have? That's the the problem with the arrest situation when you start talking about it is and it goes back to what i would say negative spill if you were to say how many arrests were direct within the tents there's very minimal but how many arrests were made once people were leaving tents i'd say that we're starting to look up into a different category here so when we categorize for this 
it was very difficult for our analysts to actually come forward and say it was directly attributed to the tents. However, you add alcohol in people, then you're going to start getting more arrests. It's just a, it's just a fact of life. So does it factor into your approvals, though? It would if we could get if we could, if we could actually prove that it came directly from a tent, then yes, it would probably factor in. But if it was from a generalisation of an area, then I have to be very careful of can I prove that negative spill came from a certain place. It's exactly like if I put it in terms of dealing with a, a, a drunk driver, you know, when you arrest them, do you then trace it back to the place that he came from? That's, that's all pack and parcel of that. So it's very difficult to prove where they came from, but you made the arrest, and you know it's probably contributing to the fact that there's extra festivities I, going I actually on. don't mean somebody getting into a car and leaving. I'm saying on site. And that's what I'm saying. If, if, if it comes from that we had, I'll use an example, uh, we have 100 arrests at a tent based on disorder, then yes, that would have an effect on the tent the following year. I would assume that if you've got a, a restaurant, per se, that uh, the whole year there's nothing wrong with it and all of a sudden a tent goes up and arrests start to happen because of it, that would be a factor then, would it not? It would, yes. And I take it that a lot of, you don't have a lot of problems with the one-night stands. It's mainly the complaints come through with the 10-day stampede more than anything else. Yes, and I've actually dealt with quite a few of the one-night events that are going on, and I've actually physically gone out to the sites and spoke to the actual uh, people that are organizing it and once they start telling you what they're doing and they've been doing it for so many years I I don't see a problem with an event that's been going for 10 years and has never had any complaints I think we've certainly got to be considerate that Stampede as a city grows Stampede's going to grow and we're going to start moving out into the neighborhoods that used to not never see a Stampede tent Thank you Roger. Thanks Alderman Jones Alderman Demong just a quick question following up on uh, Alderman Chabot's. In your opinion, uh, do you see this concept, even in its ex expedited format that you've described, feasible to, produce, to proceed this year? We've set up a lot. We've already done a lot of pre-screening already as a team. So we have a lot of places sitting ready to go. So we would be able to get it through if it goes through this year. But that's obviously up to council. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Duong. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much for uh, the work you're doing here in front of council. I think you're doing an amazing job. I think that the police department does an amazing job under the leadership of the chief in being very preventative oriented rather than enforcement oriented, and I think that's totally laudable. Um, it's, it really makes me proud. Um, I will sort of ask, you know, we've got the chief's letter up there, though, and you know, I think you guys do a great job at what you do. My question is, is land use the tool to enact this through? Or are there, could, could you conceive of other sort of mechanisms where we could sit down, do a proactive preliminary screening, make sure everyone's on the same page, make sure that all the processes are in place right, without having to involve land use? Because I, I to evoke the mayor's phrase, it's kind of like using a sledgehammer for a flea. And I think there's a lot of laudable and important and necessary things attached to it. I'm just not sure that we're using the right vehicle. And I don't know if this is within or outside of your area of expertise. One of the things I would say is that we're looking at site layout here. So we're looking at the way the site's laid out. From a policing point of view, you imagine you have an entrance that now filters out onto a busy, busy uh, transport route. Mm -hmm. The potential for somebody to get hurt increases tenfold. By being in at the very beginning, we have that chance to move things around yeah. and to make it a safe and viable place. I to don't be. I don't disagree with anything you're saying. What I'm saying is is it possible to do this without getting involved with land use or not? I feel that this is something that we should do. I feel that this is something that is is a necessary way of getting all the agencies, all the agencies that we directly don't have any control over, mm -hmm. i.e. from a provincial point of view, at the front end of the table so that they can, and I just, I feel that that is the key fundamental here for me is that we're working smarter 
rather than having to work harder and that we're opening up doors and better communication with the industry rather than having to go and deal with industry afterwards. in an enforcement basis. I totally understand that. I guess to maybe rephrase my question one last time is if it was possible to achieve all of those things without having to get involved with a land use process, you'd be just as fine with that? I, I'm good with anything that's going to make it a safer city. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Constable Kane. Um, previously, we had rules in place that required all tents of this nature to have a DP. And um, since the land use bylaw change, we're seeing more tents um, show up in, in neighbors that haven't had them in the past. And operators that haven't had a lot of experience with them, working with, with the community. And your experience, were you here prior when, when tents needed development permits? I unfortunately know. <laughs> no, okay, so I'm, I might not ask you that question. Maybe I'll ask bylaw that question. So you're really talking about problem solving ahead of time. That's it, and that's my, my whole key issue here is that this, this is not something that we're looking at as a city ourselves. Um, if, to, if I can throw a bit of context in this, I have spoken with several of the industry contacts in various cities like Chicago and New York, and this is something that they do as a general rule. If you go to New York or Chicago, they sit down and start talking with the industry at the front end whenever they're dealing with anything. So we're looking at fixed structures or anything so that the police service and all the other agencies are there and they can get the matters resolved so that they can get just go on with the event. The police service and all the other agencies can pre-plan their numbers mm -hmm. so that they can deal with it. And I think when we're looking at Stampede as it stands now, my understanding is that Stampede was once city core. What we're starting to see now, based on some of my colleagues that have been here many years in the other agencies, is that we're now starting to move out into the residential communities. And that is where I think people are starting to stem the complaints from that, while well, it wasn't here before. Is it a good thing? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because if you start putting the tents out, I'm just, I'm just trying to be an open-minded here, you start putting them out into the communities, does that mean that people have less places to drive? Because we know. Mm -hmm. So we've got to think smarter as well. And I think the other key to it is the transportation. And so this is just one piece of a, a large puzzle. Well, and I would agree with you. It reminds me a little bit of the discussion around whether or not we should have neighborhood pubs. It's really a matter of scale and it's a matter of behavior. And we want to have this kind of integration. But if there's a certain type of behavior stemming from them, then communities will, will reject having that kind of land use in their neighborhood. Now, the idea of, uh, I know that you're working in, in prevention in this area and looking at the cities that you've just mentioned, in things like soft closings and, and how to deal with lineups and that sort of thing. So can you speak a little bit about what happens when midnight comes along and you have to close a tent immediately and then you get several hundred people spilling out on a, a street who may be intoxicated. And how does a soft closing work? Soft closing is more, the, okay, I'll, I'll look at the soft closing first. Soft closing is that you're slowly reducing the amount of premises that are closing down. So rather than at three o'clock in the morning, everybody empties out onto the street and it becomes a complete nightmare because you've got not enough transportation, you've got not enough, you've got food vendors everywhere, you've got people trying to mill around and it's, we live in a city that it goes from minus 40 all year round um, to <laughs> zero at some point. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think the soft closing idea is we have to be careful that we don't start creating this bar hop in society mm -hmm. and that we've also got to be careful that we're not asking the industry to get the burden of that cost. That's one of the other things we've got to be careful of, that you're asking the industries to stay open, lo open longer where they're not, actually, they're not actually making the potential for any money. They're actually having to pay their staff longer to stay on. Is it a great idea in the long run? Absolutely, but we have to be very careful how we introduce it. If you then start talking about how is it to actually close a place, I 
I can tell you that recently we closed a, a venue down at one o'clock in the morning, purely by the fact on a safety issue. Their fire panel had gone. We had to eventually just empty, and that was 450 patrons. Out of 450 patrons, we had 10 that potentially wanted to get into a fist fight, not just with the police, but with the fire marshal. So you're then having to then start drawing in police resources to come and look after that. So that's one of the things you've got to be mindful of, that you're now going to start putting the people out onto the street and they could potentially be annoyed because they're enjoying having them a great time, they're enjoying themselves. The other side of that is that the actual owners of the premise also get it because the people say, I want my money back, I've paid for this. There's a whole lot of issues that are raised when you start closing places. Mm -hmm. I personally I think it's the last, last resort. Is it all easier to deal with the place once it's closed? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We then deal with the ownership then. But to deal with it at the time, unless it's an immediate threat to human life, then it's easier just to let things go and just monitor it than trying to deal with it at the time. I, I would agree. Now, this year, we, um, because of the recommendations of Planning Commission, we have seen development permit applications through the system. And you're working through this special team to look at some of the issues. So what are the kind of issues that you, I mean, we heard about lineups and trying to separate the uh, people who are just normal pedestrians walking by and people who are exiting the premises, for example. Um, smoking, uh, storing of liquor, I would imagine. All sorts of issues are being handled. Do you, no do you notice a difference in the approach because they have to work through these issues with your group? prior to getting their permit, a more a willingness to work with you? I think, yes, there is. And I think certainly there's a lot of people as well that I would believe that even if you went to them anyway, they would do it. Mm -hmm. This is just a good way that everybody's on the same playing field and that we're, we're trying to get everybody to see the, what the ramifications are as to something as simple as um, what they call a reefer refrigerated unit. Now it's running. Um, do we go for an electric one, do we go for a gas power one based on where it is? So we have to, you know, it's not, it's like what I said, it's negative spill. It's also, is the sidewalk, was it ever designed to hold that amount of people? Because now we're adding more people to it. Mm -hmm. So are we then adding things like parking? Because some people will come and drive. Now, in a lot of places, parking is premium. Is it that we can get the services in there to get the people out? So we have to, all these things are all the things that we're trying to consider at the front end. And also, as I said, how people are exiting from these venues and how they're gaining access to them. Mm -hmm. And then do we then have to look at what time do we close them down because of what in close proximity to residential. So we're trying to get that fine balance between all year round and 10 days. Well, and when we get that balance, we'll likely see more communities interested in, in and welcome, welcoming these types of uses in their neighborhoods because there is that balance. Now, I have a, a, an amendment that um, I've been working with the, the planning department on. I think you're aware of it. It's, um, it's talking about a three-week process where the circulation would go directly to, is it LEMAG? It's the Licensed Establishment Multi-Agency Group, which is a group that you refer to. Yeah, it's, it's more like the, the administration side of Public Safety Task Force, it's just another acronym, so. Um, but it, it's effectively, it's the same people from the, those teams. So rather than having the people that are physically going out doing the inspections, it's their, it's their superiors that are actually in there making the decisions. So it's, we're getting the heads of these departments in and they're actually there to be able to make a calculated decision, so. Well, and the recommendation is, is process the application within three weeks. So if there is, an appeal time allotted. Oh, and that's funny. <laughs> it's been acting up all day. Um, so three weeks is sufficient then? Three weeks is sufficient. And I think there's a lot of other things that we've got to consider when we, when we look at that three week date, obviously. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions, thank you. 
Thanks, Alderman Farrell. I think that's it, Constable Kane. Thank you very much for your presentation and for being so generous with your time in answering questions. All right, so we're Thank still here in public hearing. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in favor? Uh, good afternoon, Your Worship, members of council. My name is Tim Kitchen. I represent uh, Hillhurst Sunnyside Community Association. I'm a member of the board. I'm also a member of the, of the planning committee. And I'm also a parent and a member of the, of the community for the last 10 years. The, um, this question as to why we would come up and support a, a uh, change. And um, I think specifically, um, our, our uh, planning committee has got a lot of work. Our, um, and that work is engaging with the uh, residents of our community on any changes that would affect the residents. So we have, uh, we have a fairly heavy workload um, when it comes to development permits that come through there. So do we look forward to taking on additional work with the volunteers that we have? The answer would be not, not, we're not looking for it. But if it should come up, um, and it generally comes up in the form of uh, concerns raised by residents. I really like what Constable Kane had to say, and that is uh, education and uh, addressing the problem at the front end of a potential problem opportunity is the best approach to it, rather than trying to fix it after as, a, as an issue. The development permit offers us an opportunity to be able to do that, and that is get public consultation and community engagement at the front end of the process. And that is, there is going to be an event in your community that you have an opportunity to uh, voice support for or concerns for, identify opportunities or potential problems and voice them and uh, everybody can have that conversation then. And I'd rather a dialogue, which is an opportunity to talk it through rather than a, a uh, discussion, which is generally an argument. Um, so I'd like you, I would recommend that you support that change. When we look at the volume of change, I thought those are good questions, just how much of an effort are we talking about here? We're talking two or three or four potential DPs that are gonna come through our committee through the year, additional ones hardly an imposition, but the amount of work that I have to do when dealing with the problems afterwards as a volunteer is um, no comparison. So give me the work at the front end rather than the back end of the process. Um, we're, we're not shy of trying new things. As a matter of fact, I would say we go looking for new things to try. And you know, I, I really acknowledge the efforts that uh, individuals take upon themselves to try, try new things. And specialty tents is one of those that we had tried out last year and we had some adverse effects associated with it. Um, as a whole though, I think we should embrace opportunities that are gonna challenge us to do things differently. We can always do better. And I think part of the doing better is effective community engagement. So I would I come up and support it. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Kitchen, we, uh, my, one of my concerns is the expedited, <clears throat> the expedited process, the ability of communities to respond within that. You heard Alderman Farrell speak about a three-week process. And I know it's difficult for you. This question may be unfair, but are you prepared to respond to a three-week process? Our, um, in short, yes. And I speak on behalf of the planning committee. That is our three-week window. We have review all development permits on a three-week basis on a rotating three-week every Monday, every third Monday. So it seems. Well, like this, this may be this may be out of sync with us. What I'm saying is, 
if uh, you know it's three weeks beginning to end, your your consultation period could be ten days into it. Yeah, I, I think you make a good point. I think the challenge in this, and I'm not sure who had mentioned it earlier, was the fact that um, if it's a commercial exercise. As a business owner, I should be giving it more than three weeks uh, thought before I go out and embark on making a major investment. Um, if I'm something I want to do year over year, I would be thinking about what I'm going to be doing for next year's event and planning for it at about this time. And I should be in the execution stage at this point. If I'm trying to fast track and get something in on short notice, then three three weeks is probably a rush. But you know, given the fact that we have a schedule in place and um, it, seem, it doesn't seem unreasonable for people to plan out in advance. And what would you suggest to me, or how would you reply to me, if I was to say that we get application on today, I send uh, the notice out on Wednesday telling you that if I hadn't heard back by a week Wednesday, that uh, not hearing back will be interpreted as no comment. Uh, it's very rarely that you would get a no comment from our organization. No, no, be, no, uh, but this, this is a special, you know, we're, we're talking, Alderman Farrell's proposing a, a three-week in her amendment. Yes. If I understand her amendment correctly, she's proposing a three-week, a very abbreviated process, which puts some very tight timelines in it. Oh, One of my concerns is, yeah. and this is my previous life on development and appeal board, where the complaint that came forward was we didn't know we didn't have time, time to consult, we weren't consulted. Um, well, there there are ways that we've handled that in the past, and that and that really becomes a uh, we use um, email quite extensively, and through our our um, website, uh, we'll do a mail out. We have uh, people who will flyer. Um, it depends on the type of event and just uh, or in the kind of circumstances and how much effort it would be required, but. It's not uncommon for us to try and turn it around in a very short period of time. My preference, however, is not to be doing the firefighting or the emergency response. It's to uh, plan it effectively. And it, just because the DP starts three weeks doesn't mean the consultation process has to start in three weeks. I mean, given the, given the opportunity. The, the uh, issue really, though, sir, is we're looking at tents for stampede. We're in May. Yes. You know, uh, we, you know, we're we're already, unless the, the applications are in process now, and it's yeah. my understanding that they're not. Uh, yeah. So we, if we if we do something, it, it's got to happen very quickly. And I guess what I'm hearing you say, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you would you would endeavor to reply within the time limit if you put a time limit on it. A absolutely. Yes. Um, not my preferred mode of operation, but yes, we'll endeavor to do that. Thank you, Your Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Farrell? Thank you for being here today, Mr. Kitchen. So the, the applications in Hillhurst Sunnyside are already in the process, and the Community Association did uh, undertake to get their comments in prior to the deadline, even though you didn't have a public meeting. So you went through the exercise email and um, delivering a hand flyer in order to, to achieve the feedback that you were looking for. Yes, that's exactly what happened. Yes. So I guess in response to your question indirectly, is, uh, we, we were given the three weeks and we, we responded to it in kind, I guess, to deliver. That's part of the reason that I'm here today. Is, uh, is to respond to that. Um, other questions? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, the uh, Hillhurst Sunnyside Community Association isn't saying no tents then. You're saying that you would like the opportunity to what? Address issues before they occur? Ab absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I, I prefer a proactive nature to it. I think the land use. Uh, uh, bylaw that you're proposing here is uh, is pretty reasonable. Start, it characterizes uh, commercial tents and it's, and again it's, falls into a very small uh, portion of the category. Um, in that in that definition of commercial is one of uh, what we would further go on to say is uh, the difference between a nightclub and a restaurant, and and. 
And why do we go into that distinction? And the distinction is, what is the property owners currently, what's their envelope of, uh, of business? And we would support an extension of that business to what it's already gone through a DP uh, process for. When it starts to step out or perceived to step outside of that uh, envelope, then that raises concerns. Uh, particularly around the duration of time in which, um, in which we're talking about here. It's not a, uh, it's not a casual thing where um, it, it's not just a one-day event. Where when, it, when we talk about Stampede, it's 10 days, and it's two weeks of somebody's, somebody's time. So if, we're, if you're relaxing a noise bylaw till midnight, then that, that will impact on people if there's a if the noise is at its peak levels, which is different than um, what the original use of the um, of the property is for, and so uh, we're we're very strongly in support of the, the businesses within our community and the and the business envelope. Maybe use that term loosely as to what they originally uh, agreed to operate a business on that particular property, and would continue to support them in the in the use of that property. But when we start to, if the perception is that it strays outside of that original use, then I think we should have uh, a, a very uh, engaged uh, uh, process to, to talk about where that goes. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I see this as doing. You're bringing up another issue that is currently under the investigation of the planning department. I mean, I think it's a very important issue for that community. Not maybe before us before, but a blurring of the, of, of the land use. Um, and Hillary Sunnyside has a history of um, enjoying good parties. They put on that sun and salsa with the BRZ every year, and and it's it's not like you don't like to have fun. <laughs> so, thank thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell, and thank you, Mr. Kitchen. Anyone else like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else in favor? Hello, Mr. Peck. Yes. Uh, Mayor, Alderman, city staff, I lived here since 1952, and I was a contractor since the early 60s. It only took a week, maybe two weeks, to get a permit, but it seems like the more a bureaucracy we create, the more fees we want to charge. This is what it's all about, it seems like. Uh, I had never any problems getting a permit, but in the 80s, it all changed. It was all for, what do we do to charge more money? The permits were so cheap, uh, were just like borscht. You know what I'm saying. But, uh, <laughs> but things have changed so much. As far as the tent issue, I found it almost hypocritical. Look at Oliver Roberts, the preacher came into town, used the stampede grounds. He had the biggest tent that Calgary has ever seen. They held thousands of people. They never had any problems. Even uh, the beer gardens had tents. The stampede held the beer gardens also. Uh, it didn't take long to get a permit. You, j you just make a phone call or go in and give them 20, 50 bucks or whatever, you got a permit. Right now, this, it seems like the city wants to have a, 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 a land use to charge money for it, a couple of three, four, five, ten thousand dollars, maybe a hundred thousand. What, what is this all about? All money? Aren't people are supposed to have, be having fun? Aren't businesses supposed to make money out of it? Or is only the city supposed to make money out of it? This is what it's all about, it seems like. I find it very disturbing. I know what's going on. Like I said, I lived here since 19, from the early 50s. So let's get back, like Constable Kane indicated. We gotta talk to each other. The city departments, they don't talk to each other. Each department has to say, and then they bring it before council, and nobody seems to know what's going on. 
even with Métis Trail. I indicated to you, uh, Mr. Mayor, no, I'm just mentioning to you, they don't want to buy my land. They want to put in a two lane for the price what it's worth. Mr. Fox. No, I'm just indicating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can go on and on. Look at the stuff in Bonus, same thing. The code said you need two excess or two excess, but it seems like the, that the city is breaking their own codes a lot of times, and they shouldn't do that. But what I'm saying about all this is the, we should get back what Constable Kane indicated. Like I've been indicating so many times here at City Council meeting, the zoning, look at the uh, house that was supposed to be having a, a secondary suite. There was no windows in, a, in the basement. How can you even look at putting in a suite? No alley, no nothing. No, I'm just indicating these things, Mayor. Mm -hmm. I mentioned these things to you before, but Mayor and Alderman and City staff, let's take the bull by the horn and let's get back to good common sense. That's what it's all about. Not for charging monies that they shouldn't be charging. We should drop all the fees, l uh, uh, more than half, and get back and work for the taxpayers, not for whoever you're working for. You know what I'm saying about that. <clears throat> so let's get rid of the shenanigans and get down to business. If, if there's any questions, I'd like to answer them. Thanks, Mr. Feck. No uh, questions? I don't see any. Thank oh, you. I don't know why. Thanks. Anyone else like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else in favor? Anyone like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Thanks for waiting, Mr. Chandler. I must say, after waiting all day, uh, you guys deserve a raise because each and every one of you, regardless of what stripe you are, because that was mind numbing. And uh, <laughs> you guys do a pretty oh, good Mr. job Chandler. going through Mr. all Chandler, that stuff. Mr. Chandler, that was above average. <laughs> wow. I guess I realize now when Shane and Peter tell me how exciting city council is, they're lying. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity. Those, for the record, my name is Craig Chandler, and uh, today I'm. Uh, addressing you in the capacity as the executive director of the Progressive Group for Independent Business, Calgary's largest business and taxpayer organization. This is such a big issue to several of our members that I felt the letter to you was not adequate. This is only the second time I've ever addressed city council in any manner since PGIB has been operating in Calgary since 1995. PGIB represents a number of bars and restaurants in the city ha that have recently been or will be adversely affected by this bylaw amendment. The report which created the bylaw amendment and the amendment which was approved by the Calgary Planning Commission on or about March 17, 2011 is and will be a detriment to business during Stampede and well beyond. There are many business owners who have spent thousands of dollars making arrangements for the Stampede and are locked into contracts with entertainment, food and more. Currently, these businesses have received building permits for the Stampede initiatives. However, what some are realizing in horror is the City of Calgary Development and Planning Department is currently enforcing and will be enforcing this bylaw amendment and is making all applicable tents apply for a development permit, notwithstanding that they already have a building permit. This is more bureaucratic red tape and frustration for business and will elim eliminate many of the plans already made as the development process takes eight weeks and there's also an appeal process which could result you know, in another 12 weeks or as Alderman Lowe discovered earlier, a stay of the permit even three weeks is unfair to those that have contracts already in place, and I don't think that's being taken into consideration at all. Further, any business owners are complete, many business owners are completely unaware because City Hall is at a snail's pace going through the list of stampede tents that have already, already been approved for a building permit. The Calgary Stampede attracts hundreds of thousands of tourists and has a dramatic impact on our economy. This particular amendment is nothing but a war against fun. I ask you to not only consider the ramifications this will have on businesses and contracts already in place, but the loss of monies this will be creating for thousands of Calgarians. In fact, there are several of our members whose establishments will be put out of business by changing this process. With our pocketbooks constantly being punished year after year by City Hall, we are hoping that you will not be eliminating jobs and thus people, people's ability to pay the continued tax hikes we see from this room. Any questions? Thanks for being here. Um, Alderman Carra and then me. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Chandler, for deigning to appear before us and dealing with it. Um, I guess two questions. The first question uh, coming out of your presentation is that I think your, the PGIB's position is that there is significantly more impact to these, this proposed DP than we've heard today. Yeah. Do you want to address that sort of discretion between what we've been presented by administration well, and it, what you're stating will be the case? Yeah, there, there's a lot, and I've been educating some of our members. They have building permits, and they've went ahead and done all these plans. And they've, they've made all these contracts. Some have fine country singers from Nashville. They're locked in the contracts, and they had no idea that there's going to be this development process phase, and they might get turned down. And if they do, well, they're out all this money. And for some of them, uh, you know, it's been it's been rough, and uh, they're they're making ends meet, and this is enough to to put the nail in the coffin with some of their businesses. So, uh, I think what hasn't been talked about here is contracts that are in play, and and, and you know, Alderman Lowe's referenced it. You know, it's May. Well, they've they've made their plans well well in advance, and this might be something to delay till next year or something, where you can you know, give give some businesses a little more notice. But right now, for this particular stampede, there are people who have already have contracts in place, and this is going to have ramifications that I don't think has been thought about. And that's really, you know, I hope hope that answers your your question and our position on that is is that it's going to adversely affect people. So I guess what you're saying is that. Um the, the chart that we saw from administration saying that this is really only going to affect four or, you know, a couple tenths, what was the number, six, six tenths in the city is not correct. And uh, it's not, cor it's not correct at all. We even have some members that have customer appreciation events uh, related that have food and liquor available at that time, and, and, and they may not be able to do it at all as well. So okay. it, it really does seem to be this war on fun and war against business. And, and, and yes, it, it's going to affect much more. And, and industry was consulted, yet I talked to people from the chamber. I talked to people from BOMA. I talked to you know many people in our executive and, and many members of our organization. And it's funny because we were never consulted. Not anyone I talked to was. So industry really wasn't brought into the equation here. Okay, well, I look forward to asking administration about that discrepancy once uh, we're done with the public hearing. Great. My other question for you uh, is the same question I asked uh, the constable. I mean, I'm a, I, I think there's a lot to be said about working proactively with all these groups, finding the best solution, working with communities. I'm hugely about that. Is land use the best tool, or is there a better tool to use? I, I think that's a fair question, and I'm not necessarily sure of that. Uh, uh, that answer, but uh, but industry like us is willing to work with with anyone who wants to to find out if if we can use a, a different department or, or a different uh, application to to address these issues. But uh, again, I think a lot of it right now, and our concern is it's about timing, and stampedes around the corner, and there's there's a lot of worry right now, and I think it's it, it shouldn't be that way because we're coming to a celebration, and and Calgary stampede is a great time for everybody, and I just don't think the war on fun should be entering council chambers. That's all. Thank you. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, besides the contracts and things, you had mentioned that there were building permits that are in place and have been approved. Is that uh, you're, you, you have knowledge of some that have applied for a building permit and have been approved? Yeah. There are some, uh, Alderman Keating, that have received their building permits, have been approved, and they've been going on and operating just as if that was enough. And now it seems that it might not be, and there's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, I, I think, uh, again, maybe dealing with this next year would be, to be the right thing to do. And, and, and I don't object at all to, to what Alderman Carr was saying either, is that we need to stop, you know, to do things in the front end and work together and, and that sort of thing. I, I like a lot of what I've heard, but I think, again, it comes down to timing. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Keating. Alderman Marr. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Chandler, thank you for coming, and again, thank you for your patience. So you've got a uh, different opinion on building permits and development permits. You understand, I know you do, that there is a difference between the building permit, which is really just about the structure, yeah. um, the size of the tent, and, and these types of things, whereas the development permit in which a process that we used to have used to require a couple of years ago, if somebody was going to do an event tent, then they would simply have to tick some extra boxes about how they would mitigate some of the challenges surrounding the, uh, the event in Washington, for, for example. Uh, the traffic would be another one, uh, lineups and things of that nature. Is that overly 
owners on a uh, on a business do you think I don't think ticking any extra boxes is onerous on a business, but government moves at the pace of molasses and snails. So I really don't think that uh, things are going to move quickly. It's just an extra, you know, couple of minutes of their time. It seems to be a whole new process, and a, and you know, our fear, and I could be wrong in this, but a, another level of bureaucracy and red tape. And government seems to cut red tape lengthwise rather than a half. And and unfortunately, it's a. That's that's our concern, but you make it sound so simplistic, uh, Alderman Meyer, and I don't think it is that. And that's not the perspective that industry is taking right no, now. No, and I appreciate that. I just wanted to get. And your we'd like to be consulted a little more, and maybe have a consultation process with industry, and we can again address it next year at some time. That might be great. Okay, but in theory, you you're, you're supportive of the idea of of our trying to understand how different events would mitigate things like human waste and these types of things. Sure, I'll give you that. Okay. In theory. In theory. So I just have gone through, South Calgary Community Association has got a, a new, or not a new, their, their major event thing. Uh, it's about a 300, 350 person tent um, for what they're calling indulge. And I just walked them through that in a matter of a few days, going through the building permit and the development permit for this event. And it didn't seem too onerous. It is exactly uh, a fun event. It's a community-based event, and it is in the middle of a community, in a community uh, association area. So I, I think that it is possible to, to make sure that we're able to deliver these types of things, and the community was supportive of the idea of trying to mitigate all of the challenges that they would have because of the fact that it, it is not only located in a community, it's for the community. Yeah, I think you can't. I guess business sees things as different, and, and so do you probably. Of the community association and business are two separate aspects of things, and and I don't think you're going to be walking everyone through the development permit process. Unless you are, that might be great. That might be the solution right there if that's what you're going to dedicate yourself to doing. But I don't think that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we're concerned with the red tape and the bureaucracy that that we're going to be seeing, and uh, we're we're concerned about that. And uh, I understand. Again, we need to deal with things at the front end. There's a lot of great ideas talked about here. Uh, I'm not belittling that in any way, shape, or form. It's really a timing issue, and we're quite concerned that there may be some that have already spent thousands of dollars in getting things organized that may end up being turned down, and that would be a travesty. Because if it is if it is appealed, well, it's a stay of the permit. And guess what? It doesn't doesn't happen, and that might occur with some with some of our members, and that's a concern. Mm -hmm. No, uh, and you I know, they, they, they 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 got to feed the family, and they got to pay their property taxes because we got to keep City Hall going. Okay, so the next question that I have relates specifically to the policing standpoint. Yeah. So we have a letter from the Calgary Police Service and signed by the, the chief himself suggesting that this is something that we should be doing. How do you respond to that? <laughs> well, again, I think it might just be a timing issue. It's not necessarily something that, that's, that's bad now. And, and I don't think you're going to find any business owners in this conservative town that are anti-law and order. Uh, but I think the, because industry wasn't included in this consultation process that we didn't hear our side. And I think the letter might have been a little differently worded uh, if so. I mean, I really, I really don't think that uh, we were included, but you know, who's going to oppose the police on, on things like that? I mean, everyone's for law and order, but I, I don't think anyone looks at, looked at the industry perspective, which is why I'm here. I, I rarely make any addresses to you. You've mm -hmm. been here for years. I don't come to city council that often. I am because there's that much concern. So obviously, if I'm here making that presentation to you, industry doesn't see it the same way as the chief does. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Chandler, my recommendations, I've got some amendments that I was thinking of putting forward, and I worked with the planning department on them, and it's talking about what, uh, what Constable Kane suggested, which is a special team that we have. <coughs> it's working very well with our, our bar industry in solving problems before they start and after they start. I have to say that it's, um, it's a very cooperative uh, group that um, rather than taking an enforcement perspective, walks the industry through problem solving. It, it's brilliant. Um, but what I'm suggesting is a three week process so that it's, uh, it's sent directly to this team. It doesn't get circulated citywide. And the community, if they choose to have input, would have to have input within a certain time period. 
but it's it in my view is important for problem solving because what I've experienced is a reluctance to deal with issues until sometimes I mean not everyone sometimes they they require needing to address them so what's your thought on this amendment well not not objecting to, to what you're saying and not even objecting to what you're trying to do but three weeks, it's like saying, you know, the footbridge will only cost $25 million. You know, you can't always trust everything that government's going to say, and that's the business perspective on this issue. And we're concerned that ramming anything through in three weeks would, you know, it really, it really begs the question then, if you can do this in three weeks, you should be doing a lot more efficiently at City Hall too then. Well, I and think you're bringing up a good question. And, and if you want to open the door to that one, what's working really well with this team is everybody is sitting around the table dealing with a specific issue, simpler, sim, similar to our center, center city team um, that is working in planning. So I think you've got a point there. Um, what works so brilliantly with this team is they all are sitting around the table and they go through these permits and, and come up with some really great suggestions that perhaps the applicant hadn't thought of about lineups and what do you do with, with people who want to smoke, where do they go and smoke, which is a big issue. Um, so it's, it's really proactive and could save us money, taxpayer money, um, because we won't be having to uh, increase our police service during Stampede Week. It's crime prevention, really. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't object to that, and I'm not belittling what you're trying to do. I'm just necessarily saying the timing right now mm -hmm. isn't good. The in industry does not feel like they were consulted, and we talked to other stakeholder groups, and they feel the same way. So uh, I just think maybe having something to deal with this and streamline things and make them better next year might be the, the great time to do it. Uh, again, I, I applaud you know even the efforts of you responding, trying to make it three weeks, et cetera. I, but it, it really is, and and I, we did consult a, you know a lot of our members on this. It's it's the timing, and you know next year this this is this is a good thought, you know. But it's just timing. I think is is everything. Well, and you brought up a question that we can ask administration: is how many are already in the process? It's my understanding that they all are in the process now and are being processed now. So and and not with with delay. So um, I'm. Those are questions that I can clarify with administration. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Zamont. Mr. Chandler, do you know of any businesses that uh, were considering putting up a tent and decided against it after after hearing that this was coming along? Only only two that I talked to, but I haven't really. So looked, two that you know of. That I know of, but I haven't really looked and no, asked that particular question. That's an indicator. Um, are there any other businesses that will be affected that you know of other than bars and restaurants? Yeah, uh, there's a, a printing company that actually uh, wanted to just have a customer appreciation and uh, feels that the, the process isn't going to be handled quickly and adequately, and I think they're completely withdrawing from it. So it's something they normally did every year that the, well, their customers and their staff uh, won't be able to take part in this year. And, no, there. That's where I got the idea of the war on fun because that's the terminology that a private business had. This is well. This is a war on fun. So when you hear the uh, words city hall or city government and expedited process in the same sentence, what comes to mind to you? I've dealt with all levels of government as a lobbyist, and I really don't. Sorry, I, I, I have doubts. You know, I just. Anyone who's a business owner and signed the front of a check in their life, not just the back of one, will understand that when dealing with government, it moves at a snail's pace, and it just does. Um, at the beginning of this report, it had uh, the CPC had, no, had a lost motion asking for it to begin on September 1st of this year, rather than as of, uh, immediately after reading this, uh, the three readings. Would uh, that would suit your purposes? You think that would give businesses enough time to actually start planning? I think after this stampede would be a much more effective position. Uh, that's what I've heard from, from members, and uh, I do feel that uh, that's, that's reasonable because uh, it is after the stampede, and that's what the concern is right now. I'm not, I'm not saying again, uh, uh, Your Worship and, and, and Alderman, that uh, things that are being discussed here are bad. Uh, I agree with a lot of what I'm hearing myself as well. It's just the timing, and I think September might be a much better option for the industry. So really what you're getting at is you're suggesting that businesses like like to have 
a known process. They like to know consistency. They like to know exactly what's going to be happening. They don't like to be tossed curveballs. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Mr. Chandler, I wonder if um, part of the problem we have here is that there has been some misinformation on what's being proposed. And I can certainly see that there could have been, because I too was a little bit confused. But I mean, what we're talking about here only impacts huge tents, right? Tents over 3,000 square feet, over 3,229 square feet to be exact. Um, and it wouldn't at all impact your printing company and their customer Point of order. night. Mr. So, Ma Your mm -hmm. Honor, it actually affects the smaller tents as well in neighborhood, in neighborhood areas. I was going to say, and those that are in residential neighborhoods, which I can't imagine is a very large number. Well, and that's where administration came up with their number of six. So I guess my question for you is, do you think that the folks who have been expressing their concerns to you were worried that this was a broader, um, a broader thing than what is actually being proposed? I think, uh, I think a lot of our members who are in the, in the burbs as well, for example, Mackenzie Town, Mm -hmm. uh, who, who were going to put up some tents, uh, understand the, the whole complexity of the, and the range of issues. Uh, so no, I, I don't think there was a misunderstanding. Uh, there was just concern uh, about the timing. And that's really what it's all going to come down to. Uh, and, uh, and I'll say it enough times that, that people understand that it is, it is the timing. And, and that's, that's the real concern here for us. Well, you can certainly tell your printing company that unless they're planning on making a lot of money selling alcohol, their customer appreciation event shouldn't ha be impacted by this in any way. Well, w they'll believe it when they see it, but you know, still I have to, as, as you do your job representing your constituents, I do my job representing mine, and that's why I'm here today. Thanks, I appreciate it. Any other questions for Mr. Chandler? Thanks for being here, and thanks for sticking around all day. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this? Your Worship, uh, I'm the printing company. Um, my name is uh, Douglas McRae. Uh, I'm a partner of small business here in uh, in Calgary, uh, Continental Imaging Products. We've been a, a proud Calgary-based copier and printing company for over 30 years. For the past 10 years, we've held a customer appreciation event in the parking lot of our establishment. We've had a building permit in the in the past. This year, we were advised that we need to uh, procure a development permit to uh, hold the same, uh, uh, to get the same tent, and uh, that, that it was going to be a costly and time-consuming uh, process to get that development permit. Uh, during the, the 10 days of the, of the stampede, uh, it's a great revenue generator for the hospitality industry. For my business, I budget zero income. We derive virtually no revenue during those 10 days. The only thing that we have going for us in that, during that 10 days is the benefit of our customer appreciation event. It's very important to us. We're good corporate citizens. We completely support the Stampede as the greatest outdoor sh show on earth. We celebrate our cowboy co heritage and culture. <clears throat> and because we understand the bigger overall picture of $125 million of economic benefit to the city of Calgary and the boost of civic pride that it provides, we, prov we depend upon that annual customer event to strengthen our existing customer relationships and to build new ones. We have hosted this free event in our parking lot without any issue mm -hmm. for the past 10 years. This decision will have the unintended consequences of negatively impacting my business and my customer relationships on what it, in which it depends. I like your worship, what you said about, I'm confused as what problem we're trying to solve here. Oh, yeah. That we're starting, we're using a sledgehammer to swat a fly. I really feel that this is an inappropriate use and it's going to cost me and my business. And most businesses are not aware of this. I was not aware of this change until just very recently. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a, as much a timing issue as anything else. Had we known well in advance in our, in our planning process, yeah, we, we, we absolutely would have complied and, and take a look. I, I don't. Uh, I have no issue at all with what Constable Kane and his position is. We agree we're good corporate citizens, but this really impacts my, my business, and I ask all of you to carefully consider the ramifications. Where, where are you located, sir? We're located in the Beltline area okay. on 10th so Avenue. It shouldn't apply there. And how big a tent? Uh, it's, it, it, it hits the, uh, uh, um, the criteria. We, we were advised by the tenting company and by the building uh -huh. permit people that uh, we needed to have a development permit. 
You think it was more than three thousand square feet? I'm just I'm just trying to get my uh, head I, around I, this. So. It's it it would be smaller than three thousand square feet. Yes. Yeah. So you shouldn't be captured by this at all. So it's interesting to me. I, I'm ruminating. Sorry. It's interesting to me that you were advised of that because. Judging from how you're describing it, it's not a commercial event. It's a small tent. It's not in a residential area. One-time deal. And it's a one-time deal. And do you go late at night? We cut off at uh, 1130 at, at the latest. It's usually well well before then. It's interesting. Okay, I'm, I'm just – sorry, I'm, I, I don't mean to quiz you. I'm just trying to get my head around the messaging that's out the there. I questions, Your Worship. Uh, Alderman Lowe? Well, Your Worship, you actually went – most of the places, the list of questions I had were uh, – have you, did you make an application for a building permit? No, we halted the process at that point because uh, we were told that, that we had to have a development permit. Okay, so you also, have, have, we're also advised, just to further that, further that, is that we did not have to have a building permit or a development permit to proceed with the event as long as we didn't have a tent. So, ans, so again, going back okay, to my original yeah, I, position, I'm curious I understand that. Say so. I, I understand that. That's okay. So. But to my questions, you had you made an app or were going to make an application for a building permit. You stopped the process because you were told you needed a DP if you're going to have a tent. Did you make an application? Did you make a, 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 an application for a DP? I did not. No. No. We uh, the the application is my is my understanding is is that the development permit has a, a fee of something approaching four hundred dollars. We also have to have provide elevations, so there's there's a cost of developing those drawings to this to be submitted along with the uh, the application. It's a it's an onerous, tenuous process that I believe is is putting a burden on my my company. Okay, you've just answered three more of the questions, so I want to ask them. The um, the last question I have for you is, uh, how many nights during Stampede do you run this event? Single afternoon. One afternoon. Yes. And you don't know off the uh, July the 14th, and you're invited. There will be no tent. <laughs> Depending on what happens today. Oh, there will right, be no sir. tent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, and I think in response to uh, Mary Nancy, you suggested that you didn't know how big the tent was, but you didn't feel it exceeded 3,000 square feet. Uh, if I if I had to put, if I had to put a measuring stick on it, would be something in magnitude about three to four hundred square feet. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Marr? Your Worship, um, thank you very much. Uh, sir, I'd be happy to work with you on, your, on your, uh, your issue. Please make an appointment with my staff. Thank you. Alderman Marr. Um, he is, after all, your area alderman, so <laughs> he's not just being nice. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. Um, Alderman Farrell. Not a question, just a comment. I, I think you've really highlighted an issue that uh, it concerns me as well. Is we seem to have a lack of clarity around these tents, probably with the change of the land use bylaw. And, and so I think I'm, I'm glad you came today because there's certainly no intention that this rule was supposed to capture your type of tent. It was the long term. Um, party tents associated with commercial uses. So, good point. And Again, un unintended consequences. Yes. I, I think that that is, is beholden on, 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 on the city to really realize what the ramifications of some of the decisions are and how it impacts businesses. N no question. And I, I think it's also important that we have clarity within our departments on what we're trying to achieve with the bylaw. So if you don't fit within the bylaw, then um, that can be clarified without these changes today. Well, I think it would be important then to communicate that to the uh, the, um, the people that uh, uh, work in the building uh, permit department because they clearly told us that we needed a development permit. Obviously, yeah. We've had quite a few problems and certainly last year was, was uh, evidenced by several restaurants operating nightclubs with, and that's not even within their land use. So some clarity would be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Zamong? How many years did you say that you had uh, operated this tent? For the past 10 years. For the past 10 years. And just the sheer thought of having to go through a development permit process. No, we, we, we've always got a, um, uh, a building permit for no, the tent. No, the sheer thought of going through a development permit process. We, we, we were told by the building permit that we had to go through no, a no, development. No, no, I know. Yes. The thought of having to actually go through that. Yes. 
had you running scared. Do you think there's any other businesses that basically were in the same situation as yourself? I believe anybody that uh, went to, to uh, hire a tent would, would go through the same uh, process, yes. Would, would have the same thought process as well? Yes. Turn around and run? Yes. Okay. Um, Particularly when you're formed by the building department that you don't need any form of permit to hold the party if you don't have a tent. <laughs> Which I find very intriguing. Um, would, if, if they had said, you know what, we're looking at doing something that's going to be starting for next year, would that have made a difference to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I could budget for it. I could plan for it. Uh, we, we feel that, that this was a, a, a change that we were completely uh, ill-prepared for. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Zhuang. Oh, Alderman McLeod, did you? Well, thank you for recognizing me. Most of my questions have been answered. I'm just very curious that when something hasn't even come to council, it's just being formulated at committee, how administration deal with that and I guess that's probably not an answer for no. you, a question for you but I I'm quite intrigued that somebody from administration would say you need a development permit well, I have the same question Alderman McLeod and when we get to questions for administration I think we should ask it um, because this is so we just done a little uh, we've done a little uh, looking here sir just FYI yes and I and I made a flow chart which I think is very helpful um, to me so I'm just going to abuse my time while you're standing there. Thank you. And suggest to you that um, what's being proposed today is basically this. It, it starts with the size of the tent. If the tent is over 300 square meters, about 3,000 square feet, what's being proposed is you need a development permit process. If it's between 120 and 300, so between 1,200 and 3,000 square feet, not in a residential area, no development permit. In a residential area or close to a residential area, development permit. If it's under 1,200 square feet or 120 square meters, regardless of where it is, no development permit is required. And this is only for commercial tents. So there's a question as to whether yours would be considered commercial or recreational. Recreational, not, not required. So, I mean, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is it sounds like you're not captured under any of these. Uh, and if you were informed that you would have been, it's a question we've got to figure out because it sounds like the information has not, the correct information has not been getting out. If that so is you case, don't really have to answer that. But <laughs> all, all, all I have is my experience, Your Worship. I hear you. And so you did, in fact. So the real question is, so you went, how long ago? You went to get your building permit as you normally would have every year? Would have been about four weeks ago. About four weeks ago. And at that time, you were told by the folks at the front desk? Yes. That you've got to go ahead and do this. And, you're, and did you say the people from whom you rent the tent told you the same thing? Yes. Okay. That's helpful for me to know. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Alderman Putmans. Yes, there, I noticed there was a, an extensive list of industry um, uh, event and tent industry companies. Which I think this is an okay question to ask. Uh, would you mind sharing which? No, it's not. Forgive me. I'll just pull that right back, and that's ten seconds of your life you're not going to get back. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I'll be choking for that at the end of the, end of the highway. <clears throat> what, what surprises me, though, is there isn't anybody here from the tent industry, uh, uh, as far as I can see, to get up and speak to, speak to you, because they're the ones that are going to be the greatest impact. Thank you. I'm the printing guy. Well, we're not done the public hearing yet. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Worship. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this? Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? Oh, we got two. Who will get there first? <laughs> well, I wanted the last word, but I guess I... Uh, you got to be elected mayor for that. <laughs> Your Worship and Alderman, my name is Christopher Soster, and I'm a lawyer in the city of Calgary, and I have been retained and represent a number of establishments that, uh, like my friend, have concerns uh, in relation to the proposed amendment. Uh, I've had the benefit of sitting back and listening to all of the submissions, um, and what I took out of it is that there appears to be some confusion, and I particularly confused because I understood that the reason we were here was because of noise complaints and as well per behavior. Now when I was perusing the material that was provided in the report, there was an indication that noise is not addressed in the development permit process. I'm also confused because um, the Honorable Mayor Nancy pointed out that we're dealing with those tents that are over 300 square meters Yet on page four of the report, it states that there is no consistent 
consistent evidence indicating that size or location is related to tent complaints. So we're targeting tents about 300 square meters, yet there's no evidence that that is a source or genesis of complaints. What we are targeting is the operators and how they operate their businesses. And we're trying to do this through an indirect method of the development permit process, through the land use process. There already is existing mechanisms to address this. We already have the business license hearing process. If you have an operator that's operating its business improperly, you have a business license review. I've been uh, representative for uh, restaurant and bar open owners that have been through that process, and it's a very effective process in, in meeting those operational deficiencies. We also have the building permit process. In the building permit process, the operators already deal with AGLC. They already deal with the fire marshals. They already deal with public health. And the vast majority of operators also take the proactive approach of addressing Calgary City Police. We're looking at a situation where there was somewhere between 30 and 40 complaints in a city of 1.2 million people. Yet there is no indication that those complaints were by one individual, two individuals, three individuals. It could have been the same individual complaining a dozen times. There's also no verification that those complaints directly, directly relate to tents. It's anything within 150 meters. So we're dealing with unreliable, unverifiable evidence of complaints to even get to this process. I'm going to echo the comments of Mr. Chandler in that this is a timing issue. If there are concerns, then we need to take a step back and we need to look at other creative solutions. Just because the, the development permit process was in effect years ago doesn't mean that it's the proper and most effective use of taxpayers' monies, nor is it the most effective way to deal with this issue. We need input from industry members. We need to look at creative solutions to noise. We need the involvement of CPS. We need the involvement of, Alberta, of, of the health authorities to address these issues, but we need to do it in a timely manner. A timely manner taking into consideration how close Stampede is. So in support of the individuals that have uh, asked me to speak today, uh, the most responsible approach is to delay this until September. Take a look at these concerns. Take a look at the most proper mechanism to implement uh, and control for these issues. Uh, and then make an informed decision as to whether or not the land use is the most proper vehicle. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Farrell? Thank you. I didn't catch your last name, sir. Souster. Souster. Mr. Souster, who do you represent today? I can't tell you that. That would be a breach of solicitor client privilege. But we usually have a solicitor represent a particular client and they name the client. You're saying a number of organizations, but you can't say who they yes. are. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Anyone else for Mr. Souster? All right, thanks for being here today. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Good afternoon, Your Honour and Alderman. I'm Fred Hansford. I'm the tent manager with Good Time Party Rentals. We represent, or I represent, one segment of the rental industry. With the passing of this proposed law requiring most tent functions to apply for a development permit will have an adverse effect on our rental and event industry as it creates a very time-consuming and costly procedure to our customers. Uh, to reiterate a little bit earlier, uh, the point comes up of timing. It's taken six to eight weeks to get this processed with no guarantees that we may receive a permit then we still have to apply for our building permit, which takes another 10 to 12 days to uh, receive. Um, so I feel this whole process is in using the land use bylaw is the wrong way to process the permitting of special function tents. I agree that we need some control and some effort made by the 
industry uh, to make it work, but I think there's got to be a special new system that's put in place to allow for tents. Um, our, I understand our sister city, Edmonton, uh, any tent required up there, any permit, they don't require a permit for any tent if it's three days or less. Um, they don't require development permits on their tents if it is part and parcel to their land ownership. So if I lease a place and I want to have a tent function on my property, I'm allowed to do it with a building permit if it's over three days. The only time they have, have to uh, uh, apply for a DP is if they don't physically own the land. Uh, we've got one prime location downtown, the 4th Avenue, or 5th Avenue and 4th Street. Uh, it's a parking lot. A lot of people use it for um, oil well servicing companies use it for appreciation, customer appreciation. Um, there is a bar, I think, on one side of it during Stampede. And that's the event that would have to apply for a DP. Uh, but other than that, Edmonton, as far as I know, you just, you can carry on. They work with their fire departments. Uh, we work with our fire departments. The building permit triggers this whole process, the fire department, the health, uh, et cetera, all get triggered. So if we create the special officers or the special uh, codes officers, they can be involved in that trigger point too, and then carry on from there. But it's very onus or very time consuming. Um, customers just detest going to City Hall. I do myself. It takes two to three hours sometimes just to apply for the permits. I've sat in there for an hour and a half one day, and then it took another hour and a half at the counter. Uh, that's pretty well all I have to say. Um, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't catch your name. Fred Hansford. Hansford? Thanks, Mr. Hansford. Uh, there are a number of questions for you, and I've got one too, but let's let these guys go first. Alderman Lowe. Mr. Hansford, thank you for being here. The uh, You manager of tent operations for... Good Time Party Rentals. Good Time Party Rentals. Okay, thank you. Were you told by the city, I'm going to use quotes around the city, that the, the development permit requirement was there? I was invited to the meeting back in February uh, over this, and I knew there was a possibility of this coming down the pipe, uh, but I didn't know it was going to come down this fast. Uh, and the process, when we were informed about it, was they were targeting specifically the large function beer tents, et cetera, for Stampede, leaving most of our customers alone. They wanted specific customers to be targeted. Have you advised any of your potential customers of the requirement of for a DP? Yes, I advised every one of ours that there is a possibility that you may be required to have a DP because the clarification over the last month has been terrible. I've had numerous customers phone and say, what's going on? They won't approve my building permit because they're waiting for a May 9th meeting to get the DP processed. So I've had cancellations, reductions in tent size, and some events said, hey, I'm not going to put up with this. I'll just use my warehouse. Why rent a tent? I don't need a tent. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Alderman Farrell? Thank you for being here today, Mr. Hansport. Uh, were you, how long have you been in this industry? I have been in the industry since 1987. Oh, so long time. Now, Previously, when we required development permits for tents, how did that work? Is this different approach that you're seeing this year or? Yes, it was totally different this year. In the past, only the very large venues were told that they needed to have a DP. Mm -hmm. The little one-offs that said, oh, okay, I'm gonna have a staff appreciation. 
you know, we had to apply for our building permits and go through the process and get everything done. But now they were told, I got to get a DP and they're just totally confused. So obviously we are too, <laughs> because that, that's not the intent of this land use change was to require the staff appreciation events to have a DP. Right. So I, it's good that you're here today because it, I, I think it highlights some of the frustration I've been feeling with this issue. Um, now, what I'm suggesting is something that is, um, is what Constable Kane had suggested, that we have this, I mean, we're not talking about the, the customer appreciation or the, the community events. And, and I think there's a lot of confusion, obviously, within City Hall as well as outside of City Hall. But what I'm talking about is the commercial, the t tents associated with commercial uses with a, with a liquor license. Um, that we would go through a, a streamlined process and obviously would have to get it right um, that would take about three weeks for that process. And whether it happens this year or next year, uh, it, it's probably, well, it's probably more streamlined than what you experienced before the land use bylaw change. Is that something that you would be willing to work Yes, on? the timing this year is just terrible because we're not that far away. People, like I say, I've had two customers. One has been told that depending on what happens at this meeting today, mm -hmm. they may be forced to go back and apply for a development permit. And are they They're associated with the They're a small bar restaurant? that has a very small tent. Okay, all right. Um, but as far as moving forward? And well, I agree that we need some process but I don't think it's the land use bylaw. There's got to be some other step that we get in there to regulate it or control it. Well, and that's certainly something up for discussion. Um, from what I understand, the land use bylaw is the only thing that will trigger this kind of process. So if there's a different way to trigger it, we can look at that. But it um, doesn't mean that the land use bylaw, that the process used for it has to be onerous. It can, mm -hmm. be, it can be streamlined. Yeah. We just need to understand what exactly we're doing, which sounds like there's some confusion. I apologize for that. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Zemong. You've been running tents for... Since about, I was in the years, industry in 1987. Years. I work for the current company since 01. I'm impressed. Um, then you must have heard many times before City Hall talking about streamlining its policies and procedures. Yes. And have you witnessed any of this ever when you go to get something done at City Hall? No. In 25 years? No. Okay. Um, you've mentioned that you've had cancellations. Yes. You are having a better year this year or a slower year this year? The year is better, uh, but every Well, considering the recession is, of the last yeah, few years. Yeah. Gotcha. It has um, improved. I, I'm under the I, my, my understanding is that there is a or there was a major tent. What do you refer to yourself? Constructor tent seller. Somebody in the tent industry recently went under. Yes. Um, I'm not necessarily suggest you know anything about it, but would you know anything about it? Did that have Did that have anything to do with the pos? Well, if we're losing industries and businesses simply because of the concept that they're going to be losing businesses, I would like to know about it. Um, it possibly could have, but I can't answer that intel intelligently. Fair enough. Okay. No, that's, I just, I mean, just the concept of it kind of scares me. Um, so basically you're suggesting that it's, it's mostly been the communication, the concept of actually this process isn't your favorite idea, but something could be done, but it's been the communication process in this that's really caused you most of the problems. Yes. Okay. So you would be in agreement as well to say, you know what, if we're going to do this, we should be doing this on a going forward basis, not to be slamming it down our throats right away. Yes, and kind of trying to come up with a different solution to do it. Something, an application for a special function tent, but not our tents, are consistently the same tent day in and day out. Mm -hmm. 
we supply the same information every time we apply for a DP um, building, building permit. permit, the same paper, time and time again. Okay. And it's just time consuming, costly, and ineffective as far as I'm concerned. So even something along the lines of, say the suggested development permit process, but let it apply for a three year period or something along those lines? I have already received three and five year permits on different locations. And yes, it works, but it's still time consuming. Okay. Uh, the process is just unbelievable required for applying for a DP. You mean going through City Hall isn't oh. fun? <laughs> yeah, pages of it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. You're giving us all kinds of ideas up here, so thank you. <laughs> I welcome. appreciate that. But I, I mean, I think I just heard you say, and just um, correct me on this if, I'm, if I heard incorrectly, but the, the, even the building permit process is maybe not the correct process for your business because it's the same darn tent. So every single time you have to go, it's fire retardant, it's the same size as it was last week, and so on and so yes. on. I agree. Uh, okay. There's a various sizes of tents, but yes, time and time again, we submit the same drawings and they need the elevation drawing, they need how you're gonna stake it, they need the fire code regulations, and you need three copies of it, just I, for the building permit. You need Three eight. new copies every time. Yeah, you need eight for the development permit. I had, a, um, I had a, a little tent during the election last year, and we had fun with that one too. How heavy are the sandbags? Do you have the receipt from the fire retardant chemicals? Yeah. I'm still not convinced that I've recovered from those fire retardant chemicals. But um, before I go to Alderman Karai, just uh, since I've got you, I have a question for you just relating to the structure of the stuff that you sell. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got my head around the sizes we're looking at here. So just give me a sense. Um, of the tents that you would rent during Stampede, how many are bigger than 300 meters? What proportion are kind of 120 to 300? And what proportion would be smaller than 120, just roughly? Uh, we we range in size anywhere from a 10 by 10 up to a 60 by that's expandable. We can go up to three, 400 feet if we wanted to. Most uh, average businesses and customers are using between the 10 by 10s up to um, 40 by 60s uh, feet, feet, pardon me. Uh, we do have some customers wanting them uh, in the larger uh, sizes and for the whole period of stampede. But a big tent would be the 40 by 60, you think? for No, 60 by 300 or something like that. That's a giant tent. Yeah, we have yeah. a couple that are requesting 40 by 180s, 40 by 100s. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just getting my head around this because a 40 by 60 is about 2,400 square feet. I can't believe I just used my calculator for that. It's about 2,400 square feet, which is smaller than what we would be looking at here. Okay, that's helpful. It just helps us to get our heads around that. Alderman Carra? Well, I think between Alderman Farrell's questions about the previous DP permit, uh, Alderman DeMong's questions about sort of the streamline, I was going to go into the building permit side of things and talk about and you went there, so I've got nothing to say. Okay. But I think this has been a productive discussion. Well, certainly some ideas are running around my brain, Alderman Crow. Alderman Keating? Thank you, Worship. And I, I think we're, we're going to go down that road because I had the same number of questions even before I started making the notes. Um, should we not have an absolutely separate bylaw for special use tents? We can address all of these issues. It's very simple, clean, cut, and done. That would be perfect. I knew I was brilliant. Thank you. You're not the only one who knew you were brilliant, Alderman Keating. Alderman Chabot. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks for being here, first of all. Um, so are you um, pretty familiar with what's being proposed here as far as amendments? It is, but it's still very confusing. Like, to try and read your bylaws is almost impossible for a common guy like me. Mm. Yeah, well, I think there's a number of people that struggle with the land use bylaw. Um, you almost have to have the actual land use bylaw in front of you to see what it says, what it is that we're amending. And I actually asked for it to be called down, to brought to me, and brought to me because it says 
The following developments do not require development permit if the conditions of section 24 are met. And, and then it goes on to a number of other specifics. And what's being proposed is some amendments to some of those specifics that would not require a development permit. But it does talk about unless it's adjacent to a residential or if it's not being used for a drinking establishment, large drinking establishment, medium. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different criteria in here that wasn't, wasn't in the land use bylaw previously. Um, so it's not strictly 300 meters. The 120 meters plus certainly has a number of trigger points as well. Mm -hmm. Depending on where it's located. And, and not just that, but the type of use. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and this is recreational special function tents that I'm looking at here. A special function tent commercial, actually special function tent commercial. Um, I don't know, I'll have to continue going through this to see if I can figure it out myself, but as it stands, it looks like it's significantly uh, more specific than it was previously. It does involve mm -hmm. quite a bit of change. So anyways, thank you for being here today. Thanks, uh, Alderman Chabot. Any further questions? Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this? Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? Your Worship, Council Members, my name is Adam Carr. I'm President of Majestic Tent and Event. I completely agree with everything Fred said. Um, the printing guy was Fred's a customer, and his tent was 800 square feet. Um, any questions? I don't want to repeat everything he said because it's getting late. You're my best friend right now, <laughs> Mr. Carr. Um, Alderman Chabot. Yeah, there is a question I wanted to ask the previous guy, and in regards to your tents, some of your tents, the smaller ones, they can be connected up to form a larger tent? Yes, yes, they can. So 10 by 20 could end up being a... Yeah. 10 by 500 or whatever? Yeah. Okay, so even though it may be a smaller tent that's ordered originally, they could be added to yeah. form a, a larger tent. Yeah, we typically don't do that. It's too labor intensive. If, it get, if they want big, we just go into the bigger tents. Okay, it's just that I've seen a, a number of the smaller, like 20 foot ones. I don't know how wide they are, but added a whole bunch, a whole bunch of them added together to form a much, much larger tent. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any further questions? I think we may have gotten them all out. Do you want to just um, take a stab at the question I asked the previous speaker around in your business? What percentage of the tents that you rent out would be fit into this greater than 300 square meters or 3,000 square meters? Everything. It's, it's vague. It's totally vague. Like, I don't even understand it. And we've had ones denied that are under the square footage. I mean, if 800 square feet was denied at the print shop, I mean, everything's subject to it. Like, I don't know if pop-ups are going to be next. And and I, I just want to go out on a limb, but I don't think it's the tents. I think it's the alcohol that's making people break the noise bylaws and act crazy. I don't disagree with you. There is a problem because the tents don't have walls that can keep the sound in, but, yeah. but I hear you. But it is stampede, right? I mean, it's 10 days out of the year. It puts us on the map. Millions come into the economy. I mean, people should just suck it up. <laughs> and, and 28 or 26 complaints is nothing, really. I mean, it, we are living in a city. This isn't some rural area, you know? I mean, if they want peace and quiet, they should move into the country. Could you come back often to our public hearings? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> I suspect a number of members of council would have liked to have just recorded what you just said. And yeah, no, it's, and it's just, it's craziness, it's this whole thing. Uh, like, I don't know. I don't know what was spent on it. Like, I don't know how much taxpayer money. <laughs> and it is hurting the industry, for sure. For sure. It is. Yeah, so. we've, we've, had, we've had numerous ones. Like, tents is what I do. Mm -hmm. That's my bread and, and so butter. So since, since this talk started earlier this year, you're getting cancellations already? Oh, yeah. And we look like idiots. we got to go back to customers and say, oh, we actually had building permits approved. And then the city came back to us and said, oh, by the way, you're going to need some development permits now. So we had to go to our customers and say, oh, uh, we need another $700 for us to pull this for you. A lot of them are not for profit, too. Okay. And, that's, and that's, a lot that's... of them are charities, too, and they don't have a lot of money to work with. 
you know, for stampede breakfasts and the like. But yeah. it, I mean, that's more not for profit. But I, I'm concerned about the charitable events. You know, there's a lot of those runs and stuff. And if they're forking out, like on average, a development permit, we're charging eight, nine hundred dollars for it. If we're for if they have to fork out that sort of money, I mean, that's money that could have went to a charity. But instead, it's, you know, paying us to measure up and do drawings and take pictures and fill out eight duplicates right. of everything. And because it costs you four hundred dollars or so to apply for the permit. But then you have work to actually do to, to yeah. do the permit. Yeah, exactly. Like we do need just a form that we can fill out that's specially for events. You know, and then if it looks if it's a bar, it raises a red flag. It goes in one direction. If not, it goes in another that's, that's actually extremely helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Alderman Farrell? Thank you. So are you suggesting, or is your experience that um, a charity tent has been told at the counter that they need a development per permit? Because what you just said, you, your concluding statement was that if it's a bar, it goes into a different stream. That's exactly what we're proposing here. Yeah, not, I don't... Th not I that your charity, your charity events get mm -hmm. captured in this yeah i think the intentions were pure to slap the bars but i think it's the other people are going to get penalized as a result well that that's not the intent i'm i'm asking about your experience have they been required to apply for a development permit or is there just what i'm hearing is there's a lot of rumor and obviously a lack of clarity partly because when you read the land use bylaw it's mm -hmm. pretty confusing yeah but but it I really need to know, are you, are, are your customers who are not supposed to be captured in these amendments being yes. asked to supply? Yes. For from what, yes. From what I've been told, yes. I don't uh, directly pull the permits, mm -hmm. but from the information that came back to me, yes. So we would need to, if, if you're willing, it would be interesting to know exactly the specific. Yeah, for sure. I could get that information to do if you like. I think it's hard to move forward unless there's clarity. Yeah, Both I mean, even there. if we just, you know, if you guys gave us a little more rope, loosened up the noose a little, mm. I, I think it would be better. Well, and I think some people who live by these things, we would, they'd like to tighten the noose a little, or they'd like to have good neighbors. That's really all it is. So how do we balance that? Yeah. That's, the, that's the challenge that we're going to be faced today, is yeah. how to balance that. Cause but, sorry? It needs to be reasonable. Yeah, like I avoid permitting like the plague. I try and get others to do it within my company. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it, if I'm not mistaken, we're going off construction permits for events. Are we not? Well, it depends on the type of event. But so. I, uh, yeah, what I'm saying though is we should probably have a permit that's for events. We should have our own done up and then it can go from there. Yeah, and I think that's that's certainly what we're trying to do. So clarity, yeah. ease of, of uh, process is what mm -hmm. you're really talking about. Yeah, and this three-week streamline development permit thing is, we haven't come across it yet. We're six to eight weeks. We're uh, being told that by people in the permitting department. So, yeah. And I think I, what, what we're talking about is something that's been suggested by our police that's working really well in other areas. Yeah. And it is just this one team mm -hmm. who would look at it. Now, so you've, you've identified some concerns. What if the police instead, I mean, if there was three noise complaints at a bar, they came out and gave them a massive fine or required bars to have more security on site. I mean, it's stampede. People are binge drinking. Well, and I think you're, that's exactly part you know? of the problem. Uh, sometimes hundreds and hundreds of people are binge drinking all in one location. But I, I think we'll come up with the solution. Um, it, it may not be in front of us today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Zemong? I just wanted to thank you for coming out and putting some extreme clarity on the situation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Alderman Zemong. Alderman Marr? Thank you, and uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, it seems to me that what we're hearing is a, a continuing theme from the industry. It's that the rules are not clear, that they seem to be changing uh, on you on a on a fairly regular basis and from a building per permit perspective it's always the same tent i imagine you have four or five different types of tents right yeah different sizes yeah. and 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 it's always the same and you, it's kind of you stake it into the ground and, and you off you go mm -hmm. so maybe we need to look at how this how this process is is being brought for the city but 
our problem here from a governance perspective is, is that we're, we're faced with the after effects of some businesses and some events that don't go according to plan, that haven't planned out how to mitigate some of the challenges of having an event in a community or on a street or these types of things. So are you generally supportive of us moving forward with a plan which would see a checklist saying how do you how do you perceive that your your event and your industry will be able to to work through being able to manage some of these challenges and also work with us as a municipality how we would sort of tailor ourselves understanding that this one size fits all mentality doesn't work is yeah. that is that something that that is interesting yeah. there's no chance you guys would just leave us alone is there or like on the permits altogether? Because I, ideally, that's what I would like. <laughs> um, but if not, we could definitely, I'm up for streamlining it, simplifying it, whatever it takes. I mean, really a tent application, we should be able to send a technical drawing, a flame certificate, um, address, times. Yeah, like it should be a one sheet Shoot it thing. off in an email. Yeah, and... or even apply online. Uh, right. Put a visa number on it, send it in. I mean, it's it shouldn't be so difficult. Mm -hmm. It really shouldn't. We shouldn't be rezoning land or... No, and I appreciate that. Uh, but we, as a municipality, we're only we we only have certain tools in our bucket that we're able to uh, that we're able to to manipulate. Your Worship, it's interesting that I would love to be able to have this discussion amongst us ourselves and with administration. It's quarter two at this time. I would like to uh, to move council. Yeah, uh, I don't know if there's are there any more members of the public. Uh, I will. Can you recognize me again if you, in one second, thank you. Thank you. The common sense that you're bringing is uh, refreshing uh, in these chambers. So um, we may, um, yes, I'm talking about, no. Um, <laughs> we, um, we may look to, uh, to you to help us get this one right, but thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this? Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? Good afternoon, Your Worship, Alderman. Uh, thank you for hearing me. Uh, so I'll make this quick. I just wanted to, I mean, most of everything's been said. My name is Lee Suter, by the way. I work for a company called Special Event Rentals. Can you just say your name again, please? Lee Suter. Yes. Um, so I think everything has been covered. I just wanted to touch on the cost of, of these and how this affects our customers. So the last, the last development permit that I, that I pulled, it was a couple of years ago for a client would have been about 800 and I, if I can remember correctly, it was about $850 is what we charged for, for, the, for the permit. The permit itself was about 650 and I charged about 200 for my time, and that was, that was being nice. Um, now, the city inspectors don't work evenings and weekends, which are, is, is when, uh, is, is when our, our business operates. So... To get someone out um, to inspect a tent, which they have very little knowledge or experience in, uh, costs about six six hundred and fifty dollars. This is a, this is for one event. We then need an engineer to sign off it, on it, which is another five hundred dollars. So you're getting up to around the two thousand dollar mark for one event, and that's fine if your your client has deep pockets. But I can tell you that it's very that it makes it very exclusive um, for for any charities or or anything running events. For example, I talked to a, um, <clears throat> a client today who is, uh, he actually just went through a build building permit, but because his event, his, his charity run is on a Saturday afternoon, he'll have to pay the $650 to get a, uh, an inspector to come out and look at his pop-up tents. Pop-up tents, like you buy it, Canadian Tire or, or whatever, and he's gonna sign off and say, yeah, that, they're okay, that you have the sandbags on them, that's great go ahead with the event. So that, that was my point, uh, because the, uh, the, develop, the, develop, the development permit is not just a matter of just ticking off boxes. There are a lot of costs involved and a lot of time. So, so it's not just time, it's money. It's money. And, that, and, that, and, that's, and that's very, very prohibitive for, for anyone. And it was, the other issue was, was the clarity that was, that was touched on. Because the size of the tents, and I, I don't think anyone has any objections to that, and, and uh, we want to make these events better, and we want to make them safer, but um, the message we're hearing from, from approvals is that even, even these small events um, require these permits, and that is putting a lot of people off. So. 
Thank you. Uh, Alderman Lowe? Very briefly, uh, sir. Yes, sir. The, the development, sorry, the building permits, do they also trigger the same inspections? The building permits trigger, trigger fire, health, um, and if there's liquor, they trigger, they trigger liquor. They, they ask you those questions do, do, during do, that. Do they trigger the uh, sign off by engineers and that sort of thing? Yes, they do. They do. So you, those costs are, are common to both the DP and the BP? Correct. Okay. Any, in, any, any event you have, that's, those okay. are the costs. But th those, are, those are safety related issues common to both? Correct. And what, that, what happens, even if your, your tent is, if it's 20 people and your, your tent is you know, 600 square feet, you're required to go, go through all that, that process. Okay, but for both the development permit and the building permit? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Your Worship. Very important clarification. Thank you, Alderman Lowe. Um, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this? All right, Alderman Marr. Oh, Alderman Stevenson, sorry. Did you want to go first? Okay, I think Alderman Marr uh, asked me to recognize him first, so I will. Thank you. So, Your, your, your Worship, this is obviously a very complicated issue, and I think that it would be us if we would have an opportunity to discuss this with staff now and advance the break right now to allow us to be able to do that, seeing if there is some sort of synergy that would that can be created here rather than going ahead and, and moving ahead with a referral. So what I'd like to do is uh, ask that we, we recess for, for the dinner break now to give us an opportunity to, uh, to discuss this. Can I make a different suggestion? You, of course. These poor folks from Bonas have been waiting and waiting and waiting. Can we bring theirs forward and at least dispense with that before dinner? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, that's, that, I think that's what I said. <laughs> But um, because you have a brilliant solution that we'll deal with in only 15 minutes, right, Alderman Craw? Um, Alderman Farrell, I just will look to you as the word Alderman. Thank you. Here. I'll um, I'll move to table this until the next item after the break, or the first item after the break, so that we can uh... <laughs> we can get our heads around it over the break. Yes. Okay. Alderman Chabot is seconding. Um, all right then, so the motion is to table this and come back after dinner now that we finish the public hearing. On that one, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, so then we will lift from the table automatically, I don't think I need a motion, um, the previous item. I don't think I do. You can make one if you like, Alderman Chabot. <laughs> motion to lift from the table. It's because the referral motion had in it the time to bring it back. Anyway, but nonetheless, we'll do it nonetheless. Alderman collier cart you're seconding that? Thank you. Are we agreed? Any opposed? All right, we're back to Greenwood Greenbrier. Um, and um, so I understand that the issue that, at, that caused us to table this earlier has in fact been dealt with um, and it doesn't require any further changes. So that's good. Um, we have the recommendations um, before us, the administration recommendations, they have been moved and seconded. So uh, time for debate or questions for administration on those. Seeing none, we have it on the floor already. So, sorry, Alderman Farrell, were you going to? So what's before us is the recommend, no, Alderman Lowe moved it. And I can't remember who seconded it. Oh, we tabled it even before we seconded it? And Alderman Pinkott seconded it. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I, thought, I didn't realize we had done that. So what we have before us now are the recommendations as per the report on page one of four of E-2011-03. And those are the recommendations to basically approve the change. And I understand there will be some amendments coming forth for second reading of the bylaw. All right, further questions, Alderman Farrell? Thank you for debate. I'm prepared I'm That's prepared fine. to support this. I know the community is concerned and they're using language that's actually quite exciting. They're they're citing some very important parts of planet Calgary and they're talking about complete communities. So the importance of the master planning process couldn't be highlighted more. And I'm hoping that we look at master planning more frequently. I know it's um, it's a lot of work. I don't know if we necessarily have to do the work, though, as uh, as the city, and and uh, I think we really have to look at at um, 
our existing rules and regulations and whether or not that is the condition for success in creating complete walkable communities. I'd suggest we need to uh, be a bit more flexible in this, lo in this location and, and throughout the city, frankly. And I have to say that I'm, I'm quite concerned that we're still using transportation capacities in order to determine our densities caps when we have been explicitly told that that would not be the case as we move forward. So that continues to concern me, but I'll support the recommendations. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Hodges, um, I have you, but I don't know if it's for the amendments or if you want to debate now. Well, Alderman Carra. Okay. Alderman Carra, then Alderman. Freezing heavily here. Today. Alderman Carra, then Alderman Lowe. <laughs> I thought I had controlled my heart rate admirably, but I guess not. Um, I just want to make the point, I want to reiterate uh, Alderman Farrell's point that you know, we're talking about something, but I don't think we can get he from here to there. And the fact that we're focusing on you know, densities and stuff like that, and we all saw what went up on the, uh, on the, on the table. And I mean, I think I, I want to just reiterate the pizza pie analogy. You can have a block of mozzarella cheese and a bunch of tomatoes and a bag of flour on the table, and that doesn't make a pizza pie. And I think if you want your communities to be comfortable with what's coming forward, they want to see the baked finished product. And so the fact that we're sort of slowly slipping towards something that may or may not be what we're trying to achieve, you know, we have to know what we're getting. And we could get any number of things. So I'm, I'm very leery of this process and I'm very looking, and I, and I feel bad for the developer too. I think the developer and the community are pitted against each other rather than working collaboratively. I appreciate uh, the alternative process that Bonas brought forward because I think it's exactly what we're talking about with the innovation project. And I think having an idea of where you're going is essential because if you start making decisions now, then you're locked in. And then when you get down to the detailed design stage, I mean, we heard it from our own planner saying, well, we hope at some point that it might turn out like that. Why, not, why don't we say what it's going to turn out like and then back out to the land use that, that supports it? Um, I look forward to Alderman Hodge's uh, amendments. Thanks, uh, Alderman Carra. Alderman Lowe? Oh, not yet. Um, Alderman Hodges? Thank you, Worship. Well, this has been an interesting process, to say the least. I, uh, I do uh, uh, have a bit of feelings for those members of council who haven't visited this issue before. Uh, for myself, uh, this is the fourth go-round on this site. There have been uh, about three previous owners, and they've all had different ideas about the site. The most uh, innovative, in a way, was the Health Park proposal, Gimbal Health Park proposal in uh, uh, 1995. Um, earlier, uh, some of you are feeling a little put upon that uh, this has taken a while to get this far. In uh, uh, 1980, I waited for two days to speak to a public hearing proposal on this site. That was in the days of uh, a company by the name of Day On Development, who aren't in existence anymore. The, uh, uh, the recession uh, of the early mid-80s uh, took them down, and all the borrowing they'd done, I take it. Uh, so later, there were other proposals, none of which proceeded. I think probably this proposal is in terms of modern day planning, is uh, the most uh, practical uh, to date. Uh, it's stage two of uh, a, uh, the properties that the Melcor development own in the area. And uh, it uh, fits uh, with their uh, stage one proposal, which was approved in uh, 2007 uh, by the previous council. So, it, no matter which proposal has come forth on this site, they've all been controversial. And they've all taken some time to uh, sort out. And this one's taken a little bit of time to sort out as well. I think, as uh, Alderman Carra has just mentioned, one of the uh, most uh, promising things that's come out of this uh, um, exercise is uh, the suggestions made by the uh, Community Association of uh, a better uh, public engagement process um, a different than what we have now, a better public engagement process, which they put in their letter uh, of late April. 
early May of uh, this year, uh, entitled Moving Greenbrier Forward, the BCA Point of View. It's attachment one in today's agenda. And I think uh, that process has some uh, um, hope uh, that should it be implemented one day, it uh, would be a more uh, productive process than this has been to date. It certainly would cut the time down of getting any kind of a uh, land use uh, application uh, in front of council. At least that's my view. Um, so, Your Worship, I have some amendments I'll put at uh, when we get to the bylaws. I have some amendments that need to be put and uh, some uh, further work, obviously, that needs to be done in the future on uh, what the public engagement process, how it can be improved in, uh, in the future uh, that wouldn't affect uh, this particular site, but which would affect uh, other applications uh, that uh, Council will hear in the future. Um, Alderman Hodges, uh, although you're not going to put the amendments now, it may be helpful for your colleagues who are voting if you just tell us what the tenor of them is. Yes. Uh, the first one I uh, got the hint from Planning Commission, uh, Mr. Sturgis, and uh, something that Alderman Farrell said she supported at Planning Commission. In fact, all Planning Commission members supported it. It will be a new uh, paragraph 8 in uh, the ARP. Uh, a master plan for the overall Greenbrier area shall be submitted with and form part of the first development permit application in the Greenbrier area, which shall be referred to the Calgary Planning Commission for review and decision. And since it's a new number eight, and that would mean renumbering the rest of the uh, policies in that part of the document. So Great. that's uh, one of them. Okay, thank you. Is that the only one? Uh, no. There is another one that I've uh, discussed with the planning department briefly and with uh, uh, the uh, landowner, and that uh, relates to the FAR in uh, DC Site 2. Uh, the bylaw he has a maximum FAR of 2, and everything that I've read, including the document submitted by the consultant for the uh, landowner, for Melcor, indicates an FAR of one. So my amendment would be to move from a two FAR to one decimal zero FAR, which is uh, in conformance with the, uh, app, with the uh, uh, site plan that has been submitted uh, as backup to this uh, application. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else before I call Alderman Lowe to close? Alderman Lowe? Very briefly, Your Worship, the, uh, the concept of a master plan, uh, it was supported at Planning Commission. I was hesitant to support it there. And I'll tell you why, as I'm increasingly worried about Planning Commission actually, uh, rather than being a technical review of planning matters, uh, planning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a significant concern, but nonetheless, it's a, it was a request that they put put it forward, and uh, it was passed. And I see that I did vote for it. I checked it. With respect to the uh, the FAR, I will not agree to that. I think we should permit a higher FAR. But having said that, speaking to amendments that are not put, I will close on the matter and ask for your support. And, and I'm going to echo some of what Alderman Farrell said. I, if you look at what's happened through this process. Given where this land is, given its constraints, given the transportation issues that surround it, given its location above the community of Bowness, and the fact that it's not really physically connected to Bowness, it's, uh, I think we've come a very long way. Uh, I worried when I saw those amassing drawings go up because they were instantly misinterpreted. They don't represent the end product at all. They represent a planning exercise that, that the plan, the uh, developer was going through to demonstrate the amount of parking, the mass in the buildings, and so on, and how to spread their commercial through the entire area. So that's uh, the risk we do when we hear it in public hearings get far too far down beyond the, uh, the land use that we're dealing with here. So on that, Your Worship, closed. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Therefore, on the recommendations before you, are we agreed? Any opposed? I am opposed. And Alderman Carras opposed.
All right, then, on first, um, which bylaw are you going to be amending, Alderman Hodges, both of them, or? It's the uh, first one is uh, bylaw 25P. 25P 2011. Okay. And that's the section with respect to the Greenbrier uh, area land use policies, uh, which is uh, a part of 25P. Okay. So first reading of bylaw 25P 2011, are we agreed? Any opposed? I am opposed. Alderman Carr and I are opposed. Now, Alderman Hodges. Before we get to second reading, you can table that amendment. Yes. Uh, um, I believe oh, Madam let's Clerk, just finish the vote, shall we? <laughs> I believe Madam Clerk has copies. A master plan for the overall Greenbrier area be submitted and uh, referred to Planning Commission when it's completed, obviously, with the first development permit uh, for review and decision and renumber the rest of the policies. I believe Madam Clerk has a copy of this. and. It's a uh, proposed amendment I, I worked out with the uh, law department and uh, with the planning department on uh, late Friday afternoon. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. On the amendment, Alderman Carra? Yeah, my only question is uh, council is now done with that then, with this amendment, and we don't see it again, and we just take it on as a matter of faith that planet is going to somehow miraculously congeal in this site uh, you know and with all due respect to Alderman Lowe uh, that massing model is what's permitted on the ground by a strict interpretation of the bylaw so if it doesn't reflect the end product it could very well reflect the end product and we we sort of just wash our hands and send it off um, is there any way to have council's eyes on this again? Is that desirable? I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely think a master planning process is, is important here. Ms. Jackal, do you have an answer to that question? Is there a way that council could have eyes on this again? Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I have to be that close, they're really powerful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Um, well, in the normal course, no. I guess um, normally council clearly uh, approves land use, and then um, development permits and subdivision subdivisions are uh, delegated through appropriate bylaws to the subdivision authority and, and uh, development authority. Um, I, I suppose one way of having it come back would be uh, not to approve the land use now and, and review it again um, with other supporting documentation. I'm certainly not advising one way or another, but that's really how you would get it back. Um, I don't know if you could give direction to, uh, to the uh, administration to bring it back for information, but I'm not sure what purpose that would serve. So. So basically, we delay the developer by holding up their land use, yeah. or we just hope that somehow our ability to do what we haven't been able to do really consistently is going to somehow happen on this matter through our current process. That's, that's a hell of a choice. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> um, Indeed. Uh, is there any? Yeah. All right. Alderman Carroll, while you're standing, I note the hour. Yeah. I'm just going to look around the table and see if there's interest in, amongst council in finishing off this item before our break. Yeah. Yeah, the, oh, seven now. All right, then. So in that case, I'm going to bang the gavel. And we will be back here at 7.20.
Thank you, Alderman Hodges. Um, and Alderman Hodges, you've still got the floor, I think. Your Worship, uh, given some of the uh, written and unwritten, unarticulated comments about my good uh, idea of uh, a master plan. It I was a good idea. In, yeah, pra well, it is. In, but in practical terms, we can't guarantee uh, the cooperation or expect Melcor to agree with the cooperation of those other two adjacent landowners. So I'm going to amend it, if uh, you will allow that. Uh, a master plan for the Melcor lands in the Greenbrier area shall be submitted and form part of the first development permit application. So uh, that they have a say in. Obviously, they're the landowner, and I think it's a more realistic than expect the other landowners to sign on. Okay with that? All right. So that's fewer than three words. You're okay with it. So I think I'm okay with it. No? No, actually? Uh, Your no, actually. Worship, if, unless I'm mistaken, the no, interpretation of the, of the procedural bylaw, it says a friendly amendment is okay as long as it's unanimously supported by council. Oh, you're going to make me look, aren't you? Oh, what the hell? Okay, we'll call this an amendment. Uh, we'll, yeah, okay, so council, do you agree? Well, any opposed? All right, that was easy. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. <laughs> so we've got that done. Only because I don't actually have my orange book within arm's reach. Um, but all right. Um, okay, so that is fine. Um, I think Alderman Kara, you had your go. Did you want your light is still on? Well, can I? No. D did we find some sort of resolution to the issue that I brought up right before we banged the gavel? No, of course not. But it was an important and thoughtful issue. Yeah, well, I mean, that's... And I was hoping that you actually came up with something over dinner, no? Will, will council see it again as part of the problem? No. No. And will there be any public consultation, sort of this advanced process with actual collaboration between the community and the developer? Your Worship, I appreciate the comments that uh, Alderman Carra has made. We've certainly been having discussions about how we can better deal with these regional and uh, um, community shopping centres. And um, so we're, we're looking at different kinds of solutions to the problem. It could be objective standards or more form-based controls on these kinds of areas. But I'm sure that Melcor is quite willing to have uh, discussions with the community as part of the master planning process. And I'm, I'm confident that we can bring some of the elements to fruition that you've identified in the, uh, in the meeting this evening under our present processes. Okay, and my only final com comment is that, you know, really within the context of a neighborhood, as it's contemplated within the MDP, the Melcor lands aren't the full neighborhood. You need the, you need the trailer court or the, trailer, the mobile home park and the, uh, the other cell to sort of really be that complete neighborhood. And so I was excited at the prospect that the whole thing would be sort of roughed out together and Melcor lands place within the larger neighborhood that will grow there would be considered. I totally understand the nightmare of trying to bring recalcitrant or reluctant landowners to the table, um, which is a shame. But I encourage the master planning process to uh, consider connectivity and the build out of the rest of the area because that entire plateau zone has to hang together as a complete neighborhood at some point. And also, Plateau Zone would be a really cool name for a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, does that help, Alderman Carr? I think so. All right. Alderman Chabot? Yeah. yeah, Your Worship, I, I'm trying to grasp what the intent is of this particular amendment. And uh, I don't know, I've, I've got all kinds of documentation on stage one and stage two of the Greenbrier development that lays out pretty much in detail what the, what the land uses are going to be on each individual section contained within stage one and stage two. So I'm not sure what administration would perceive this as, as meaning. In terms of the master plan? Um, we'd be looking more at the detailed design of the shopping area in particular as it relates to the entire neighborhood. So it would be more of uh, development permit level detail on the shopping center site and then how it would connect to the larger neighborhood. Okay. So, 
So on that point then, when they come forward with a development permit application, would they not be then going through the same process all over again? No, this would be as part of the first development permit application. So we'd, we'd be looking at a larger area than, we, than, than just the site at hand and looking at those connections to the, to the neighborhood, et cetera. So it would be part of that development permit process. It wouldn't include the other, the other lands, but it would demonstrate um, to the satisfaction of the approving authority, and in this place it would be Planning Commission, how those things would be accomplished. Hmm. But each one would be subject to the same rigor when they came forward with a development permit application. Um, if they're single family homes, for example, there wouldn't be any development permit uh, required in, in many of these cases. So um, the level of rigor would depend on the nature of the land use application that was being made. Well, I'll listen to see what else comes out of this, but as, as it stands, I can't see myself supporting this. Thank you. We know. Thanks, Alderman Chibot. Alderman Moore? Thanks, Alderman Marr. Alderman Farrell? Thank you. I, I know Alderman Carra had asked why Planning Commission didn't ask that Council review the master plan. And Planning Commission can't direct Council. But it can request that plans do come back for some extra oversight. And Alderman Lowe and I don't agree necessarily on the role of Planning Commission, although it's well defined. We're, uh, we're to look at urban design issues and architectural issues and and hopefully raise the bar whenever possible. And I think that's what we anticipate in this case, is the opportunity to raise the bar. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Demon. Maybe it's because I'm new at this, but I'm still trying to grasp what the difference is between this process for a development permit and the standard process through which they go through CPC to get a development permit. Is it just a larger context development permit? Yes, it would be a larger context. It wouldn't be a development permit for the whole area. It would focus on the shopping centre, but talk about its relationship to the surrounding community. And so how when it you fit say in. surrounding community, are you referring to how it relates to the other cells or how it relates to bonus or all of it? Just the, Mel just the Melkor lands as, as indicated in the motion. So just the Melkor lands. Yes. So again, how is that different than just a standard development permit? I'm sorry. Well, normally we'd only have a, a development permit that would deal with the shopping center site on its own. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we would be looking at a concept plan that would, showing, would show the entire build out of the community. Those, those other parts would not be included in the development permit, but it would show that concept for the entire community and specifically how, um, how it relates to the shopping center site and, and the office locations. So any of the, so as part of this, if, if, if Planning Commission doesn't like the way the R1s are being stationed in relation to, or R1Ss, sorry, uh, in relation to the shopping center and or offices, it could be declined in that de development permit stage? No, we wouldn't be refusing um, the, the single family homes in the example you gave, nope. but we could provide um, feedback to the applicant on, uh, on the build out of the larger community and how it relates. But I think the main focus would, would be on the um, commercial shopping center site and those relationships. Well, uh, can you, can you expand just a little what you mean by uh, on, on the larger con on the larger area then what how it relates to the larger just how it relates to the office how it relates to the to the single families I think the what? connectivity for example from the the balance of the community would be something that would be important to consider um, also there are other multifamily sites in the neighborhood and how they would they would connect, et cetera. So we would be just really looking at a, at a broader area, at a finer grain of detail than we would normally look at in a development permit, but it wouldn't be a development permit for the larger area. I think we'd be somewhat breaking new ground here. Um, so um, we'll, we'd have to see what would come out of the process. And I think we could learn a lot from this particular approach and see if it could be applied in other areas and how, how the process might accommodate it. So we've never done this, and we're kind of using these as a guinea, this 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 group as a guinea pig to try it out. 
we've certainly had concept plans before, and one of the things we, we do struggle with at times is how to use those concept plans and, and their longevity, et cetera. So um, we've used concept plans, but I don't recall an example, looking at the staff, of, of, a, of a case where we might have used something um, for, for this kind of a focus on a, on a shopping area and its relationship to the surroundings. So I think it is somewhat new. Okay, so just stepping me through this, they would have to get a development permit. For the first development permit application, they would have to get an agreed upon master plan, and then they would actually have to go back for the development permit to do the shopping center. No, the development permit would be handled um, as part of the larger discussion around the master plan. So they wouldn't have to, it would be one process that would be used mm -hmm. only for the shopping center. So that development permit would also show in concept how the surrounding area would be developed and, and some of the features that I mentioned. So, so I go back to my first part is that if, if depending on how they build out the balance of the area is going to depend on whether the shopping center gets a permit. No. Um, I, I, is, your, is your question as to whether the comments on the build out of the surrounding community might influence the acceptance or, or, or not of the development permit for the, for the shopping center? Yes. Um, I wouldn't see it working in that way. I think it could be more, um, well, it, it, it depends what issues were raised about the, about the, uh, the shopping center site in itself. We would have to look at the shopping center site only for the development permit. And if there were questions that arose from that relationship to the surrounding area, they would have to be attended to on the development permit. But that would be part of the staff review. But I, I, I staff I, review or part of the Calgary Planning well, Commission? Well, part of the staff review in the, in the report they'd provide to Calgary Planning Commission. There are some subtle nuances here that we would, we would have to work through, and I appreciate the, the questions that you have about that. So I'm sorry, I'm just, we're, we're back to, depending on how the balance of the Melkor lands are built out in relationship to the shopping center is going to determine whether a development permit is granted or not. That would be part of the evaluation of the development permit for the shopping center. So yes. <laughs> Um, it's it's I, going I, to have an impact on whether they get a development permit yes, on it, how it, they divide, decide to build if out. That's, if that's your question, yes, okay. it could have an impact, which is why we want to understand the, 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 the master plan for the larger community. Okay, thank you. We still need a DP for the rest of... Whatever is a significant... Other than the shopping centre. We would need other development... Yeah, no, I knew that. Great, thanks, Alderman Zwong. Alderman Lowe? Well, Your Worship, I've been listening to this with a great deal of interest. It's the first development permit that comes in, and, and Ms. Saxworthy, correct me if I'm wrong, but that may be for the hotel. Well, it, it may be for the hotel, uh, Your Worship, but that is part of the part of the shopping center area, and so therefore you'd still, you'd still want the master plan showing the entire community. Yeah, I, yes, I, I you're understand. quite correct. I you're quite correct. But there's a lot of focus on it being the shopping center, when the shopping center is actually divided over three pieces, yes. of, pieces of land. So let's not get hung up. It's, it's the first development permit that comes in for approval. We're being asked to show the... the I appreciate plan. that clarification, so that's I correct. If I understood correctly from what I heard at Planning Commission, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Alderman Farrell, but they also indicated some uh, later connectivity to the trailer court. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying is relax. I'm still not going to support it, and I'll tell you why. Because Alderman Farrell and I don't agree about the role of Planning Commission. And while I have no difficulty with the development permit coming. Uh, Planning Commission can do that. I worry about the master plan coming because while I believe Planning Commission's role is a review of technical review of planning matters and does it fit the policy that's applicable to the area, Planning Commission should not be redesigning. And unfortunately, we're starting to fall into that habit, and I worry greatly about that. So while I appreciate Alderman, 
Hodges defining the lands, and I understand what's going to be here. And I remind Council, don't forget the whole shopping centre thing. It's the first development permit that comes in whatever piece of land it's on. Uh, it's the other piece of this that's causing me not to support it. And that's the propensity of Planning Commission now to try to make policy, which is an elected body's job, not an appointed body's job. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Alderman Lowe. Uh, to close, Alderman Hodges. Uh, well, Your Worship, I thought the uh, proposed amendment was uh, fairly straightforward. It, I think it, as Alderman Farrell's mentioned, it does raise the bar. It, uh, I think, will result in a better development permit and a better development overall for the uh, Melkor lands. The, uh, I uh, discussed this with the applicant, with the uh, owner the, this morning before 9.30. He was in agreement with it. Uh, but he has had difficulties trying to communicate with the owners to the north of the, uh, which is the uh, mobile home park site. I don't doubt he's had those uh, problems uh, communicating with the, uh, uh, with the uh, owners of the mobile home park site. I have for the last 30 years. I've never heard from them ever. They uh, operate a maple leaf management company out of Vancouver. Uh, they front for them, and uh, they have uh, no communication with the known uh, public that I know of. So I take it, Your Worship, when they want something, I'll hear from them. But I gather they haven't wanted very much for the last 30 years, which is okay with me. It's because so, they benefit from outstanding representation, Alderman Hodges. I don't even know if they know <laughs> what the representation is. <laughs> so I would... Uh, I'm learning so much today. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they uh, operate very, in a very isolated fashion there uh, as uh, owners of that, uh, that site. Uh, Melcor uh, do not operate that way, and I, I believe that requirement for a, uh, a master plan for their lands will result, as I say, in a better development. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. On the amendment, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. On the amendment, Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Curra? Yes. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman Collier Kurt? Yes. Alderman DeMong? Yes. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? No. Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? No. Alderman Pincott? No. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? Yes. Demong wants more central planning. Can you vote yes? It's carried. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. Second reading of the bylaw, then. Are we agreed? Oh, wait. You have another amendment? Is it to this uh, no, one or the no, other one? It's yeah, the other one, right? Yeah. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Oh, same division, are we agreed? No. no. All right. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? I am opposed. <laughs> and so is Alderman Marr. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? opposed? Alderman Marr and I are opposed. Now, that takes us to... Oops. Um, bylaw 13D 2011, then. Oh, we've done that already. So 13D 2011, first reading the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Kara and I are opposed. Alderman Hodges. Yeah. Yes, uh, I've uh, handed out uh, an amendment, a uh, proposed amendment to uh, the clerks to the staff, and I think I gave you a copy, uh, Your Worship. If not, I think they can put it up on the screen. This is the issue of the floor area ratio. Uh, it, this bylaw says uh, FAR of two. The documents that were produced by the consultants for the developer and for the landowner uh, and by the landowner indicate an FAR of one. FAR of one uh, we're talking about uh, is only on site, DC site two. DC site one is uh, for a, an FAR of one. 
So I'm asking that it would be consistent to have an FAR of one on uh, DC site two as well. That's basically. Uh, Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Doing, do we have a which, seconder? Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Seconded by Alderman McLeod. Alderman Carra. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Alderman Hodges and I discussed this over the break. Um, I will just sort of state that I think floor area ratio is a miserable planning tool. It was designed as an academic, it was designed as a measurement tool for quick and dirty analysis by academics. What's the difference between San Francisco and Wichita? And it's designed as a quick and dirty approach. It's not a good regulatory tool, and it's not a good design tool. Uh, and in fact, there are a variety of other things in the land use bylaw which will impact the floor area ratio as a final outcome. I think that if we're engaging in a master planning process and we want to see what it would look like, it would be a damn shame if the perfect plan that everyone agreed to was an FAR of 1.1 or 1.15, and then you had to start shaving stuff off, right? So I would actually propose an alternative amendment uh, that we get rid of the maximum floor area ratio altogether and let the master planning process sort of determine what the best physical outcome would look like, acknowledging that it's already constrained by a plethora of other things, physical envelopes, uh, setbacks, uh, you know, the transportation uh, capacity of the proposed overpass. I, I understand what Alderman Hodges is trying to do here. I think this does one better and actually gets rid of it. So that's my, that's my amendment to the amendment. Can't do it? It's contrary. Contrary? Okay, well then I. If this fails, then I will ask uh, Ms. Jackal if we can do that within the context of the uh, existing bylaw. I'm not sure we can. Okay. Without well, another public hearing, I, I, and I would love another public hearing on this item. <laughs> yeah. Well, I won't be supporting this because I think you want to sort of give them maximum room to do the master planning process. And Thanks, Alderman Carr. I don't think I disagree with you, Alderman Farrell. It's, I think it's been said we, we want maximum flexibility to do the best plan possible without hamstringing. Alderman Chabot. Yeah, briefly, um, first of all, clarification on something. This is the office component, right? Office CO Alderman district. Right? Okay, so if we're looking to maximize on the potential employment in this area to minimize the need for, for uh, people to commute in and out of the area, then certainly we want to have the, the highest potential um, density to accommodate further employment. So reducing that number certainly doesn't achieve the objectives of... Uh, the planet to document, in my opinion. So, no, I'm not going to support this. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Hodges, did you want to close? Well, uh, Your Worship, I see what's in the bylaw and I saw what was in the documents uh, supporting the uh, land use application. I saw the discrepancy and I thought that uh, moving it to one, which is the same as DC site uh, one, would, uh, would be appropriate. Um, but it's up to Council to decide. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. On the amendment, then, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? opposed? Call the roll, please. On the amendment, Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? No. Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? No. Alderman Pincott? No. Alderman Putmans? No. Alderman Stevenson? Alderman Carra? No. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman collier -Kurt? No. Alderman DeMong? No. Alderman Farrell? No. Mayor Nenshi? No. It's lost. All right then, second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Carra and I are opposed. When do I jump in? Oh shoot. Right now. Right now. Yeah. But Ms. Jackal, can you do that? Or would that require another public hearing? <laughs> Could you just repeat the question, please? You'd like to Sorry. remove the line about the floor area ratio and just not have it at all. Oh. 
Because I can see amending it, but getting rid of it, is that too substantive a change? Why? Well, I, I, yeah, unfortunately, I think there would be no controls on the density at all then, would there? Um, well, and there are, uh, respectfully, there are already multiple controls on the density. There's setbacks, there's building envelopes within the uh, land use district that's attached to the DC, and then there's also the carrying capacity of the proposed interchange, which is going to restrict how big everything gets. And there's building heights, yeah. So. Oh, well, Your Worship, um, I guess I would ask for just, pardon me, just a, a little bit of clarification maybe from planning then. Um, the rule of thumb we have is if, if you change the land use and the rules enough to affect a jump in district or base district, then you'd need a new public hearing. And I'm sorry, I'm not a planner. I, I don't know if that could be the result. Today so you're filling in. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Axworthy? Your Worship, I, I, in this particular case, it is typical and standard for us to have a density um, statement, a density um, threshold, if you will. Um, maximum in this case and I take Alderman Carra's point that there would be in um, through the application of the setbacks and etc there would be an an output of building envelope and I think that's what Alderman Carra is referring to uh, without having done the analysis I have no idea what that is um, so I, I would be concerned personally um, that there wouldn't be um, a statement of maximum density provided in the bylaw. I take the point he's making about FAR as a tool, but I think it is very standard for us to have some reference to density, and, and my preference would be that there would be one provided here. So I think that based on what I just heard, Alderman Carra, I think that to change this at this juncture would take us into legally questionable grounds, so I'm actually not going to allow the amendment. Could we just do an amendment and then refer it for a week to find out whether that's actually the case? If someone were to second it? Could we do an amendment and refer it for a week? Madam Clerk? Yeah. We haven't really voted. We called. He, he jumped up during the middle of the vote. We, we, didn't, we didn't do the roll call on the vote. We have no idea what the vote was on the second. Yeah, no, you're actually right. So, it's by law you can't reconsider it. But what was, what was, the, what was the roll call on the second vote, Madam there, Clerk? There wasn't one yet. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't even we get to that. Midstream. Yeah, we were just there. I don't think you can do it, Alderman Cross, sorry. We'll have to catch this one the next time. There is no next time. That's it. But I certainly know that Ms. Axworthy will take this one under advisement and should something come back with a greater than two maximum. I don't, I don't see it coming back with a greater than two maximum, so I'm yeah. willing to sit down, but I, I do, I have hatred in my heart for FAR. Okay, just wanna... so noted. You shouldn't hate Alderman Carra. It's a beautiful world. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges and I are opposed. Uh, oh, did you just stick your hand up? Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so that's this one. Then, I'll need a motion please to lift from the table. Thanks, Alderman Farrell, seconded Alderman Marr. Are we agreed? All right, so we're back to the tents, folks. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. I have a number of questions um, resulting from the public hearing. We, um, we heard a lot of confusion and perhaps some misinformation, maybe a little bit of exaggeration, but it really concerns me that we're hearing that people who obviously um, don't require a development permit have been told by somebody that they do. So what is, is this what's occurred? 
Your Worship, I did consult with the staff, <clears throat> and I understand that um, there may have been some uh, information provided to, um, and I, I can't say how many persons, um, about the requirements for a development permit that were incorrect. Um, we've we've made a change in the approach on the counter because we did learn that there there had been some difficulty and also increased the training so i do apologize uh, particularly to the gentleman who uh, apparently received the in incorrect information so did we contact the people who were turned away or that that, that got the wrong did we contact them and try and clarify well I'm, I, I'm not sure at this point that we necessarily know who who those those people were we have been trying to compile a list I understand from Ms. Hartley mm -hmm. of persons who have applied for tent applications in the past and the majority of those people have been contacted uh, to make sure that they were provided with the correct information but of course we can't be sure that that some people that maybe had not been a past customer had were given the correct information did we contact the tent companies to let them know that wrong information was going out? Do well, you know I, about that? I'd have to ask Ms. Hartley if she could um, come forward and assist us with, with that. Ms. Hartley? It's hard to tell when incorrect information has been provided to an applicant. What we did was provide two names for contact for the tent industry. These are uh, Stream 3 or planners, and they will be able and are able to provide the correct information. The industry has on two or three occasions received their names and phone numbers and are able to contact them directly. Um, these are not people that work on the front counter. They can look into the intricacies of their particular inquiry and respond. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to determine where to go from here. We've got some textual amendments that um, are just clarification of the bylaw. Um, we're hearing that, that, and from most of the speakers who uh, were concerned about what was before us today, that they would like the opportunity for more time um, and I think most of them understand the need to have some checks and balances for these things but um, what are you what would you recommend that we do on um, both city solicitor and and uh, Ms. Axworthy on moving forward do we move these textual amendments so that we have clarity of for the definitions and would then we refer the whole thing back um, for more consultation and I'm concerned and I would like to ask uh, Constable Kane um, some questions about how we can deal with some of the issues that we saw from last year um, so maybe if you could advise me on the next steps please your worship I have been um, talking to uh, Ms. Jackal about some uh, possible way to manage the situation and um, I think part of the, the concern that has arisen here is around um, the definition of, of adjacent. And it speaks um, to uh, the relationship to a street or lane. But in some cases, in the case of maybe offset parcels, we can find ourselves with situations where, um, to the layman, it would appear that the site is adjacent, but it doesn't meet the narrow definition in the bylaw. And I think that the amendments, some of the amendments that were proposed, were trying to address this problem. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are suggesting, uh, if, uh, if it's Council's wish, that um, you could give first reading to the bylaw as currently drafted. I understand there are some concerns about, about the wording as drafted. And we could come back uh, next Monday with um, perhaps a definition of adjacent, which will address many of the concerns that um, uh, members of Council who have uh, these kinds of sites in, in very close proximity to a residential area and, and to, to the lay person would appear to be adjacent, but it wouldn't um, capture as many applications in the net as perhaps was proposed under the current bylaw. So if council so wishes, you could give first reading and we could make some amendments on second reading, which might address some of the concerns that were raised by the tent industry and also um, by, by the uh, community members that were here. 
So then the amendments that were proposed by Planning Commission, yes. we could then refer those to, I'm thinking of a team that, um, now what is the name of that <clears throat> team that we have? The, uh, the Licensed Establishment Multi-Agency Group. Yes. Um, the Planning Department, other stakeholders, the industry of course, community, sure. um, and then refer that to Community and Protective Services for I think October. Yes, and we could look at many of the process issues that have been raised uh, by members of the industry as well to see if there isn't a way that we could provide a more expedited process even for some of the building permit issues that have been identified. And maybe we can come up with a better process for all of them. Yes. Because I think they're, we certainly don't want to make it difficult to have fun in this city as what has been implied, but we also recognize that there are some severe impacts um, for some of these tents and we need to understand the difference. So I'll, um, now does Clerk understand what we're doing here? I, I, I can help with that, but did you okay. say you had some questions that you needed addressed with uh, well, the constable? Well, yes, uh, Constable Kane, please. And meanwhile, I'll try and get my head around how we Can move we? that forward. Yeah. Also, I am not in favor of fun. Of what? I'm, of fun. <laughs> Unless it happens here in council chambers. Oh, we have lots of fun. And we make our own fun. So. Constable Kane, um, how would you, if, if you're without the land use bylaw changes that have been proposed earlier on today, um, Without those, how would you address the concerns that have been identified <coughs> last summer's tents, for example? <coughs> Do you have some tools in place? That's a concern I have, is are the tools in place for you to be able to be proactive? I think certainly with the, the group of people that I work with, we, we can obviously still look at applications this year mm -hmm. and more so just going out and speaking to the industry and saying, look, we need to just slightly change this until we can get a firm approach to what we're actually wanting to try and achieve. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, we could, because all the people that are in the LEMAG group, as it's called now, is the exact same people that are doing the enforcement stuff on the Public Safety Task Force side. So, yes, we could. I think we should still review. Obviously, we're not relying on the, the DPs at this time, but we can certainly look at it, because obviously we'll have BPs. DP certainly gives you more ability to to uh, okay. enforce the recommendations that you've okay. brought forward. But okay. Um, okay, well that'll be an interesting task. We'll have this stampede to uh, to be able to measure okay. the success of that, and then perhaps come up with some better rec regulations. For yeah, the I fall. think it will certainly give us a chance to look at how things are standing two years in a row because mm -hmm. I think one of the things we have to consider that last year the weather was obviously a real mitigating factor for a lot of things that Stampede did suffer um, because of the weather and I think if the weather is different this year we could possibly see a different approach to how Stampede is running. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, Mr. Mayor? We, we think we've got it. Okay. Um, so in order to um, achieve what you're suggesting, which is that we um, would be able to adopt some of those simple textual amendments, mm -hmm. but refer the bigger questions to a different process, the right way to do that would be for council to do first reading only today, uh, and then refer second and third readings to next week. Next week, what we would come up with is a series of amendments which includes deleting the contentious sections mm -hmm. for second reading, third reading, and then we'd have a motion arising to start a process to do the rest. Okay. Makes sense? That makes perfect sense. Um, we're, we're, referring. we're actually referring it to administration for some uh, recommendations before next week. Okay, thank you. Okay. So does that make sense? So council, did that make sense? So the only thing that we're gonna vote on today is first reading, nothing else. The whole bylaw. Okay, and then there will be amend, and then we're gonna we're gonna refer the whole refer f to administration prior to second and third reading, which will be back next Monday. Why couldn't we just refer the whole thing for those amendments today? Yeah, I'm just why wondering we just if why that? we need first reading. Could we just do that? We don't need first reading today either, do we? No. So, next next week. In a week, and then next week you'll get a new motion. Yes. 
Yes. But that'll have to happen at second reading of the bylaw, and we're not quite ready for that yet. Correct. Okay. Okay. And that doesn't mean that we won't be clarifying. Right now, the bylaw is not clear about what adjacent is. And that's what we need to do this year is clarify that. It's a textual amendment. And then it would then come back to committee in October for um, to address the concerns that were identified today with more consultation to CPS, Community Protective Services. So is that clear? I'm going to open with a bit of debate then. No task force, thank you. Um, I think it's important to go into the history of how we got here because okay, so it's- I'm gonna let you do that before you make your referral motion, okay? Yes. Because then you can debate it. That's, okay. yeah. So I think, um, yeah, I think it's important to talk about the history. Previously, Council, we required development permits for all tents. And it was a process that was, was uh, fairly elegant. I don't think we heard of many concerns. Most of the tents were either in Ward 7 or Ward 8. Um, but with the textual amendments that were brought forward with the new land use bylaw, the, uh, the um, tent bylaw was changed. And I have to say, it concerns me that that occurred without it really being flagged for council, that we were making a st substantive change to the land use bylaw when we were being told at council that these were simply textual amendments. They were just amendments to clarify a new bylaw and bring it into line with the old bylaw. So that's one concern that I have. Um, so what happened as a result is there was no ability under the new framework to address concerns of neighboring communities and businesses for the impacts of some of these tents. As well, some of the tents operated as nightclubs when the primary use was a restaurant. That posed another problem. So we had a new bylaw that a lot of people, obviously even our front desk in the planning department, didn't have a full understanding of, resulting in a whole bunch of concerns from last year. Um, the planning department was going to bring an amendment in the fall to sort of tighten up the rules a little bit and the reason you're seeing that this late in the day, just before the summer, is because we didn't get to it until um, just a month ago. So I, I recognize that we need to give people more time to adjust and to consult and, uh, and to prepare their business plans for, um, for the next year. But I still think that, Council, we need to address some of the concerns that were left um, unaddressed with the changes to the land use bylaw and our new interpretation of it. So I, um, I then will now refer all of the, um, the, so the motion before us and refer it back to administration for one week to do two things, to bring forward um, clarity on what um, adjacent definition of adjacent and to come with um, a work plan or a program for consultation to return to council in Oct or community and protective services in October. And Alderman Marr, you're seconding that referral motion? Thank you. Thank you. Very well then, we have a referral motion on the floor. On the referral motion, Alderman Lowe. On the referral motion, Alderman Stevenson? Yes, Your Worship. Um, uh, it, does this mean that, that we're referring the recommendations everything? We can still then have an implementation date of this fall and we would move that next? Uh... I, would, I would strongly recommend having that conversation with Ms. Axworthy um, in the ensuing time should the referral motion but we pass. Need to, we need to give the industry uh, some assurance that we're not moving ahead with this for the stampede. That's important. We've talked a lot about what the problems are, but the problem really is that someone predetermined what the outcome of this discussion today was going to be and spread that word throughout, and that created a lot of problems with the industry. So, so we need to. I some think the, the, they're going to have to wait one more week, Alderman Stevenson, for the final discussion. I think it's pretty safe to say, based on the tenor of the discussion that we've had here today, that that message has been well heard. And what, uh, what Ms. Axworthy is trying to do is figure out the parts that do need to be in place for this stampede, which are largely just around the meaning of that word adjacent. Um, and the rest of it, according to Alderman Farrell's referral motion, it ain't happening next week. All right, thank you. Um, thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Alderman Carra on the referral motion. 
Well, we'll see what happens next week. Okay. Alderman Chabot on the referral motion. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, so the word I, that we're talking about here of replacing with adjacent is, is a butts, I would assume, under section 25, sub N sub III. It says uh, is not located on a parcel that abuts a residential district or is only separate from residential district by intervening street. Is that the, the word in question primarily? You don't know of any other instances where this occurs on special function tents? That would be the word that we would be looking to clarify in terms of what ad what adjacent effectively means to a residential okay. area. Because the amendment is originally proposed was suggesting replacing a butt with adjacent, but we didn't really define adjacent either. Right. So so the issue is the interpretation of what this ref what this means and what the challenges this is creating the way it's currently worded. Is that my understanding? <clears throat> there is a definition of adjacent, but we're not sure that it really fulfills what the layperson would understand to be adjacent. There may be some oddities that we just feel we, we should further clarify. So it might be a better word suited. We, we may just fully, uh, <clears throat> sorry, not just fully, further, we, we may add a few words to the definition of adjacent to be very clear about council's intent around uh, the proximity of large tents to a residential areas. And uh, the balance of everything else that's being proposed at this point, subject to further debate next week. I suspect that the I suspect that what will come back to us next week is an opportunity for further consultation post this stamp per period on everything else that's being proposed. So for the referral. Okay. Well, I'll uh, see what Alderman Farrell has to say in our close. <laughs> We just got to get that darn one word done or we could refer the whole thing today, bluntly. Um, Alderman Duong? Alderman Farrell to close? I'm not really sure what needed clarification. So what we're doing, it just to repeat what uh, the motion was, the referral, we're referring everything back uh, for one week to administration to further clarify adjacent and abut. Then the administration will come back with a process of consultation for the whole bylaw to come back in October to Community and Protective Services. Well, because I didn't write it out, because <laughs> we're going on the fly. Is that, is that clear? Okay, thank you. Closed. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. On the motion to refer then, are we agreed? Yeah. Any opposed? Carried. All right, um, that takes us, I don't even know where that takes us, folks. Yeah, where is that? All right, that's 9.1. Okay, no, not quite yet. Nine point, actually, um, yes, 9.2 proposed street name in Sherwood. Um, this is just a resolution. We don't need a public hearing. Can I have someone move this one, please? Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Seconded, Alderman McLeod. Any discussion on this? In Sherwood. <laughs> yes, Your Worship, forgive me for that. Yes, I, I, I kind of got an idea of where it is, but I'm not familiar with this area. Alderman Lowe, where? It's where right next to Nottingham, Sherwood? apparently. Not Sherwood. <laughs> it's in the north end of Simons Valley, Your Worship, <laughs> in the community. You know, is this a newly annexed? No, no, no. You, know, you know where you know where Beacon Hill is, Sarcy Trail and Stony Drive, yeah. right roughly in that okay. area. <laughs> um, or as Alderman Pincott puts it, right next to Nottingham. Don't give the adjacent developers any ideas, Alderman Pincott. All right. So on this one, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Now I apologize. I don't have my uh, amended agenda in front of me. Which ones did we move? So we're still dealing with three. We're not dealing with four and five. So 9.3 then. Um, 9.3 is a name change in the neighborhood of Rocky Ridge. No, we tabled four and five. So we still have to do three. I will move this one, Your Worship. Uh, this is straightforward. It doesn't involve uh, uh, address changes for anybody's residence. It's logical to uh, for this entire road across the uh, northwest part of the city to be the same name. Yep. I actually had no idea that a little portion of what I would call Country Hills Boulevard had a different name. Yeah. Do we have a seconder? 
Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any discussion on this one? All right, on this one are we agreed? Mm-hmm. Any opposed? Carried. Okay, and four and five have been um, tabled. That's the word I'm thinking of. So we can move on now to the next section of your agenda. We'll just do some musical chairs up here. Thanks for waiting around, gentlemen. And we'll get to item 10.1.1 in your agenda, C-2011-44, a bylaw repealing bylaw 37M89, the water fluoridation bylaw 1989. This is third reading, so it's not really a debate, but I have been asked for a recorded vote, but Alderman Farrell's going to move it first. Go. I'll move it. Thank you. Okay. And Alderman Colley Urquhart has seconded it, and a recorded vote, please. Except I can't do a recorded vote when I don't have a pen. Thank you. <laughs> Here, I'll give you that back, Mary. Diane, this is his story. Going to hold the fort here? No. Oh, yeah. You know, why do I only have deputy mayor sheets? Yeah, isn't that his address? Not that you're not enough, but you know, if he was with us, that would help. The three of us. Oh, exactly. Three of us have some comments. No, the three that don't understand are on your side. <laughs> the rest of you are basically following joke science. <laughs> Discounting educated people, refusing to let them participate. Yeah, I think I've probably lost votes rather than gained votes with this. I've had about four people say good on you and about 25. On the recorded vote for third reading of the of C44, Alderman Marr, four. Alderman Hodges, four. Alderman Farrell, four. Alderman Carraw, four. Alderman Collier, Cart, four. Alderman Chabot, four. Alderman DeMong, four. Alderman McLeod, against. Alderman Lowe, against. Alderman Putmans, against. Alderman Stevenson, four. Alderman Jones, four. Alderman Pincott, four. Mayor Nenshi, against. It's carried. All right, that takes us to uh, reports from Finance and Commute corp- Corporate Services, uh, 10.2.1 recommend, in your agenda, of, Alderman uh, Move the recommendations of the committee, Your Worship. Thank you. Alderman Collier, Carter, are you seconding? Thank you. Um, any discussion on this one? I have some, too. Alderman Chabot, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, I had a chance to have a bit of a discussion with Mr. Sawyer about some, I guess, just formatting on some of this. Um, There was a a small amendment that I had suggested, and I'm not sure. I didn't get a chance to find it again. Mr. Sawyer, we fixed that little parentheses uh, issue, the negative variance? Uh, Your Worship, I believe that relates to the annual report not the year-end report that's oh, here. Okay. And yes, that was fact, fixed. Okay, thank you for that. Um, yeah, no further comments other than, uh, like I said, the formatting I think could have been a little bit better and we've had that discussion. Thanks. Mr. Sawyer, um, I'm really pleased to have received this. And one of the things that I will be spending some time with you on in the future is figuring out great ways of getting these reports back to council because I think this is very important. We uh, we tend to pass the budget and then never know what actually happened. But I have a question, uh, something that just wasn't clear to me, which is when we talk about the year-to-date spending on the capital budgets and we see numbers around 50%, could you just explain in layman's terms what that actually means? Uh, you know, where's the rest of the money? Uh, your Worship, the... Um when the budget is set for, for example, 2010, uh, basically to proceed on any work, there has to be an approved budget in place. So by its very nature, we don't anticipate that we'll spend 100% of it because invariably some of it will shift to the next year. So this is, um, this is, this is actual cash outlays. So if I'm building the West LRT, I've approved the budget in 2008, but I'm not going to spend it all until 2013. So this is reflecting that? Am I correct in saying that? Essentially, yes. We don't account on a cash basis, but rather as incurred. The cash may not have gone, but the, for all intents and purposes, it's been spent. These are invoices that we've received. That's right. Work has been done. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Alderman Pincott. Uh, thank you, thank you, Worship. I just want to follow up on something that you said because you you said that we pass a budget and then we sort of never hear from it again. And and I wasn't. I just want to check with Mr. Sawyer to make sure that that isn't true. We do actually get quarterly updates and reports. Uh, do we not? Uh, Your Worship, yes, we do quarterly reporting through finance and corporate services and on to council, um, for sure. And it will um, record and track all the expenditures. It also tracks a certain subset of the performance measures that lend themselves to monthly or quarterly calculations, okay. as well as it talks about um, accomplishments, challenges, et cetera. So there is detailed reporting quarterly. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Sawyer. I overspoke. What I meant to say, I'll walk it back a little bit. What I meant to say was that council doesn't really engage on this stuff. Um, in my experience, except in the annual budget process, and I'd like to see better engagement that way. But the reports also have to be clear and make it clear for that to happen. Anyone else on this one? Alderman Lowe to close. Well, I was about to, to uh, mention what Alderman Pincott mentioned, and uh, for those who want further engagement, if they come to Finance and Corporate Services on Wednesday, you get Q1 of this year. Oh, this week? That's right. Very exciting. So uh, for those of us who get it and read it, it comes. It's three-hole punched. It can go in your budget book where it's supposed to go for future reference. And uh, condescending as I may be, Your Worship, closed. And CFO's <laughs> loving it. <laughs> Wait a minute. I've got a book? <laughs> All right. On the recommendations, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, that takes us then to a whole bunch of things from the SPC on land use planning and transportation. Alderman Chabot. Yeah, move all the recommendations, Your Worship, and uh, if need be, I'll address uh, any concerns in my close on each one. No problem. So we'll take the first. Oh, and I need a seconder, please. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. On the first one then, which is LPT 2011-30, uh, 10.3.1, independent review of the land use bylaw and related processes. Uh, on this one, Alderman Hodges. Uh, yes, Your Worship, at uh, committee, as is indicated on page 204, I uh, did not vote in favor of uh, recommendations number two and three. Number three is the one that almost bothers me more than anything, is to direct administration to adjust de development and building approval sustainment reserve to a guideline maximum of 60 million. You know, uh, Council, if uh, we give it a few more years, we're going to have a bigger reserve there than the Fiscal Stability Reserve. And what the purpose is, I have no earthly idea, but I know that it could be a good reserve to, if we have to resort to it this fall, to uh, fund some things in either the Planning and Building Department budget or a related budget. Yeah, I, I don't know why. It wasn't uh, me. Microphone's not working very well. There it is. It's working it's now. <laughs> it shook up, uh, shook up uh, Alderman Lowe's uh, system there, hearing system. So, Your, Your Worship, it was 30 million. I know there's more than 30 million in the reserve right now, and it's in the 35 to 40 million dollar range at the present time, as as I recall. Uh, but uh, it's uh, not a recommendation I'm going to. I would like to vote for, and I don't know where it's headed. Maybe a hundred million in five years. I don't know. Thank you. Thanks, um, Alderman Hodges. And in fact, I was wondering um, when I read that myself, and I think I just heard you say that it normally sits at thirty million. I'm so sorry. What's the maximum now? I don't know if that's Mr. Sawyer question or Ms. Axworthy question. Your Worship, it's thirty million. So we're doubling. Yes. Okay. And, oh, what the heck. The rationale for that, again? The rationale for the doubling? Yes. Um, as identified in the uh, report conducted by Zucker Systems and, and Mr. Elliott, mm -hmm. um, he indicated that it, in, it would be necessary to have a, um, a reserve of sufficient means to sustain a, a period of, uh, of a downturn, for example. And we did experience this recently in, in the uh, recession a couple of years ago, where we were we were had the potential to actually burn through 
almost 22 of that 30 million, if I'm not mistaken. And, and it's surprising how, how quickly uh, the money can be spent. And we do want to make sure we can retain staff that are very valuable and, and highly trained during periods of this time. And so in looking at other um, jurisdictions and how they handle the matter, um, Mr. Zucker and Mr. Elliott determined that uh, a maximum 60 million would provide for the kind of um, sustainment that would be necessary should we hit some of these periods or also to develop the necessary IT systems, for example, to improve our e-plans, et cetera. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer, on that note, um, you know, we've had a lot of concern um, and discussion about whether we are being too healthy in our reserve policy. And I know that we're looking at each of the reserves on a three-year rotating basis. Would you find that in your expertise that doubling the size of this one would be out of step with Council's direction on all the other ones? Uh, Your Worship, I don't believe so. Uh, if you look at our reserves, we have operating reserves and we have capital reserves. A big portion of the capital reserves is more timing related. Funds are coming in, they're held until they're spent. And on the operating side, really the only reserve that of substantive amount is the FSR, which is sitting just below 10% with its target at 15. Now the DBA reserve here, I've gone through the report from the consultants and based on the things that can change, et cetera, and how quickly they can change, to my mind it seems supportable. I don't believe at all it would be inconsistent with Council's direction around the reserves policy. It's very helpful, thank you. Uh, Alderman Hodges, were you done? Sorry, oh, I don't know what else there is to say. I mean, obviously, it's a discretionary call by uh, council. Uh, the administration's got their minds made up and needs to be $60 million, as a consultant thinks that. I think the consultant should have had a deeper look at the Calgary economy and uh, have a look at uh, the history of the city in the last 30 years, where, there, yes, there has been a time of things slowing down, but they've never... Uh, the... Uh, Growth has never really slowed down that much in this city. I remember in the early 60s, and others may remember more finer detail than that, that the number of people, net number of people coming into Calgary was 1,000 a month. And it got to 2,000 in the early 80s, 2,000 new, re new residents a month coming into the city. And that really hasn't changed that much. And those new residents have to have a place to live. So they find a place to live, and that generates growth in our city. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Farrell? Thank you. I'm wondering if it's time to start looking at the success of the Centre City team, for example, and see if we can't duplicate. duplicate. It's almost like community-based planning, where we bring policy and implementation together um, in in th other parts of the city because it's so successful and I think um, what I'm seeing is a real disconnect between the policy that we have and the implementation is there is that something that we can look at this it is certainly something we could look at if, if council wishes to do so would you see value in that well certainly there has been some advantages with the center city team and having the the um, merging of development permits and land use amendments in that policy group. Um, we do work very closely with our colleagues in DBA to, and they have a geographic based system, but they are, they are not sitting in the same place, et cetera. But it, it is certainly something we could, we could take a look at. And we, we have considered that over the years and for one reason or another, stuck with the current model for the rest of the city. Well, and certainly the application process in, in the core, in the center city, even though we're dealing with really significant applications, moves very smoothly and rapidly. And I think it's because everybody's sitting at the table and they have a full understanding of, of the issues. So is that something that you would need a motion arising for? Or is it just something that I could ask that you look at? I'm not, your Worship, I, my 
that's a pretty profound change in direction for the for the administration. Mm -hmm. um, notice of motion would be my best suggestion in, in terms of putting some context around what it is you're looking for. Yeah, it seems like we we have successes and then we often don't repeat them, and we've got a real success model there. It it would be interesting if that would be something we could expand to other parts of the city. So I'll um, ruminate on that for a while. Thank you. Alderman Footmans. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, perhaps to uh, General Manager Axworthy, through the Chair, perhaps Mr. Tolley. Um, it's with a full degree of respect to the staff of DBA and an appreciation of, of retention and the value of that through the various cycles. But once we start to get to this level, it commands, I think, a little bit harder-nosed approach, perhaps. And I'm wondering if the Department has considered um, what sort of I wouldn't go so far as to call it a contract, but what sort of a bargain is made with valued staff that um, are retained through tough times only to see us perhaps lose them to industry in good times? And I'm wondering if there's a bit of a quid pro quo, if there's an accommodation through the lean times, do we get an accommodation on their side uh, when times are perhaps more prosperous? I'm, it might be legal, I'm not sure. <laughs> It's a bit of a difficult question, Your Worship. I mean, generally, em employees, other than at the senior manager level, are not on employment contracts. They're um, employees of indefinite duration. And so employees have the ability constitutionally to come and go in job circumstances as generally as they wish, Your Worship. So I don't see any um, ability to tie employees down for long term, Your Worship. That's just not a policy that the city's adopted uh, generally in my experience here with, uh, with the municipality, Your Worship. So I don't see any way of tying an employee down long term. Even the long term contracts generally have fairly short three or six month termination notices where the employee can move to another job opportunity, Your Worship. So, um, just to follow on, so are, are there other mechanisms that you're aware of in employment law where an employer has an opportunity to perhaps smooth out the cycles by having such contracts in place or understandings? I, I'm certainly not aware of any, uh, Your Worship. Generally, the employee is uh, free to go in the employment relationship generally by giving a certain amount of notice, and that notice is generally either three or four months in my experience. There's generally no way of tying an employee down for a considerable period of time. That's been my experience, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> you look like you had something profound. I was waiting. Uh, it's that time of the evening. I was, I was waiting for something profound, but nothing came, so. <laughs> that never happens to me. Alderman Smong? <laughs> if you could, Ms. Axworthy, walk me through what would happen if we had actually gone to zero on that fund. There'd be a couple of consequences of, of going to zero on the fund. Um, first of all, we do um, fund technology improvements through the um, DBA sustainment reserve. So we'd be looking for essentially mill rate supported dollars to fund some of those <clears throat> some of those improvements. And also, um, the real consequence as, as well would be that um, if there were times when, when applications were down, and I, I take Alderman uh, Hodge's point, I, I've been at the city when we have had to lay staff off and lost very valuable staff that had a lot of experience. And so part of the intent of that reserve is that we'd be able to um, deal with the, the time, the, you know, the difficult times, but the real intent of the reserve that I didn't mention is also to support the increased need for staff during very high, high volume times. And um, we've certainly seen cases um, going back over the last, uh, maybe not the last two years, but previously, when we were in a very high volume situation. And we used that reserve to bring on additional staff to uh, handle those, those very high volumes that we've had. So the consequence of that, that would be um, needing to come back to council for additional funds to hire staff and a real delay in our ability to respond to customer demands for increased service. So <clears throat> we do have microphone. Uh, we do have permits that actually have work that stems over a number of years. Let's say the bow, 
and though it's a very large down payment for say a building permit some of the inspections that attend to that permit go out two or three years into the future so the intent of that reserve is to hold that money so that we can do those future years inspections and do the final release of the occupancy permit and so you actually shouldn't take it to zero because some of the lives of these permits goes o out over a number of years. Well, I, I understand the intent. My, my question is, what do you do if it goes to zero? Do you go to the mill rate? Yeah. So, Haven't yet. Pardon? Haven't yet. I mean, that's a great thing. I appreciate that. Um, what do you do with the excess funds once it's, when it's over 30 mil? Does that go into the uh, general fund? Into general revenue? No, I, I believe that, um, and I'm sorry, I, I don't have the, the amount that's in the reserve at the current time, but I believe it's, it has been over 30 million in, in recent history, and it has just remained there. It, it doesn't get transferred into, a, into another um, part of the organization. It has just remained there. Okay. So we, in fact, have been over that, that number. So I'm trying to understand the logic of this. We want to increase it to 60 million on the off chance that we're going to go down to zero because we don't want to go into the mill rate. But at the same time, we could be putting this extra 30 million into general revenue. And if it does go down to zero, we go back to the mill rate. I... So if this were to go up to 60 mil without us going this, we'd just kind of leave it in there? Well, you know, yes. Um... So what's the point of saying we want to increase it? That's an excellent question. I think that um, just as I understand it, just for clarity, this particular reserve fund is, as Mr. Tober put it, it's meant to be for the costs that accrue. I get that. After a permit. But it sounds to me like the amount that we're charging and what we're spending out are not necessarily in sync with one another. And I believe, Mr. Sawyer, correct me if I'm wrong, for example, the money that Council approved in our last budget for the e-services in this area mm -hmm. was actually funded from this reserve fund, yes? Your Worship, yes it was, and in fact I was just going to clarify, I haven't got the reserve fund details with me, um, but I believe in the case of this reserve, there is wording in there that if, if the amount is in excess of the $30 million, then in subsequent year or years, it's to be factored into the reducing the rates or capital expenditures such that it returns to 30. And so that's part of the plan. So we charge but, our customers less? Yes. Well, the reserve is being funded from the fees. I understand. So, so that would, you would either reduce the fees or you might reduce the fees from what they otherwise might be. Yeah. But that's part of the plan in there to get it back to the to currently the 30 uh, million level. So as it stands, we do have a maximum that we're supposed to have, but we don't, we don't go by it. If we go down to zero, we will go back to the mill rate. Why wouldn't we say if it goes over a specific maximum, it goes into the general revenue instead of going back, if this is the general cost, re cost of revenue that we need to fund it on an ongoing basis? Mr. Silbert, anyone? Really, there's nothing to say you couldn't do that. But in essence, it seems to me that if you have a rate structure that's intended to cover a certain liability, mm -hmm. you should adjust your rates. Yeah, rather than go back into the mill rate. That's well, I no, I, I, I understand. We don't want to go back into the mill rate, but, but I, I, have to listen to, I have to agree with Alderman Hodges. At some point, this is getting to be an extremely large reserve. And I'm not sure that we need to have this larger reserve if, if, it's, if, if the option is we keep our rates as is, and it happens to be a slightly higher rate and it goes into the mill rate once we hit a maximum on the off chance that if it goes down to zero, we realize that it's gonna come back out of the mill rate. Yeah. That to me seems like a reasonable see saw off. So I'm, I'm not sure if I'm in favor of increasing this to 60 million. I hear you. I will listen. I hear you. The only, the, the only clarification that I was gonna do, if it were me in that world, oh wait, it is. Um, I would say rather than the money go back to general revenue if the, if the reserves are too big, the money be used to reduce the fees that the people are paying in the future years. See what I'm saying? So it stays within that world, but yeah. That is the route that we've got right now. And I understand that. But in the same time as in business, 
if we're offering it as a cost recovery mechanism and is this almost to be run as a business, you take a little higher routine so that in times of downturn, you have that. And that's what the reserve is for. And I guess the question that we're debating is how much should that, res how, how much should that cushion be? All right. Thank you. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Worship. I need a little bit of uh, clarification from Ms. Axworthy. I, I wrote down that uh, your words, and I need to understand what they meant. You said in the downturn, we had the potential to burn through 22 million of this 30 million. What does that mean with the potential? Your Worship, what I meant was that during the downturn, when when we weren't um, getting when permit volumes were not sustaining um, our, our costs that we were incurring, we did, uh, if, if the recession had continued on for a longer period of time, at one point we were looking at having to spend a significant amount of the reserve just to maintain our current operations. And as Mr. Tobert indicated, um, oftentimes there are still inspections and follow-up work that needs to be done. That was one of the issues that, that certainly would have, would have had real impact. But, but I meant that, that we would have had to draw on the reserve to sustain our current operations. Okay, I understand that. So can you tell me what's the lowest the reserve has, has been to? Your Worship, I'm I'm sorry, I don't have that information. We could provide that that but to I'm, you. The way the reason for me to support doubling this, mm -hmm. I would uh, I would need to know that we were really in in a position where it dropped down. When I when I hear the words, we had the potential to burn to through 22 million. Yes. If the if it had have been extended, uh, I would you know I'd like to know. Did we get down to five million? Did we get down to 10 million? You, you don't know that? Or no, I'm, sure? I'm afraid I don't have that information here currently. Maybe Mr. Toer can help. Okay, thanks. Turn your turn I, on. I did have a lot of discussions. Sorry, it's not working. No, it is. on. Yeah, okay. It, it is on. on. It's it is on, is on, on now, yeah. yeah. I had a lot of discussions with uh, Mr. Watson during uh, the recession, and we discussed at, at what time would we start laying staff off, because it looked, and the, the, the word we use is the burn rate. When you run an operating business and you don't have enough revenue coming in, how much are you spending per month without new money coming in? Right. You run through your reserve pretty darn quick. And we were probably six months away to say, we better start laying off staff. And then permits picked up again, and we then walked by that issue. We were six months away from being down to zero? Is that what you're saying? No, I said we were six months away from laying off staff. But what, was the, what would be the reserve at, that, uh, at the end of that six months? I can't remember the exact num number, Your Worship, because what, what we were looking at was how much obligations did we have left I see. Okay. to finish out the work that we had taken prepayments I, for. I understand that. So yeah. there's two things at play here, one of which is keeping staff on who don't have enough work to do, but you need them in case the next upturn comes along and keep enough in reserve to pay your obligations that you know are coming because you've got to clean out permits and do final inspections. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to make a, an amendment. Or Has this been moved yet? It has been, yes. I'd like to make amendment to change the 60 to 40 million, Your Worship. Um, I will both ask for a seconder and ask the original mover and seconder if they find that contrary, as is my practice. You do find it contrary? Okay, so I'm not going to allow it, Alderman Stevenson. Um, okay, but I will t I will uh, ask for a vote on the three items separately. Uh, Alderman Chabot? You're just going to close? Uh, a couple, couple more first. Alderman Carra? Yeah, picking up where uh, Drew left off before we sort of went in. Oh, sorry, Alderman Farrell, I apologize. Alderman Farrell, Council. Obviously getting a little bit tired at this point in the night. I'll tell you, when I was reading these notes, when I was reading this in the minutes this weekend, I like had a hard time wrapping my mind around what was going on because we, of course, did LPT in here and I thought it was in Council. I was like, how can it be coming back to Council? <laughs> um, the point number two, which says uh, the, the bolded in place that was written in, which was to evaluate and examine the land use bylaw based objective standards in the context of the smart code based objective standard coming out of the Mission Road Main Street project. There was a lot of discussion, not just about that process, 
in terms of objective standards, but a bunch of other things, including, including the process issues that Alderman Farrell was referring to. So I encourage you to support uh, the amended number two. Thanks, Alderman Carr, Alderman Chabot. Uh, sorry, Alderman Pincott. Well, thank you. I just, I'm going to speak to the, uh, the reserve. Uh, you know, uh, Council, I do remember uh, a year ago, just over a year ago, when we were, we were in this council, we're talking about the reserve and how we were um, getting to the point that, uh, that Mr. Tobert told us about. Uh, the reserve is, is prudent fiscal management. It's the right thing to do. It allows us to, to uh, uh, in a very customer-driven area of our city, allows us to smooth out the bumps within our staff. It allows us to forward plan. There is a city that is to the north of us that doesn't operate with a reserve the same way that we do. Hmm? Balzac? Balzac, indeed. Uh, no, there's this, uh, and and. What that means is that they are constantly looking to fund future work out of the applications that are coming in today. And if those applications dry up, they no longer have the money, the funds in place based on the development, on the fees that are paid to actually pay for the work that continues. I mean, that's been explained to, to us today. I just wanna, just wanna it sort of underline that this is prudent fiscal management and we as a council and the taxpayers are the recipients of that prudent fiscal management. It means that we're not getting into mill rate supported um, uh, staff when we, when we have said we don't want to. Um, so please do support uh, all three, uh, uh, all three recommendations before you. Anyone else before I call on Alderman Chibot to close? Alderman Chibot to close. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, I, I feel the need to elaborate a little bit on the reserve. Um, thank you, um, Alderman Pincott, for uh, those words of wisdom from uh, from the need to expand on this reserve. Um, the Zucker report indicated that not only should we ex uh, Zucker Clarion report indicated not only should we uh, increase the reserve, but that we shouldn't necessarily do it like in a very short term. The intent is to have this brought up to 60 million by 2019 so this isn't going to happen overnight this is coming out of out of fees this is not coming out of the mill rate this is coming out of development and um, building permits so this isn't something that we are paying for it's something that the industry is paying for or whoever's coming forward with a development permit application um, the initial the fund when it was initially um, uh, set up was uh, was designed to um, to stabilize, let me just read right from the report. Should the fund exceed the uh, Oh, sorry, just to touch on something that Mr. Tobert said. Should the fund exceed the guideline maximum, the excess will be used as a contribution from reserve to DBA operations in the following year to soften any required increases to the fees. So every year we have increases to the fees. So if the, if the uh, reserve exceeds the $30 million, that excess will be used to reduce the increase in the following years. Um, DBA was originally reserved, reserve was originally established in consultation with development and industry in order to stabilize the DBA operating budget, fund one-time operating expenditures, and fund DBA capital expenditures. The premise for the size of the reserve was based on historic annual fluctuations of business activity levels of 15 to 20%. But what we saw in 2009 was a reduction of 30% in the economy and that uh, at that sustained rate we would have burned out <clears throat> that complete uh, reserve in less than three years which is the uh, timeline associated with some of the large development permits um, in order to bring them to completion. So the recommendation was to have funds in there to be able to sustain that business unit for 12 months exclusively. This only could sustain the development building approvals uh, operations for six months. So this is the recommendation the DBA uh, or the Clarion report um, recommended. 
again, looking at uh, sustainment um, over a longer period of time, stabilizing the price of the industry so that we don't have large fluctuations up or down. If it's too high one year, it reduces the cost in the following year. So it actually stabilizes the actual price on our, our development permits. So that's one I think that we absolutely have to, to support. And the other three, I think most members of, of uh, council and committee spoke uh, uh, enough on both of the others to support the recommendations one and two also. Thank you. Hope you support. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. So we're going to take the recommendations separately. On recommendation one, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Recommendation two, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. Recommendation three, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Four. Call the roll, please. Three. Four. <clears throat> Recommendation three, Alderman Marr. Yes. Alderman Pincott. Yes. Alderman Putmans. Yes. Alderman Stevenson. No. Alderman Carra. Yes. Alderman Chabot. Yes. Alderman collier -Cart. Yes. Alderman DeMong. Yes. Alderman Farrell. Yes. Alderman Hodges. No. Alderman Jones. No. Alderman Lowe. Yes. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? No. It's carried. Thank you. All right. That takes us to... Oops. That takes us to... Flip, flip, flip. 10.3.2 uh, LPT 2011-31 Southeast 17 Corridor Implementation Strategy Update. Did you want to introduce this one, Alderman Chabot? Um, well, Your Worship, there is a number of recommendations that came out of the report, uh, many of which uh, talked about how some certain commercial uses were probably not going to be feasible in the near term, uh, but uh, that uh, based on the innovation application that's come forward recently, there's certainly tremendous opportunity to uh, further the work that's already been initiated by administration on this. and. Hopefully council can support it. Um, the reason that I wasn't overly supportive of recommendation number three is primarily due to the timeline associated with it. thought that was uh, too lengthy. Um, but uh, having said that, I certainly uh, I would like to put forward recommendation, recommendations of committee and, and uh, ask members of council to support at least one and two. <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Chibou. I will suggest that Recommendation number three has amongst the best examples of bureaucraties I've seen in a long time, with a status report on outlining the implementation approach to the long-term strategy. There's at least seven more reports coming out of that recommendation. <laughs> but, um, all right, um, and I noticed that, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Any further discussion on this one? And as per the opening, I will take the recommendation separately. I assume you've closed, Alderman Chabot? So on recommendation number one, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried on recommendation number two, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried on recommendation number three, are we agreed? Any opposed? Okay, we'll call the roll on that one, please. On recommendation number three, Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Carra? Yes. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman collier -Cart. No. Alderman DeMong? No. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? No. Mayor Nenshi? <laughs> No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's lost on a tie. Yeah, he probably would have actually <laughs> voted to no against it in committee. If you have a motion arising there, Alderman Chabot, with potentially an earlier date, this would be the time to do it. Or, or whatever, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm just looking for the right buttons, Your Worship. I guess I don't need to request a speak button. Um, 
Well, I was hoping to have something, at least on an implementation strategy, uh, sometime uh, before the break, um, maybe in July, so that we can contemplate it over over the break as to how to move forward on the implementation strategy. So, Your Worship, if we could make that date um, July, whenever the last meeting of Council would be in July. Um, actually, LPT. It's during Stampede, right? Yeah, July LPT would be <laughs> would be the twentieth. Okay. Oh, it's right after Stephanie. All right. So yep. you are suggest you're giving me a motion arising that says direct administration to report back no later than two thousand and eleven July twentieth regular meeting of the SPC on LPT with a status report on outlining the implementation approach to the long term strategy. Oh, yes. Thank okay, you. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that? <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Carr. <laughs> oh, it's just a status report. It's one page long. Okay. Time is <laughs> right. Can't wait that long to get a second. Um, no, I saw. I definitely saw one. Okay. Any discussion on this one, Alderman Pincott? Yes. Thank you. I just uh, sort of want to follow up to the uh, the discussion at LPT. What <clears throat> what uh, what was originally uh, in the administration recommendation was for a report in December. And if I remember the the uh, the discussion, which seems like a lifetime ago, but it was only two months ago, uh, there was concern about whether there was actually a, there would be anything of meaning to present in September. Would there be anything? Consequently, there was a number of us who voted against the amendment, uh, the recommendation, in the amendment for September rather than December. Would there be anything meaningful in July? And I don't. Just say. Uh, Your Worship, I, I can partially respond to that. We have a major component of this, and that is the implementation of the 17th Avenue BRT plan. Uh, by July, um, we would be able to outline the steps that we'd be planning to follow, but no, nothing of any consequence. Okay, so following up on our original discussion at LPT, where the, the, um, the uh, original recommendation of December was amended to September and then here subsequently lost here uh, I would like to make an amendment to the motion arising if I may your worship uh -huh. and change the date to December 14th not gonna work he won't let you it's contrary it's I'm not even looking at him I know he's gonna say that Alderman Chabot thank you then I uh, okay. well if uh, if you won't allow that amendment then I'll I'll, uh, I'll recommend that we vote against this motion arising for the reason that the September date uh, was uh, was unrealistic this one is as well thanks Alderman Pincott um, I have something to say oh I'll wait till the end Alderman Lowe Actually, Your Worship, Alderman Pincott just said it all and said it very well. And uh, I didn't even have to go to LPT. <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Carra? Um, if I recall LPT appropriately, that was the discussion. Um, and September was as close as we could make it and fly. Um, I recall that the discussion was really hinging on um, point two, which was to direct administration to work with the International Avenue Innovation Projects Consultant Team on crafting the implementation strategy. And the idea was that some of the ideas coming in from that group might significantly change the scope or change the outcome of how we're currently scoping it and looking at it. Um, so we supported a, and, and might have budget implications. So we supported it coming in before budget. Um, I think we can definitely have a sense of whether the consultant team is going to have any impact by July. And if not, then September was a moot point anyway. So I encourage you to support this as it directly relates to number two. And we'll have a clear idea as to whether anything coherent can come back following work with the consultant team. And they're here this month and then in June. So July will be enough time. Thanks, Alderman Carr. And I'll remind folks that it is, after all, a status report on outlining the implementation approach to the long-term strategy. So as I, I'm going to say that all night. Um, and so as I read that, it's a status report. We're not asking for a giant book here, but a report on how things are going. Alderman Chabot, to close. Thank you, Your Worship. 
Well, this also ties back into a motion the council had previously approved as well, which was on, on um, an application for a, a community revitalization levy. And this, in essence, would provide us at least some guidelines on what it is that we could potentially put forward to the provincial government in regards to making an application for a community revitalization levy for 17th Avenue. It's also some green trip funding. Um, there's a number of things that are going to come out of this, uh, uh, the uh, innovation fund that uh, we've the council's approved on uh, for the consultant team to come up with some strategies and recommendations on how we can actually develop 17th Avenue quicker. This has been on hold for for too long since council originally approved the CRL. So the sooner we can get a report back on a potential strategy moving forward, the better. And what ultimately we decide to do with that, then we can at least have something to discuss in July and potentially something in September. Closed. <laughs> Closed. <laughs> So I can convince you people simply by talking for a really long time. This is a great message. <laughs> all right. Oh, uh, boy, we're all a little punchy tonight. That's what three hours of tents will do to you. On this motion arising, are we agreed? Any opposed? <laughs> Call the roll, please. On the motion arising with respect to LPT 31, Alderman Carra. Yes. Alderman Chabot? Yes. Alderman Collier Cart? No. Alderman DeMong? My status is yes. Alderman Farrell? No. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? No. Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? Oops, no. Alderman Marr? No. Alderman Pincott? No. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? Yes. Mayor Nancy. <laughs> yes. It's lost. Reconsider September. So, so when is it going to, can we reconsider September? Well, put, put the motion. So yes, if you voted against it, you can put a motion to Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Any discussion? Seeing none. <laughs> Are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Lowe is opposed. October it is. Okay. <laughs> and Alderman Chabot is opposed too. Okay. 10.3.3 we've tabled. 10.3.4. Oh, this one gets me grumpy. Um, we've already had this moved and seconded. This is about um, proposed amendments to the traffic bylaw to change the fine amounts. I have one super quick question. I think it's for Mr. Sawyer. I didn't have, um, in my report, I did not have the Schedule B, the previous amount. So am I correct in assuming this is just a $15 increase across the board? I'm just looking at you, Mr. Sawyer, because I don't know who else to ask. That's right, for the fees that we can change. Okay. Oh, do you have it? Okay, it wasn't in my package for some reason. Alderman Hodges? Well, Your Worship, uh, we put this on the agenda uh, at the committee. Uh, the report uh, literally was uh, published uh, that same day as the committee. Uh, I put it on the agenda. This is a major expense for the uh, Calgary Parking Authority, mm -hmm. which is an agency uh, of the City of Calgary. And uh, if we don't want to approve this, it, you talk about a burn rate, the burn rate's half a million dollars a month. Yeah. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Um, like I said, this one makes me particularly grumpy because it's very clear that um, this was an unintended consequence of a footnote to a footnote in the provincial budget. Um, I agree with the user pay principle, but for me, the question that I've been trying to address with the provincial government is why does it cost $15 for one computer to talk to another computer and get some data? Um, and that question has not yet been resolved to my satisfaction. I remain hopeful that it will. Any further discussion on this one? Alderman Chabot to close. Close. 
Thank you. On this one, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Your Worship, you're going to need three readings of the bylaw. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a bylaw, right? Yes. So, um, thank you for the reminder. Uh, there we are. So, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right. That takes us to 10.3.5. Um, did you want to introduce this one, Alderman Chabot? Your light's on. Actually, no, Your Worship, I'll address anything in my close. Okay, thank you. Any discussion on this one? Alderman Chabot to close. Close. That was great. <laughs> um, on the recommendations, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, that takes us to Calgary Housing Company Report 10.4.1, Alderman Pincott. Thank you, Worship. I would like to move the recommendations of the CHC Board. Thanks. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman McLeod. If it was much earlier in the evening, I would have many, many, many questions about this report. But you know what? I'll start them now. <laughs> no. Um, I think the only thing I'll say, Alderman Pincott, is that uh, you and I can spend some time on this because there were, while these uh, annual statements are very good and very clear, their very clarity leads to a number of questions in my mind around the operations of CHC and how it might be improved. So we can spend some time chatting about it. If I may, in my close, just to... Hey, you're uh, not closing. I, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. You beat me to the light. Alderman Hodges. <clears throat> I just wanted to, if you'd recognize me after this item, uh, there's a couple of items we moved to the end of the agenda, and so I just want to remind you. Okay. Yeah, just curious. Uh, if I got this right, there was a surplus, right? Of, what, $6 million or something? What happens to that surplus? Does it go back into reducing rates, or does it go into improving some of the deficiencies in some of our Calhoun properties? Because if it goes back into Calhoun properties, I have some suggestions on where it could go. Thank you. Well, uh, your observation is quite astute, Your Worship. Uh, it is a, uh, the financials and how Calgary Housing Company uh, operates financially is uh, quite complex and operates in nine different portfolios with funding and operating requirements completely different for each of the portfolios. This is something that the Board of Directors of CHC has uh, undertaken to, to address, uh, not only um, uh, internally, but with our funding partners, which is uh, first and foremost the provincial government. Uh, we, are, we have undertaken as of last year discussions with the province on how to streamline the, the, our portfolios and the funding process. Each one of the nine portfolios has different operating um, guidelines, has different funding sources, and uh, that leads to a great deal of complexity. Surplus, a portion of the surplus is returned to the city, and a portion, portion of it does go into reserves to pay, to fund, future ca to fund future improvements, future capital. Part of that is, again, one of the challenges within the, the funding mechanisms that we have uh, is that some of the some of the uh, the capital improvements are considered uh, permanent or or ca major capital improvements that are funded differently than costs which are recurring uh, capital costs such as when a unit turns over and you have to paint it and change the carpeting those are capital costs but they are funded differently. Uh, from a different pot of money and have different requirements from the provincial government than, say, a roof or the building envelope or replacing the furnaces. Uh, it is a very complex company to operate within those nine portfolios. The board of directors has recognized that, has recognized has a great deal of frustration around the inefficiencies because of that, because of the funding model that has been set up with the province, and we have undertaken the work to... Uh, to work with our funding partners, the, the, the province and uh, the federal government to look at how we can streamline that process and make this 
less, um, I don't want to say obscure and I don't want to say obtuse, but uh, dense. How about that? Uh, I hope you can support this and I anticipate at some point in the future that we'll have, it'll look a lot better and we'll be able to be a lot more responsive <coughs> within the company as well. Thank you for presupposing what most of my questions were because those are most of my questions. All right. Um, on the recommendations, then, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right. That takes us to our new 10.5 reports from the Land and Asset Committee, um, 2011, 07, 08, and 21. Alderman Hodges. Yes, uh, Your Worship. Thank you. Just uh, get them uh, organized here for a second. So. Um, as you'll note, uh, Your Worship, members of council, there were three members of the committee that, uh, including myself, that did not support uh, the recommendations in either number seven or number eight. I'm having a tough time uh, understanding, um, a problem understanding uh, the values attributed to the uh, lands that uh, the city requires in the west end of downtown, uh, adjacent to the 7th Avenue C train station refurbishment and uh, four acres of land in the uh, west part of the city, which happened to be out in the uh, uh, Greenbrier cell five area, cell four, or cell five, uh, the vacant lands to the west of the uh, lands that were the subject of the uh, public hearing earlier today, earlier this afternoon. So I have the problem for me then are the values. I uh, think the values uh, should the, the, the difference in value should be much larger than is the case. Uh, that's uh, not, however, what the committee decided. Uh, I can move these uh, 07 and 08 uh, reports, but uh, I will not be voting in favor of them because I don't believe the, uh, the values are, uh, are as equal as is suggested in these reports. Very well, then. I wonder if we can get someone else to move these reports. Thanks, Alderman Putmans and Alderman Lowe is seconding, just to save you the... All right, so um, any further discussion on 07, then? Alderman Carra. Well, I think it's sort of a mistake to take them all separately, because they're basically three different land deals that are all tied together in three separate motions. And we'll... Yeah. What we're basically talking about is the Kirby Center on the west end of the downtown yes. is the Kirby Center on one side, the south side of the street of 8th Avenue, and it's a parking lot owned by the Kirby Center. It's a provincial holding, and we want to build the station of the LRT along that block front. And in order to build the station platform correctly, we need like a meter and a half strip that cuts into both the Kirby site and into uh, the parking lot site. So it's a meter and a half by the length of a platform. And according to how we do valuation, that meter and a half strip, which is only going to add tremendous value to the Kirby Center and make the lives of its inhabitants much better, we're turning that over for like an acre and a half of land in Greenbrier or something close to an acre or something, which... Uh, two acres. Two acres, which is just... I mean, this is sort of like part of the predatory, ridiculous relationship. And I also think it speaks to how we're valuing things in a way that's not constructive to city building. And you, know, you can make a market value argument about this, but it's in no way constructive to building a kind of city we want to build. We should be working together with the province. And I think that we should pursue some sort of recourse to say to the province, this is ridiculous. I don't know what. I know we're sort of over a barrel here, but it just it, I've lost sleep over this one. Much as I hate saying the following sentence, if you like, you could move to refer this to the mayor to have a senior level political discussion with the province and come back to council on some short time period to see if we can address the concerns that you're raising. So moved. Give I'll me a time period. I'll second. Month? A month, yeah. I mean, well, like, what's the timing on getting this, on, on getting the, the platform built? We're not quite there yet. Did you hear the question? Yes, we, uh, with respect to the platform, um, we are in that zone now. Um, to be honest, 
we are trying to get through this, particularly on the Kirby side, as quickly as we possibly can. They are not happy with us. They do not see us as adding value. I know. Alderman That's Karoff insane. In the chair. That's sad. Tell you what, Alderman Karoff, so you can get a little bit of sleep, just make it a week. Let's see what we can do between now and next Monday. How about between now and next Monday, Your Worship? Okay. All right, so we've got a motion to refer LAS 201107 and LAS 201108 to the mayor for further discussion with the province to think, return to council. I think it's the other one, too. On the 16th. Uh, that's in Rocky Ridge. Oh, sorry. My apologies. My apologies. 207 and 08. 207 and 08, right. Okay, and Alderman Hodges has second that referral motion. All right. On the referral motion, then, Alderman Chabot. Um, well, I was going to say ditto, but in fact, now that he's made the referral motion, I um, appreciate um, Mr. Logan weighing in on this and letting us know that time is pretty sensitive on this issue. So I'll support it, but only for a week. And for how long was the Just a week. It seems to me the difficulty I have, Your Worship, in my, my experience with Alderman Hodges dealing with the province is a week takes three years. I hear you, but I feel like I can at least make a couple of phone calls and come back with something for you next week. And if that something is they hung up on me, then we know. Okay. I guess I'm more afraid that they'll say, gee, that's a, we really can do something. We'll talk to you right after the election. The, you know, and council and, gets to decide. And that's the kind of conversation we I have. So while I appreciate the effort, I also acknowledge that we've, we've got a major capital project and come, you know, dependent upon this. So uh, I uh, won't be supporting the referral. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. On the referral motion, Alderman Mark. Thank you. Yes, so uh, just a little bit of background on uh, what um, uh, Mr. Logan was saying. He was being a bit shy. We're not just in gentle negotiations with the Kirby Center. They're mad as hell uh, at what's, what's been going on. It has had a huge impact on my seniors because of the fact that it, everything keeps changing all of the time. I'd really like to put this to bed, Your Worship, so I won't I won't support this, and I'm asking council. This is another delay. There is huge implications. I've already met with the province on this, and uh, there's very, very little move, room to move right now. I, I think that we should just move forward with this as is. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Did you want to close on? Oh, Alderman Hodges, sorry. I don't care uh, what the uh, province is saying. I can imagine they want to be argumentative. I'm reminded, uh, as Alderman Marr stood up, of the rules we have under their Municipal Government Act of buying and selling land at fair market value. Uh, what They're holding a gun to our head, it sounds like, to do a, a land exchange which is not fair market value. So I have no intention of putting um, my council seat or anybody else's council seat on the line on a on a transaction which is not a fair market value. And uh, that's the end of the story right there. Thanks, uh, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Carr, did you want to close? Closed. It's a week. Closed. <laughs> Thank you. On the referral motion, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. On the referral, Alderman Collier Cart. Yes. Alderman DeMong? Yes. Alderman Farrell? <laughs> Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? Yes. Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? No. Alderman Marr? No. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Putmans? No. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Kara? Yes. Alderman Chabot? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? Yes. Carried by one. Great. Little it's carried. All right, so that's seven and eight. That takes us to 21. Alderman Hodges? Yeah, 21, Your Worship, is uh, an item that was before Land Committee and Council several years ago. The uh, process uh, was not completed of the land exchange. Uh, this land exchange uh, is a good idea. It preserves the wetlands in the area and uh, gives the adjacent landowner uh, dash or slash developer a, uh, uh, a potentially small piece of developable land he can add to the land holdings he has in the area. 
So uh, this is a, an exchange that makes sense, and uh, that's why I'm recommending it. Thanks. Do I have a seconder? Second. Alderman Pincott, thank you. Any discussion on this one? Ald Alderman Chabot. Uh, just very briefly, Your Worship, while, uh, while we do have the numbers that suggest that, that the exchanged amount of lands are what they are, visually, it just doesn't look right. So without having the time to uh, explore this further to assess whether or not the numbers are indeed accurate, I will continue to vote against it. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Anyone else on this one? Alderman Hodges to close. Thank you. On the recommendations, then, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed. Carried. All right. Matters of urgent business, 11.1 um, .1 on wholly owned subsidiaries. Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move this motion with respect to wholly owned subsidiaries. This is uh, supplementary to Alderman DeMong's motion. It takes it the next step in talking a little bit about developing policy around why we create home, wholly owned subsidiaries and what they actually do or don't do for us. Um, I think that's sufficient for introducing it and um, if there's any questions I'll answer them in the close. Thank you. Alderman Stevenson? All right. Um, one small, oh I need a seconder, sorry. Thanks Alderman Lowe. One small thing, it's the legislative, thank you, it's the legislative governance task force but that's okay. We can just make that editorial change. All right, any discussion on this one then? All right, on this recommendation, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, um, I will, uh, 10 minutes. I will take a motion before I take the motion to move in camera to suspend the procedures bylaw so that we can finish our business. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Mar is opposed. <laughs> we'll be done in 12 minutes. Um, and then um, I'll take a motion to move in camera to deal with these couple of in camera items. Alderman Jones, thanks Alderman Hodges, are we agreed? All right, let's move back there. Oh, we'll be. Move the committee rest and report to your worship. Second. Are we agreed? Agreed. The uh, verbal report personnel item that uh, the verbal report personnel item receive, be received for information in the discussion with respect to the verbal report remain in confidence confidential pursuant to section 17 one of the freedom of information and uh, protection of privacy act thank you your worship um, I'd like to make a motion regarding the um, Calgary Parking Authority to receive recommendation number two for information and direct the attachments with respect to report N 2011-07, remain confidential under section 17.1 of the Freedom of Information and Privacy, Protection of Privacy Act. Great, do I have a seconder? Thanks Alderman Hodges. Um, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Um, Alderman Call your card. Thank you, Your Worship. On uh, report C 2011-45 on the Louise Station Comprehensive Review, uh, that we receive the verbal update and the deferral request and that the information uh, be kept confidential under sections 24.1c, 21.1g and 25.1g of the Freedom of Information and Protection Act until the final report on the Louise Station is delivered to Council and to keep this report confidential until Council rises and reports. Thanks and Alderman Marr you're seconding that. Any discussion on this one? All right, are we agreed? Any opposed? 
Carried. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move that the verbal report progress of negotiations with the Calgary Airport Authority and any changes to pro the projected cost of the airport tunnel be received for information. And number two, that the discussion with respect to the verbal report remain confidential pursuant to section 23-1B, 24-1B, 24-1C, 25-1C, 27-1B of FOIP. You sure there's no more? <laughs> and you're seconding Alderman Putman's? Very well then, um, are we agreed? Yep. Any opposed? Carried. Alderman Hodges. Second. Your Worship, uh, move the waive the reading of inquiries, if any. Uh, there aren't any? Okay, you don't even move have to do to it. Adjourn. Alderman Jones, you're seconding, are we agreed? Thanks folks, good day. Good day.